Hello, hello, and welcome to my limited set review for Kaldheim. I'll be first going over my card rating system for limited. So as you can see, we've got Leyline Tyrant waiting for us. This is what I like to call an S tier level card. If we look at Zendikar Limited, this is the type of card that can completely take over a game by itself. And even if it goes answered, it still provides a little bit of an advantage. So these are the absolute top tier cards and there's not many in each limited set. Other examples include Phylath, World Sculptor, another amazing limited card. Next up, we've got the A tier. These are still absolute bombs that can easily win your game. Although they don't quite get to the S tier rating since they can potentially be answered a little bit more easily. But if these bombs go unanswered, they will definitely win you a game. And usually A level cards are rares and mythics, but every now and then there's a sneaky card like this uncommon Roost of Drakes that uh, deserves an A grade as well, just because of how dominating it can be. Although it's very rare for uncommons to jump into the A rating. Next up, we've got the B tier. These are cards that are usually pretty good cards and you're happy to first pick more often than not. These are often two for ones or removal spells, especially the better non-conditional removal spells fall into the B rating. These are typically uncommons, but the best commons in each color might uh, sneak into the B grade as well. So we've got Spark Mage, Vine Gecko, just very efficient cards that can provide a ton of advantage over the course of a game. And as we mentioned, premium removal spells at common. Next up, we've got the C plus rating. I make the uh, differentiation between C and C plus just because so many cards fall into the C grade. Otherwise we would have too many cards that get a C rating. So I make the distinction between C and C plus. So the C plus cards are cards that usually are gonna make the final cut. So these are cards you're very rarely gonna cut from your limited deck. So a card like Shepherd of Heroes, just an efficient card with a nice ETB effect. Good card advantage spells could also fall in a C plus range. And just one of the better two drops here in Grotak Buck Catcher, if we look at Zendikar Limited. Then of course we need a lot of C ratings as well. These are cards that will make your deck, but every now and then you might end up cutting them if you don't have room for them. Uh, some of the better pump spells, like Might of Morassa, might fall in the C rating. We've got Kabir Outrider, just playable cards that every now and then you might end up cutting from your deck if they don't have a ton of synergy. Skitter Sneak, one of the more mediocre cards, but every now and then you'll still play. Then we've got the D rating. These are cards that are usually bad filler cards. They only really make your deck if you have a ton of synergy with them. But in an average limited deck, you're not too excited to include these. Akum Hellhound would fall into this category. Kazandu Nectropods might have a bit of synergy with Landfall, but overall you're not too excited to play it. So these are cards that get cut more often than not. Gouldra's Mucklord, another example. Then the F tier are Pretty few and far in between. Forsaken Monuments, a card that's more meant for Constructed, just not too many colorless synergies in Zendikar Limited. So this would be an example of an F grade. I guess you can put Confounding Conundrum in this category as well, just no real reason to play these and you're often just better off playing a basic land instead. But again, there's not too many F rating cards in Limited these days. Used to be a thing of the past and they're usually just sideboard cards for Constructed. So our first Kaldheim card, Agar the Freezing Flame. Three mana for a 3-3 giant wizard, it's legendary. And whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt damage or excess damage, if a giant wizard or spell you control dealt damage to it, you get to draw a card. So blue red in the set has a bit of a giant theme. So there's a bit of a giant synergy going on. Uh, wizards as well, as you can see. So Agar is definitely one of the more exciting build around cards for the set. Can provide a ton of card advantage over the course of a game and just a 3-3 three, three for 3 in blue-red is not too bad either. So even if you don't get to draw a ton of extra cards, it's still fine. So Agar is a pretty good example of what I would give a B. Just a powerful card that you're happy to first pick. And this is definitely a reason to build around it and end up in blue-red giants, which is going to be a fun archetype to Explore Unlimited. Next up, we have our first Saga. If you haven't played with Sagas Unlimited before, I'll give you a quick rundown. So 
as a saga enters a battlefield, you trigger the first chapter, which is the thing that's got the one next to it. So in this case, target creature you control fights up to one target creature you don't control. This is Arnie slays a troll for a red and a green uncommon saga. Then the second chapter triggers after your draw step on the following turn. So you get to draw your card first, but before you enter your main phase, the second chapter will trigger. So potentially gives you the opportunity to play any instance after your draw step, but before the saga triggers. In this case, the second chapter adds a red mana to our mana pool. We put two plus one plus one counters on up to one target creature we control, which is a pretty good effect. And then the final chapter on the following turn, after our draw step once again, says we gain life equal to the greatest power among creatures we control. So Arnie Slays a Troll can be a very powerful card if the first chapter lines up. Of course, if you don't have a great fight ready to go, then it's going to lose a ton of value. But assuming you can get good value out of the first chapter, then those 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters, the extra mana and the life, are definitely a nice bonus. So I'm hesitant to give removal spells more than a B grade. Uh, some people like making the distinction between a B minus, B plus. But in this case, since there's not too many Bs usually, I'm just going to give this a B rating. This is definitely one of the better Bs you'll see compared to some of the other removal spells we'll take a look at later. So just an excellent card and uh, definitely a reason to end up red-green. Next up we've got another Saga. Now this is actually one of the more interesting cards in the set in terms of how to evaluate it since there's a lot going on and it's it's not the easiest card to evaluate so I could definitely be wrong here. But Ascent of the Worthy, another Saga in black-white at Uncommon. On the first two chapters, so the first two chapters are identical, we choose a creature we control and until our next turn all damage that would be dealt to creatures we control is dealt to that creature instead. It's a pretty interesting effect, although it's not always easy to set it up properly. If you are some sort of go-wide deck and you can maybe attack with all your creatures and use a small 1-1 token as sacrifice fodder, this could work out, could make it difficult for the opponent to attack you back. So there's definitely situations where this effect can be powerful. But there's also scenarios where you just don't have a ton of creatures in play and just just basically does nothing. So I wouldn't necessarily rate th this effect too highly. And then on the final chapter, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a flying counter on it. And that creature is an angel warrior in addition to its other types. So black-white has a bit of a sub-theme of um, angels, I suppose but it also has a bit of a sub-theme of casting multiple spells in the same turn, which lends itself to being a more aggressive deck with a low curve. So Ascent of the Worthy is definitely an interesting one, as I mentioned, and I'm not 100% sure on my rating here, but I'm going to start out with a conservative C rating for Ascent of Worthy. Um, reanimating a creature is nice, but it takes a few turns before you get your creature back, which might not always be that exciting, and the first two chapters can be awkward to set up. So I'm not too high on Ascent of the Worthy, but I'm definitely interested to play with this card more and find out firsthand. Next up we've got another Saga here, Battle of the Bretagard, a green-white rare Saga for 3 mana. On the first chapter we create a 1-1 white human warrior creature token, on the second chapter we make a 1-1 green elf warrior creature token, and on the final chapter we choose any number of artifact tokens and or creature tokens we control with different names and for each one of them we create a token that's a copy of it. So just by itself we make two one ones and then on the last chapter we get to essentially double them. And if we have any other tokens in play we get to take advantage of those as well. Um, there's also other uh, tokens like treasure tokens that we could potentially copy. So there's a little bit of synergy here with the Battle of Bretagard, although there's not too many treasure tokens floating around. So for the most part, this is just going to be a nice token maker that hopefully ends up making four tokens at the very least, which is not a bad deal for three mana, even if you have to wait a few turns for the full effect. And green-white definitely has a bit of a go-white theme with tokens in the set, so that plays nicely with our saga here. Overall, I wouldn't give this an insane rating. It's still potentially underwhelming if you just get the four tokens out of it, especially if the opponent manages to force you to maybe trade off one of the tokens before you get to copy it. But it's still just a nice role player for the token deck. So this is probably between a C plus and a B minus, so 
I'll, I'll give a Battle of Bredegard a B just because I'm hopeful that you can get good value out of the final chapter and this is a potential build around for the green white tokens deck. Next up we have Battle of Frost and Fire. Now this is an exciting saga, a blue-red rare saga for 5 mana. On the first chapter, Battle of Frost and Fire deals 4 damage to each non-giant creature and each planeswalker. So 4 damage to each non-giant and planeswalker can potentially just be a one-sided board wipe if you're playing a blue-red giant's deck. Now do keep in mind this set does have changelings in it as well. Changelings have all creature types including giant, so those won't be dealt damage by the first chapter, which could be an advantage if you've got a few changelings yourself, but the opponent might have a few changelings on their side too that don't die to the 4 damage. So yeah, if you build your deck around Battle of Frost and Fire and have plenty of changelings and giants or creatures that have more than 4 toughness, this could be an incredibly powerful effect. Then on the second chapter we get to scry 3, so get to dig pretty deep, hopefully find a giant for the final chapter, saying whenever we cast a spell with converted mana cost 5 or greater, we get to draw 2 cards and then discard a card. Digging for an expensive spell with a scry 3 and then getting to hopefully get to draw 2 discard effect on the final chapter is a pretty nice sequence. So I'm pretty high on Battle of Frost and Fire, just because of the potential of just being a complete blowout on the first chapter, and then even providing a bit of advantage with the second and third. So I think this might even end up in the A category for Battle of Frost and Fire, just because of how potentially powerful it is. And again, we mentioned Blue Red is definitely the deck that has access to a ton of giants at common and uncommon, so it shouldn't be too difficult to build your deck around this. Next up we have the Bears of Legera, a blue-green saga at rare, which on the first chapter makes a 2-2 blue shapeshifter creature token with changeling. So this is what I mentioned, a creature that has all creature types, and blue-green is definitely the color combination that cares most about changelings, and you'll see a ton of changelings at common and uncommon. Then on the second chapter, any number of target shapeshifter creatures we control have base, power and toughness 4-4. Four, four. So turns all our changelings into 4-4s four, essentially, which is potentially incredibly powerful. And then on the last chapter, choose up to one target creature or planeswalker, and each creature with power 4 or greater we control deals damage equal to its power to target permanent. So assuming that you end up with one or more 4-4 four, four creatures by the third chapter, this can be incredibly powerful and all for just three mana. So this is fine to run out on turn three, but you can potentially hold this to make sure you've got multiple creatures that can turn into four fours. So yeah, this card seems awesome. And as we mentioned, blue-green, definitely the color where you'll find a ton of changelings. So the bears, I'm also willing to give an A just because of the uh, potential upside and the fail case is still not that bad, even if you only get to turn one creature into a 4-4 and the opponent maybe has a removal spell right away. So yeah, this seems like a great incentive for the blue-green changeling decks. Then we have the Binding of the Old Gods, 4 mana for a black-green saga at uncommon. You might think this is a rare at first because of how powerful it is, but it's just an uncommon. Saying on the first chapter, destroy target and non-land permanent and opponent controls. Well, that already sounds awesome. But there's more. On the second chapter, you get to search your library for a forest card and put it on the battlefield tapped and shuffle your library. Now, keep in mind, it doesn't specify that it has to be a non-snow forest. So if you have a few of those forest snow basics, you can search those up as well, which can potentially come up since black, green and blue is kind of the color combination where you have most of the snow synergies. So that could potentially be relevant. And then on the final chapter, creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn. So that seems like just a nice upside, but not particularly necessary. And uh, yeah, for Constructed, being a forest and not a basic forest can also be relevant since that lets you search up triomes. That's a nice interaction to point out as well. But for Limited, Binding of the Old God seems awesome. This is one of the better removal spells that you can get and comes with a ton of upside and potential synergy as well. So I'm happy giving this a B. If we were giving B plus ratings, this would definitely be a B plus. 
Next up, we have the Blood Sky Massacre, a black red saga at rare for three mana. On the first chapter, we get to make a 2 3 red demon berserker creature token with menace. On the second chapter, whenever a berserker attacks this turn, we get to draw a card and we lose one life. And on the final chapter, we add a red mana to our mana pool for each berserker we control. And until end of turn, we don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. So making a 2-3 with menace for 3 mana is about average. You're not particularly excited by it, but it's not the worst rate. But then of course getting to draw a card potentially on the second chapter, potentially even more than one, uh, is definitely the exciting part. Assuming you can set up some profitable attacks, which shouldn't be too difficult with a menace creature. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a ton of upside here. Black red, definitely the color pair where you're going to be able to find a lot of Berserkers. So Blood Sky Massacre seems like a, a nice little saga, and uh, I'm happy giving this a B. Next, we have another saga with Fall of the Impostors. This is an uncommon saga, green-white, for three mana. And on the first two chapters, we put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature. So that's not too bad. And then on the final chapter, exile a creature with the greatest power among creatures target opponent controls. So this could be potentially awesome. You get a few plus one counters and on the final chapter, you get a removal spell getting rid of the opponent's largest creature. Now, of course, there are situations where you absolutely need to kill something right away and having to wait those extra turns for the final chapter could make the difference between winning and losing, in which case Fall of the Impostor is not going to be all that amazing. And uh, the opponent knowing about Fall of the Impostor also means that they can potentially sandbag and keep their best creature in hand until the final chapter happens. So this card is good, and I would be including this in every green-white deck I draft, but because it's the last chapter to happen, uh, I'm hesitant to give it a B, so we'll give it a C+. Then we've got Furia, Judge of Valor, probably butchering that name, but a 5 mana for a 2-4 legendary angel cleric with flying and lifelink, so this is one of those black-white payoff cards saying whenever we cast our second spell each turn, look at the top three cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the rest goes into our graveyard. So black-white is a color pair that cares about casting multiple spells in the same turn, and this seems like a great payoff for that, getting to essentially fuel its own ability, helping us find more spells, so we can cast two spells once again. And two for flying lifelink is a pretty good stat line, since we get to play defense, gain a bit of life, and uh, that will give us hopefully time to deploy all those extra cards. So yeah, this card seems great, happy giving this a B as well. Then we've got Furia's Retribution for 4 mana. This is a rare saga. And on the first chapter, we get to make a 4 4 white angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance. So that's already pretty awesome. A 4 4 flying vigilance for 4 mana. Of course, it is a token which can have some drawbacks. Opponent can have a bounce spell to kill it instead of needing a classic removal spell. But then on the second chapter, until end of turn, Angels we control gain the ability to tap and destroy target creature with power less than this creature's power. So that's a very powerful effect. And given that the token even has vigilance, we can attack with it first and then still potentially tap it afterwards. And then on the final chapter, angels we control gain double strike until end of turn. So yeah, retribution seems like an incredible card. As long as the opponent doesn't answer your angel right away, you're going to get a ton of value out of this. And who knows, maybe you'll have some other angels in play at the same time, although I wouldn't necessarily count on it. But yeah, Retribution easily gets an A from me. Forging the Tyrite Sword is a red-white saga at uncommon for 3 mana. On the first two chapters we create a treasure token. And then on the final chapter we get to search our library for a card named Halvar, God of Battle, which is a mythic rare at 4 mana in white, or an equipment card, so it can be any equipment, reveal it and put it into our hand and shuffle our library. 
yeah, I'm not really sold on forging the Tyrite Sword. Spending three mana to get two treasures means we're not even up on mana in that exchange, and uh, just seems incredibly slow before we get any equipment. And there's definitely a few equipment in the set, but it's not like they're going to be all that amazing that it's worth spending all this time to search for it. So, yeah, overall I would give Forging the Tyrant Sword a D, although I could see some rare exceptions where you're still interested in it if you happen to open Halvar and have it in your deck, or if you maybe end up with some incredible synergistic uh, equipment cards that make you want to play this to search them up. Maybe you've got that equipment that synergizes with the runes and you end up with a bunch of runes in your deck. So we'll get to those later in the set review. But overall, I'm not too excited about forging the sword, so we'll give this a D. Then we've got Harold, King of Scamfar. Three mana for a black green uncommon, a legendary elf warrior with menace. It's a 3-2. So black green in the set cares about elves, we've got a bit of elf tribal synergy and Harald definitely delivers because when Harald enters a battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library, you may reveal an elf, warrior or Tyvar card from among them and put it into your hand. Tyvar, for those that don't know, is a mythic rare planeswalker in the set in green and uh, also has a bit of elf synergy. So an elf, a warrior or Tyvar Planeswalker if you're lucky enough to open it and then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So assuming you're in black green you're gonna have a lot of elves and a lot of warriors so you should have a pretty high chance of finding one of those in the top five. So if Harald is a 3-2 menace that essentially draws a card this card is great and happy giving this a B. Harald's Unites the Elves is the rare Saga counterpart at 4 mana, which says on the first chapter, mill 3 cards, and then we can put an Elf or Tyvar card from our graveyard onto the battlefield. On the second chapter, we put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each Elf we control, and on the final chapter, whenever an Elf we control attacks this turn, target creature an opponent controls gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. So this can be an amazing payoff card, for kind of a go wide elf deck. Ideally you have a bunch of cards that make some elf tokens so you can take full advantage of the second and third chapters. And this is probably not a card you're going to play on turn four on curve very often since you're not guaranteed to get value out of the first chapter. So it's better to build up a board, maybe have a few creatures go to the graveyard so you're guaranteed to get an elf back with the first chapter. And then Harold Unites the Elves can be a great uh, stalemate breaker where you get to pump up all your elves and then potentially take out a few opposing creatures on the final chapter too. So definitely a build around card, your average black green deck without a ton of elves is not going to be too interested in this, but assuming you can build around it with enough elves this definitely seems very powerful. So overall probably giving Harold Unites the Elves a B. Immersturm Predator is a rare vampire dragon in the Ragdos colors for 4 mana total. It's a 3-3 flyer, and whenever Immersturm Predator becomes tapped, exile up to one target card from a graveyard and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. And we can also sacrifice another creature at any time to make the Predator gain indestructible until end of turn, and we also have to tap it. So Predator incredibly difficult to deal with. Uh, there's going to be a few colors that simply can get rid of it. Other colors might have ways to maybe enchant it with a removal spell which doesn't care about indestructible or maybe be able to give it minus x toughness to still take it out. But uh, once the predator gets going uh, it seems incredibly difficult to stop. It has built-in evasion, built-in protection with the indestructible. Black Red does have quite a few creatures that it can use as sacrifice fodder to sacrifice to the ability and then can even exile stuff from graveyards and there's a few decks that care about having cards in graveyards which this can potentially uh, stop as well so yeah predator seems awesome very difficult to deal with and can easily take over a game by himself so overall give it an a seems like a bomb next up we have invasion of the giants a blue red saga at uncommon for just two mana 
On the first chapter, we get to scry two. On the second chapter, we get to draw a card. And then regardless of anything else, we can reveal a giant card from our hand. And when we do, invasion deals two damage to target opponent or planeswalker. So it doesn't deal damage to creatures, only opponents and planeswalkers, so not super relevant. But we got to draw a card. So first chapter scry two, second chapter draw card. So this is kind of a slow way to uh, preordain, I suppose. And then on the final chapter, the next giant spell we cast this turn costs two generic mana less to cast. And blue red's definitely the color pair that cares about giants. So overall, what do we think of Invasion of the Giants? It's a little bit on the slow side to get our extra card out of it. Um, but assuming your deck has a few giants that can take advantage of the cost reduction, this becomes a much more exciting card. And at the end of the day, the floor of Scry 2 and eventually draw card isn't too bad. I'm not taking the two damage too much into consideration here. But uh, yeah, Invasion of the Giants, probably a C, C plus even uh, in the right deck. Then we have a Cardur, Doom Scourge. A 4 mana, 4-3 four, legendary Demon Berserker in the Rakdos colors. And when Carter Doom Scourge enters the battlefield until our next turn, creatures or opponents control attack each combat if able and attack a player other than you if able, which isn't super relevant for uh, 1v1 limited, but could come up in multiplayer games. And then whenever any attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. So this counts our attacking creatures as well as the opponent's attacking creatures. So yeah, Cardur seems great. Um, enters the battlefield, can maybe force the opponent into some awkward attacks. And then you can make a bunch of favorable trades potentially. Maybe you've got some death touch creatures or first strike creatures that can uh, take out opposing creatures easily. And then especially that final ability of draining the opponent when an attacking creature dies just seems pretty good if uh, you're planning to be aggressive and forcing some trades going to make it very difficult for the opponent to race and then it's still a four mana four three so yeah there's a ton of upside here to cardur so happy giving this a b and then we've got cardur's vicious return the uncommon saga counterpart for four mana, which on the first chapter lets us sacrifice a creature. And when we do, the Vicious Return deals three damage to any target. So as we mentioned, Black Rat is gonna have quite a few creatures it doesn't mind sacrificing, so it shouldn't be too difficult to leverage the first chapter. And of course, you're probably not gonna play it unless you can make use of it. And then on the second chapter, each player discards a card. So this is symmetrical, but could potentially be an advantage because on the final chapter, return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. We can put a plus one plus one counter on it and it gains haste until our next turn. So we can potentially discard a very expensive creature on the second chapter and then reanimate it on the final chapter, which seems great. And uh, yeah, overall, Cardur's Vicious Return has a lot going for it, assuming you can take out an opposing creature with the first, with the first chapter and eventually get some value with the final chapter. This seems great. So happy giving this a B as well and potentially has a ton of upside. All right, then we get to our first Planeswalker with Kaya the Inexorable. Five mana for a mythic rare Kaya Planeswalker. Starts out at five loyalty and then the plus one puts a ghost form counter on up to one target non-token creature and it gains the ability when this creature dies or is put into exile, return it to its owner's hand, and we get to make a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. So a nice ability if you've got a bit of a board. And then the minus three gives us access to removal, exiling target non-land permanent. So that also includes opposing sagas, but of course creatures are gonna be the usual target. And then the ultimate, which we can reach pretty quickly, gives us an emblem saying at the beginning of our upkeep, we can cast a legendary spell from our hand, from our graveyard, or from our cards we own in exile without paying its mana cost. Yeah, I mean, it's potentially useful, but I think we're mostly interested in the plus one and minus three abilities, 
which are gonna be used most often. And uh, yeah, Kaya seems great. Can come down, take out an opposing creature, hopefully you can protect Kaya, and then start leveraging the plus one, which is gonna make it incredibly difficult for the opponent to make any forward progress. So I think Kaya gets an S rating from me, just because of how impactful it can be. It can easily win a stalled game, it can potentially catch you back up if you're behind, taking out the biggest creature from the opponent, and then if Kaya survives, can easily dominate a game with a plus one. And uh, yeah, even if you're super far behind, can still potentially do some work. So I think I'm happy giving Kaya an S. So this is the first S we've given so far. Then King Narfi's Betrayal is a blue-black saga at rare for three mana, and on the first chapter, each player mills four cards, and then we may exile a creature or planeswalker card from each graveyard. Then on the second and third chapters, until end of turn, we may cast spells from among cards exiled with King Narfi's Betrayal, and we can spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So very interesting card. So this is for the most part going to be a 2 for 1, since we get to exile cards from both our graveyard and the opponent's graveyard. Now we are kind of forced into potentially an awkward sequence, where on the second and third chapters we need to make use of those exiled cards before they go away. So that's potentially a drawback. But yeah, assuming that we're a little bit later in the game and we're not casting Betrayal on turn 3, and the graveyards are pretty full, then Narfi's Betrayal is just a nice 2 for 1. Um, that also gives you a little bit of card selection over what you're getting back. So it can be too upset with Narfi's Betrayal. So yeah, this is probably a, a nice B level card. Seems pretty good. Then we've got Cole, the Forge Master, a 2 mana 2 2 legendary dwarf warrior. At Uncommon, saying whenever another non token creature we control dies, if it was enchanted or equipped, we get to return it to its owner's hand. And then creature tokens we control that are enchanted or equipped get plus 1 plus 1. So overall, Cole handles both tokens and non tokens. Tokens get a nice little boost, whereas non tokens we can potentially put back into our hand. Red-white is the color combination that cares most about enchantment auras and equipment. So yeah, call seems pretty decent. Overall, I wouldn't necessarily give it a super high rating, just because not every deck is going to have a ton of enchantments or equipments to begin with, even if you're in red-white. But the fail case here is still a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with two relevant creature types. There's cards that care about both of those creature types in the set. So yeah, call the Forge Master probably a C plus, just a pretty decent card all around. And then we have Koma Cosmos Serpent, a seven mana six six legendary serpent at Mythic Rare, cannot be countered. And at the beginning of each upkeep, so just want to remind you that this also happens in the opponent's upkeep, which essentially happens right away. Create a 3-3 blue serpent creature token and named Koma's Coil. And we can sacrifice another serpent at any point. And then we get to choose between tapping target permanent and its activated abilities cannot be activated this turn, or Koma gains indestructible until end of turn. Yeah, this is an S. I don't think we need to waste too much time on this. This seems incredibly powerful takes over a game by itself and needs a very specific removal spell to answer it. And uh, yeah, even destroy effects in black won't cut it most of the time since you can just make it indestructible. So there's very few removal spells in a set that cleanly take care of coma. So easy S will dominate a game if you can cast it, which is the only drawback that it's seven mana. Then we have Maya, Bretagard, Protector, 5 mana for a 2-3 legendary human warrior in the Selesnya colors, saying other creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1, so nice reward for making a bunch of tokens, and then whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 white human warrior creature token. 
So Maya's giving me some Tatiova vibes from Dominaria, just an incredibly pow powerful 5-drop with essentially a landfall ability, making a 1-1 one, one token that gets plus 1 plus 1, so we're essentially making 2-2 two, two tokens as long as Maya survives. So the play pattern with Maya is probably going to be that you want to play Maya and be able to play land in the same turn to get immediate value, although sometimes just a plus one plus one to all your creatures is recent enough to run it out. So yeah, Maya seems incredibly powerful and definitely a great incentive for the green-white go white tokens deck. I'm wondering if Maya deserves an A grade just because of how impactful it can be, but we also have to recognize the fail case where you play Maya, you maybe don't have a very big board built up, so the plus one plus one isn't super relevant, it's just a 2-3 which isn't very big for a 5-drop, and maybe you don't have a lot of lands to play afterwards, so there's definitely scenarios where Maya is going to be less than ideal. So overall probably a high B, but a very powerful card and worth building around. Then we have Morit of the Frost, a 5-mana 0-0 zero, zero legendary snow creature shapeshifter at Uncommon. So this is kind of in the uh, blue-green wheelhouse, since that's a color pair that cares about changelings, and this is also a changeling, so it has every creature type, including giant for any giant synergies, and you name it. And you may have Morit of the Frost enters the battlefield as a copy of a permanent you control, so can also copy non-creatures potentially, but only things you control, so cannot copy the opponent's stuff. And it's also a legendary snow permanent in addition to its other types. And if it's a creature, which is probably the thing we're going to copy most often, it also enters with two additional plus one plus one counters on it and has changeling. So there's a lot going on here, but... For the most part, this is 5 mana, copy one of your creatures, and it has 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So, it's not bad, but sometimes the opponent is the one that has the biggest, scariest creature in play, and then you would much rather be able to copy their things. Of course, you still get those 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters, so even copying a 4-drop and putting 2 counters on it can make a pretty big difference. And it has a little bit of synergy with changelings, so... Overall, Morit isn't a bad card, I would definitely play it in every Simic deck I have, but there's definitely scenarios where this is not going to be very exciting because you don't have a lot of good creatures to copy, so we have to recognize that fail case as well. So overall, probably a C+. I'm not, you know, thrilled about this, but I'm definitely going to include it in every blue-green deck I draft, and also potentially has a bit of snow synergy. Haven't really talked about snow much, but we'll get there eventually. Then we have a Narfi Betrayer King, 5 mana, for a legendary snow creature zombie wizard. That's quite a type line. It's a 4-3, so this is at uncommon. Author, snow, and zombie creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1. So there are definitely quite a few snow creatures in the set, mostly in blue, black, and green. There's a few zombies, although not that many. And then for triple snow, so this is the first time we're seeing the snow symbol appear on a card. So the set has a whole bunch of lands that are snow permanents, besides making the color um, that they are associated with also make snow mana at the same time. So if I tap a snow island, it's making blue mana, but it's also snow mana. So I can spend three snow lands essentially or three permanents that make snow mana to activate Narfi's ability in this case. Now the problem is snow lands are lands you actually need to draft, so it's not like you can add any number of snow lands to your deck afterwards, like you can with basic lands. So that's kind of the biggest hurdle for the snow decks in Limited. You actually need to draft snow lands. Each pack will come with at least one snow land. It can be a snow basic land, or it can be a snow dual land, like we'll see in a second here. So for three snow, we can return a Narfi Betrayer King from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So, very powerful ability, gives Narfi this recursion, just keeps coming back, and if the opponent doesn't have a specific removal spell, 
then it's going to be very annoying for them to deal with. But as we mentioned, triple snow is going to be somewhat difficult to achieve, even in some of the more dedicated snow decks. Assuming you're playing a regular draft, eight people at the table, they each open three packs, means there's going to be 24 snow lands going around, um, and I'm neglecting any potential foils. There's definitely a few other cards in the set that can potentially make snow mana besides the lands, but there's not that many. So, yeah, if you're the only or maybe one of two people at the table that care about snow, it could be possible that you end up with nine or ten snow lands in your mana base. But even then, getting to three snow is going to be challenging and uh, definitely more difficult than it might appear at first glance. So that's the main deciding factor here of how good Narfi is. If you can consistently activate the ability, blue-black also has a bit of a mill theme, so you might randomly mill Narfi and be able to get him back from the graveyard, then this card is great. Of course, the more snow permanents and zombies you have, the better. So not an easy card to evaluate. It's going to come down to basically how many snow lands you have, how many zombies and other snow permanents. But assuming you've got a good version of the snow deck with a lot of snow lands and are consistently able to get to three snow, then Narfi is going to be one of your better payoff cards. So overall, what do we give Narfi? I'm going to end up on a B for Narfi. Good card, but just make sure you have enough snow lands to go with them. Then we have another Planeswalker here with a Nico Aris. X, white, and double blue for a Planeswalker that starts out with three loyalty. And when Nico enters the battlefield to create X shard tokens, shard tokens are enchantments that we can sacrifice for two mana to then scry one and then draw a card. So we have the option to play Nico for just three mana if we want to, X equals zero, we don't get any shard tokens. But then what else can we do with the plus one up to one target creature we control cannot be blocked this turn and when that creature deals damage we have to return it to its owner's hand which is a little awkward but potentially has an advantage if we have some enter the battlefield abilities we can re-trigger then the minus one deals two damage to target tapped creature for each card we've drawn this turn so if we haven't drawn any additional cards it's just Minus one to deal two damage to a tapped creature, which isn't super exciting, but maybe we made a few shard tokens that we were able to sacrifice to deal even more damage. And then the second minus one creates a shard token as well. So Nico isn't the most impressive Planeswalker at first glance, but at the same time also shouldn't be underestimated. If we can play Nico in the late game, let's say we've got six mana, X equals three, make three shard tokens. If the game is relatively slow, we'll have time to sacrifice those, which represents a ton of extra cards. And at the same time, our opponent's gonna have to maybe make some bad attacks to get Nico off the table. So, not the most helpful card if you're behind on board, although can still potentially take out some smaller creatures with the minus one. So overall, Nico seems quite good. Um, not the easiest card to evaluate since there's a lot going on with it, but overall, can't uh, be too bad. So I think Nico is a nice A, just a powerful card that's gonna warp the game around him and uh, on the stalled board is easily gonna pull you ahead to win the game. Then we have Nico Defies Destiny, three mana for an uncommon saga. In blue-white on the first chapter we gain two life for each foretold card we own in exile. Now we haven't seen any foretell cards yet, but uh, the foretell mechanic essentially means that in your turn, if your card has foretell, you can pay two generic mana to put it in exile face down. And then at some point in a later turn, you can pay its foretell cost to then cast that card. And the foretell cost is usually cheaper than the normal mana cost. So you're essentially paying a small cost up front to then get a discount later. And... Uh, so in this case, we gain two life for each foretold card we own in exile. On the second chapter, we add blue and white to our mana pool that we can spend only to foretell cards or cast spells that have foretell. So this counts both the two generic mana to exile them and also the casting them from exile. 
and on, on the final chapter we return target card with foretell from our graveyard to the to our hand. So Nico defies destiny of course wants to go in the foretell synergy deck where we have a lot of foretell cards. So assuming we have let's say one or two cards in exile we get to gain two or four life on the first chapter then we get to add a bunch of mana. Now we're still not making up the three mana we spent to cast Nico defies destiny in the first place but we get to recoup a little bit of mana which is nice and then on the final chapter we get to return a foretell card now of course there's going to be situations where uh, the foretell cards you have are all creatures that don't necessarily end up in the graveyard right away so Nico defies destiny seems best with foretell cards that are instants and sorceries like card draw spells or removal spells that are more likely to end up in the graveyard so you can get them back. So even if you have a very synergistic foretell deck there are situations where this can kind of be a blank if you don't draw your foretell cards in the right order or maybe you draw all your foretell creature cards. So I'm not super high on Nico Defies Destiny but of course the best case scenario you get to gain a bit of life, you don't waste too much mana in the process and you get a bit of card advantage by getting back a foretell card from the graveyard, which is nice. So yeah, overall Nico Defies Destiny, not a super high rating, but probably gets like a C in the blue-white foretell deck. It could be a nice role player, but I wouldn't necessarily see this as a great incentive to put me in the blue-white foretell deck. And sometimes it's gonna get cut. Then we have the Raven's Warning. A blue-white saga at rare for three mana on the first chapter makes a 1-1 blue bird creature token with flying and we gain two life. Then on the second chapter whenever one or more creatures we control with flying deal combat damage to a player this turn we can look at that player's hand and draw a card. So we get a little bit of information and we get a card back. And then on the final chapter we may put a card we own from outside the game on top of our library. So outside the game means our sideboard. So in limited the final chapter isn't going to be incredibly relevant assuming you put your good decks in your main deck. But I could see situations where you've got some ex expensive 6 or 7 drop that you couldn't quite fit into the main deck that you're happy to put on top of your deck if it's late in the game and you've got a ton of mana to cast it. So it could definitely come up, um, but for the most part we're looking at the first two chapters, so we get to make a bird token, gain a bit of life, hopefully the opponent doesn't have any removal or flying creatures to block, uh, maybe we've got some other flying creatures in play already to guarantee hitting the opponents, and then getting a card with the second chapter, and getting to look at their hand is just a nice upside. So the Raven's Warning seems quite good, I wouldn't go crazy on it, but uh, Definitely at least a B, just because it can easily be a card that makes a flyer and draws a card with a few small additional upsides. Then we have Sarulf, a Realm Eater. 3 mana for a 3 3 legendary wolf at rare in the Golgari colors. And whenever a permanent an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield. Put a plus one plus one counter on Sarulf, and at the beginning of our upkeep, if Sarulf has one or more plus one plus one counters on it, we can remove all of them. And if we do exile each author non land permanent with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of counters removed this away. So I'm not sure how relevant that final ability is going to end up being getting rid of a few plus one counters to get rid of some smaller creatures doesn't seem incredibly relevant, you would probably rather just have a bigger Sarulf. Um, but who knows, maybe the opponent used an enchantment removal spell on Sarulf, and then it just starts accumulating plus one plus one counters and eventually you can use the ability uh, as kind of a pseudo board wipe. And it's still just a 3-3 that picks up plus one counters over time, so the fail case isn't really all that bad here. So yeah, overall probably give Sarulf a B, but uh, potentially has quite a bit of upside in some matchups. Black-green, also color pair that is pretty good at killing stuff, so you'll be able to put a lot of permanents in the opponent's graveyard to get additional plus one plus one counters. Then Showdown of the Skulls, 
4 mana for a rare saga in red-white on the first chapter exiles at the top 4 cards of our library and until the end of our next turn we may play those cards. So this is reminiscent of some other red cards in the past like Light of the Stage. And then on the second and third chapters whenever we cast a spell this turn put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So Showdown of the Skulls is the type of card that you probably don't want to play on turn four. This also says we may play cards so that means we can also play lands so ideally we haven't played a land for the turn when we play Showdown so we can play potentially multiple lands before we don't get access to those exiled cards anymore. So this is the type of card that you kind of want to play as your last card in your hand to get maximum value so you have more lands in play to potentially cast more spells to get the full benefit from this. And if you get the full benefit, it's essentially four mana draw four, and you get a whole bunch of plus one counters as well, which seems great. So yeah, Showdown of the Skulls seems like an amazing card. Um, I think I'm happy giving this an A. Just requires a little bit of setup and some careful planning to get the most out of it, but uh, the upside's definitely there. Then we have Zvella, Ice Shaper, 3 mana for a 2-4 Legendary Snow Creature Troll Warrior, that's uncommon. And for 3 mana we can tap Zvella to create a colorless snow artifact token named Icy Mana Lith that can tap to add 1 mana of any color. And uh, that mana is also going to be snow mana, because snow permanents make snow mana. So yeah, that's a nice little ability, a 2-4 pretty good blocker so it gives you the time to hopefully activate the ability to make some mana lists. and then for eight mana we can tap Zvella to then look at the top four cards of our library and we can cast a spell from among them without paying its mana cost and put the rest on the bottom so the first ability helps you get to eight mana and then a the second ability can look at the top four and cast a card for free so yeah Zvella seems very fun and potentially quite powerful has a bit of synergy with other cards that care about making snow permanents. So yeah, seems like a fun mini version of Golos, uh, Tireless Pilgrim. So happy giving Svela a B. Then we have another saga with the three seasons. Two mana for a blue-green uncommon that on the first chapter mills three cards. On the second chapter returns up to two target snow permanent cards from our graveyard to our hand. So that includes snow lanes as well as creatures and potential other snow permanents. And then on the final chapter choose three cards in each graveyard and we get to shuffle those back into their owner's libraries. So the three seasons is probably not a card you want to play on turn two unless you've got a hyper synergistic snow deck with a ton of snow permanence in it. Uh, but in the late game, two mana, mill three, and then hopefully you've got two good snow permanents to get back. Uh, getting back a snow lands is an option, but it's probably not super exciting if you're playing this later in the game. So it does require a little bit of setup. The payoff isn't necessarily always there. Um, but in a very dedicated snow deck where at least half of your deck is snow permanence. This can probably do quite a bit of work. That being said, I'm not thrilled about this. Like, I wouldn't necessarily look at this and see it as a payoff card for going into the snow deck. It's more of a reward that you'll you'll probably be able to pick up pretty late in the draft if you happen to be one of the few snow drafters at the table. So three seasons gets a C from me. It's like pretty much on the same level as Nico defines destiny, as in. A card that's fine and in the very synergistic versions of this deck uh, it's probably going to be a card you're happy to have but not even every snow deck is going to be interested in it if it doesn't have enough snow permanence. Then the Trickster God's Heist is a 4 mana uncommon saga in blue black. On the first chapter we may exchange control of two target creatures so a bit of a switcheroo. Then on the second chapter, we may exchange control of two target non-basic, non-creature permanents that share a card type. 
So there's not that many permanents you'll be able to exchange. You can exchange non-basic lands, which there's not that many of. And you can exchange maybe artifacts or enchantments, maybe swap an equipment or maybe swap a saga. You can swap the trickster god's heist with maybe an opposing saga that's about to have a better chapter. And then on the final chapter, target player loses three and we gain three. So a nice lightning helix to the face, essentially. So giving up the final chapter on the heist isn't too big of a deal, if it means maybe stealing a better saga from the opponent. Yeah, I mean, switcheroo is an effect that's potentially good, especially if you've got some smaller creatures you don't mind getting rid of, maybe some 1-1s one or some tokens. Um, so if you can get good leverage out of the first chapter, this is probably going to be good for you. The incidental life gain on the final chapter is nice, but it's not necessarily a reason to play it. So I'm not super high on the heist, but it does look like a playable card. So probably falls in the C category. Um, there's going to be matchups where, of course, it could be better if the opponent has some very large creatures you can steal. Um, but on average, it's probably not going to be incredibly exciting. But yeah. Definitely playable. Then we have Vega, the Watcher. 3 mana for a 2-2 Legendary Bird Spirit with Flying. This is in blue-white, which is a color pair that cares about Fortel. And whenever we cast a spell from anywhere other than our hand, we get to draw a card. Fortel cards we're casting out of Exile, which is indeed anywhere other than our hand. So whenever we cast a card with Fortel out of Exile, we get to draw a card, essentially which seems quite good. We also get a 3 mana 2-2 two -two flyer, which isn't a bad deal. So Vega seems great. Definitely one of the incentives to end up in the blue-white Fortel deck, unlike Nico Defies Destiny, which is more of like a reward. This seems more like the type of card you want to pick early and build around. So yeah, Vega seems great. Happy giving this a B, maybe even a B plus if we were giving B pluses. Then Waking the Trolls is a 6-mana rare saga, which on the first chapter says destroy target land. Now, that's not necessarily the type of effect I want to spend 6 mana on, but there's more. On the second chapter, put target land card from a graveyard on the battlefield under your control. So, we can get back the land we just destroyed. Still, I'm not really willing to pay 6 mana to destroy a land and get a land. We used to pay 4 mana for that in Magic Duels, and we got to ramp right away instead of having to wait an extra turn. But on the final chapter, choose target opponent. If they control fewer lands than you, create a number of 4-4 green Troll Warrior creature tokens with Trample equal to the difference. Well, there's your payoff. Now the problem with this card is, if you're behind on board, Having to wait two entire turns before you get those tokens is a problem, since this isn't really going to help you get back into the game. So this is only really good if the board is somewhat stalled, and hopefully the opponent has at least two fewer lands than you do uh, by the time the third chapter happens, which, you know, assuming you both hit your land drops equally, you get to destroy a land and you get to get a land back from the graveyard, which is going to put you two lands ahead. So, I'm hesitant to give Waking the Trolls a super high grade just because it takes a long time before you get any creatures out of the deal. But it is definitely a card that will win a, a game that's a little bit slower paced, where you've got time to get value out of the third chapter. So overall, happy giving Waking the Trolls a B, but definitely seems like an incredibly fun card in Limited. Bloodline Pretender, 3 mana for an uncommon Shapeshifter Changeling. It's a 2-2, and it enters a battlefield, and we get to choose a creature type, and whenever another creature of the chosen type enters a battlefield under our control, we can put a plus one plus one counter on Bloodline Pretender. So this ideally wants to go in the blue-green shapeshifter deck, where if you play Changeling, it doesn't matter what creature type you name, it's always going to get a plus one plus one counter. But you can also make good use of this in any tribal deck in maybe black green elves you name elf this will grow pretty quickly 
you can maybe play this in like a blue red giants deck so it's not too difficult to find a nice home for bloodline pretender and easily get it up to a 3-3 within a turn and then uh, the sky's the limit really can potentially become quite big and of course being a changeling itself has synergy with other cards that care about changelings or creature types in general so bloodline pretender seems great and uh yeah, this is definitely a card you're happy to pick up relatively early since it fits into so many decks and you're never going to be too disappointed with it. So yeah, C plus seems about right for Bloodline Pretender. We'll go into a lot of different decks. Next up we have a pretty fun one with Colossal Plow. Two mana for an uncommon vehicle. It's a 6-3. And whenever Colossal Plow attacks, add triple white and you gain 3 life, and until end of turn, you don't lose that mana, steps and phases end. Crew cost is 6, so for those that haven't played with vehicles before, vehicles are artifacts, they enter the battlefield, and they just kind of sit there until you decide to crew them. Now, crewing a vehicle requires tapping a certain number of creatures, and how many creatures kind of depends how big the crew cost is. So in this case, Colossal Plow has a pretty steep crew cost of 6, which is definitely more than you want to pay for, usually. So crew 6 means we need to tap a total or maybe exceeding 6 power worth of creatures. So we could tap two three threes. we could tap a 4-4 four four and two one ones. we could tap an 8-8 eight eight if we wanted to. And then once we crew Colossal Plow, it turns into a creature, and in this case it's a 6-3 with those abilities. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other rules concerning vehicles, but I don't know if we need to go into too much detail here. So Colossal Plow has a very steep crew cost. There is one particular combo in the set, which we'll get to once we go over the white cards, that makes it easier to crew Colossal Plow, although playing two mediocre cards to get a slightly above average effect maybe still isn't where we want to be. So overall Colossal Plow gets a D, but I applaud anyone trying to combo with this. Then we have Cosmos Elixir. This was my preview card. Four mana for a rare artifact. Saying at the beginning of your end step, draw a card if your life total is greater than your starting life total. Otherwise, you gain two life. So, uh, Cosmos Elixir is a pretty tricky card to evaluate. It is a card that will always do something. Now, whether that something is always worth it, is going to depend on the situation, but in your average game of limited, where things are more or less even, you trade some creatures, the board stalls out a little bit, then if you're up against a more aggressively slanted deck, this will gain two life each turn, which, you know, life gain by itself isn't necessarily always great since you need a board presence as well, but this will kind of do it passively in the background and while gaining 2 life isn't much, if you survive 5 or 6 turns, gaining 10 or, or 12 life is going to make it difficult to race. And then if the board is stalled and you get to exceed 20 life, and you actually start drawing extra cards each turn, Cosmos Elixir turns into quite a powerhouse. So, definitely a card I'll have to play with a few times to get a better feel for it, but the fact that it is colorless means it goes into any deck, so makes for a pretty good early pick if there's no amazing uncommons in the pack. So I think I'm happy giving Cosmos Elixir a B, and we'll have to play with it a little bit more to know if it maybe exceeds a B or falls more in the C plus category. Funeral Longboat is next. Two mana for a 3-3 vehicle at common. Crew cost is only one, and it also has vigilance. So crew one is much more interesting than crew 6, means we can tap any creature with any amount of power to turn this into a creature. So let's say your average sequence is turn 2 longboat, turn 3, play some random creature, get to hit for 3, and then could also potentially play defense if we have multiple creatures to crew it, thanks to vigilance. Since you can of course crew creatures defensively as well if you have to. 
and a 3-3 is probably going to trade for most 3 drops in the set. There's not too many 3 powered 2 drops out there. So it is going to end up trading up probably. Um, and of course this is also a set where Fortel is a big deal. So a lot of people are going to spend their turn 2 just putting a card in exile. So if you then play turn 2 longboat, you can be off to a pretty nice aggressive start that can punish some of the slower decks. So yeah, Longboat seems totally fine, probably gets a C rating. Um, is going to be just a nice addition in pretty much any deck that wants to be somewhat aggressive and has a lot of creatures to crew it. Then we have a Goldfane pick, 2 mana for a common equipment, giving the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1. Now whenever we're looking at equipment, one of the most deciding factors, whether it's good or bad, is how expensive is the equip cost. The cheaper the equip cost, the easier it is to move around between creatures, so you can maybe attack with a creature that's equipped and then move the equipment back on defense, so you get the benefit from the equipment on uh, defense as well. And in this case the equip cost is only one, so it's incredibly cheap to move around. And whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, we get to make a treasure token. So plus one plus one, not incredibly impactful, but the pick is cheap to play, very cheap to move around, and if you maybe pair it with a flying creature, make a few treasure tokens, gives you a little bit of a mana boost. So I don't think Goldfame pick is necessarily all that exciting, probably a card you can pick up quite late in the draft, but if you have any synergy with equipment, um, maybe you're the red-white deck and you just need to pick up some equipment for some synergies, or you're just a very low to the ground aggressive deck that uh, has a lot of cheap creatures that could use a plus one plus one bonus. This could definitely uh, make its way into the deck, but I'm definitely not excited by it. So this is probably like a, a low C, maybe C minus if I were to give a C minus or D plus. Um, I could see playing it in some decks, but still not super thrilled about it. Then we've got Maskwood Nexus, 4 mana for a rare artifact, saying creatures you control are every creature type, and the same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards we own that aren't on the battlefield. Alright, that's a little bit to take in here. So this means any tribal synergies are amplified, cards that care about creature types potentially get better, and if your opponent has uh, the rare saga we've seen earlier that deals for damage to uh, non-giants, your creatures are immune to it as well. And then the important part, of course, three mana. We can tap Maskwood Nexus to create a 2-2 blue shapeshifter creature token with changeling. So yeah, Maskwood Nexus is slow. Four mana doesn't necessarily impact the board right away. But if the board stalls out, this will give you a great mana sink, 3 mana to make a 2-2 two -two with Changeling, which is going to have a lot of synergy in the set too. So if your deck has any sort of tribal Changeling synergies, this will go up in value. In your average limited deck, this is probably still a card you'll play more often than not, just because of the potential of breaking board stalls. But maybe a hyper-aggressive deck doesn't quite have room for this, or maybe a slow deck just has too many slow cards already that it maybe doesn't want this, but I imagine most limited decks are happy to have Mask with Nexus. But it might be too slow to catch you back up in some matchups. But uh, yeah, overall, I'm still pretty happy with Mask with Nexus, and I could see doing a ton of work in especially kind of the blue-green changeling deck that might have some additional synergies with it. So where do we fall on it? Probably gets a B. Um, could easily take over a game, but sometimes might be a little bit too slow to get there by itself and will require a good early game to survive until the point where you can leverage it to its full potential. Next up we have Pyre of Heroes 2 mana for a rare artifact can pay 2 mana, tap, and sacrifice a creature to search your library for a creature card that shares a creature type with a sacrificed creature and has converted mana cost equal to 1, plus that creature's converted mana cost 
and we can put that on a battlefield. Can only be activated at sorcery speed. Yeah, I'm not sold on Pyre of Heroes. First off, you need to build your deck around it somewhat. You need a lot of creatures that have the same type or a lot of changelings. And then you need to be able to build up kind of this gradual increasing mana costs chain of creatures. Uh, ideally with some sort of enter the battlefield ability, so you get an advantage when they enter the battlefield and then you sacrifice them afterwards. Just seems like a bit of a hassle to set up. Um, yeah, I mean this might be fun to try once in limited, see if you can get there, but I don't recommend it as a particularly high pick, so probably a D for Pyre of Heroes. Raider's Carve is a 3 mana vehicle, it's a 4-4, four, four, and the crew cost is 3. Now 3 is a little steep as far as crew costs go, but there's a little, little bit more upside here when the carve attacks. We can look at the top card of our library, and if it's a land card, we can put it on the battlefield tapped. So 3 mana, 4-4 four, four vehicle with crew 3. Eh, I'm not super excited by this. Um, crew cost is a little high, and the payoff is just a 4-4, four, four, even if it can maybe find a few lands. Um, this is a little bit below average as far as vehicles go. Now of course it is colorless, so it can go into any deck, so if you're scraping for additional playables, you could potentially do worse, but yeah, this is probably C minus D plus territory. Um, so yeah, I'll give this a D since we avoid giving C- grades. Next up we have Raven Wings, 2 mana for a common equipment, and the equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 0, has flying, and most importantly is a bird in addition to its other types. So the bird line of text is probably more flavor text, I could see some small synergies with this, uh, as we'll see later, but for the most part it's flavor text. And then the equip cost is 2. So we've seen a lot of these flying equipments in the past. Uh, usually the equip cost, or at least the mana cost, is a little cheaper. But in this case we do get one additional power, which is a big deal when paired with an evasive creature. Means your uh, potential clock to kill the opponent is a lot faster. And uh, yeah, this is typically a card you'll be happy to have in a green deck where you've got big creatures that maybe lack evasion, or in, as we mentioned, the red-white Equipment Matters deck is going to be happy to have this as a finisher to get those last points of damage in. So still not a card that every deck is going to want. It is a little bit expensive to play and equip, but a great card to end the game if there's any sort of board stall or if you're aggressive and need to get those last points in. So Raven Wings gets a C, just a fine playable that will sometimes get cut. Next up is Replicating Ring, 3 mana for a snow artifact at uncommon that taps to add 1 mana of any color. So this is kind of our mana lith of the set. Now because it's a snow artifact it makes snow mana, so if you're the snow deck that needs access to a lot of snow mana, this might potentially go up in value. And then the flavor text for Replicating Ring also happens to be rules text. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a knight counter on a Replicating Ring. Then if it has 8 or more knight counters on it, remove all of them and create 8 colorless snow artifact tokens named Replicated Ring with the ability to tap for one man of any color. So yeah, we don't really take that last part too much into account when evaluating Replicating Ring. Once you are this far into the game, you probably shouldn't care too much about getting all that additional mana. So Replicating Ring, not a card you're going to be very interested in unless you're the dedicated snow deck that needs access to a lot of snow mana, or maybe you're like a 3-4 color snow deck and the mana fixing is uh, particularly helpful. But I would give Replicating Ring a D but seems fun if you can uh, make some tokens with it. Next up we have a Ruined Crown. This is another interesting one. 3 mana for an uncommon equipment. 
Equip costs is 2, gives the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1. But there's more. When Ruined Crown enters the battlefield, we can search our library, hand, and or graveyard for a Rune card and put it onto the battlefield attached to Ruined Crown. If we search our library, we shuffle it. So Rune cards, as we'll see once we go over all the colors, are enchantment auras with a Rune subtype, and they all have different abilities uh, associated with their colors. So the white one gives lifelink, the blue one gives flying, black one death touch, red one haste, green one trample, and some of them will also give additional power and toughness. And most importantly, when the runes enter the battlefield, you get to draw a card. And runes, besides equipping or attaching to creatures, can also attach to equipment and will give that equipment the same effect. So we can play Rune Crown, assuming we have at least one rune in our library, get to search it up, attach it to the crown, draw a card from the rune entering the battlefield, and now Rune Crown will have the additional abilities granted by the rune. So if you have a deck with at least one rune, Rune Crown could be quite interesting. Of course, there is the scenario where you draw the rune before you draw the Rune Crown, and then you're not getting as much value out of it since you're kind of losing out on the card draw from the rune entering the battlefield. But it is nice if you have one or more runes, because the effect of giving this equipment additional bonuses can definitely make a pretty big difference, especially with effects like lifelink or flying. And if you have two or more runes, then rune crown of course goes up in value dramatically, because then you even have a bit of selection over which rune and which ability to get, depending on the situation. So yeah, Rune Crown seems a very fun limited card that you need to build around a little bit. Without any runes in your deck, I wouldn't consider this. With one rune, I think it becomes playable, and it's probably like a C. And with two or more runes, this turns into even a B, just because of how potentially flexible and powerful it is. So yeah, it will vary based on how many runes you have in your deck. On average, what do we give Rune Crown? Probably like a C+, but I could easily see it ending up in the B range if you have multiple runes to search up. Next up we have Scorn Effigy, 3 mana for a 2-3 artifact creature Scarecrow with Fortel 0. So this is, I believe, the first actual Fortel card we've come across. So Fortel 0 might seem a little strange at first glance. So in general, if you have a card with Fortel during your turn, so don't get to do this in the opponent's turn unless a card specifies otherwise. We can pay two generic mana and exile this from our hand face down, so our opponent doesn't get to see which card we're foretelling. So there's a lot of mind games surrounding foretell as well. And then we can cast it on a later turn for its foretell cost. So this is very important. You cannot put a card in exile and cast that same card in the same turn. Otherwise, Scorn Effigy would be 2 mana to exile and then 0 mana to play, which of course would be a little weird that it costs 3 mana. But it's essentially 2 mana, wait a turn, and then the Fortel cost is 0, so we get to play it for free. So, a bit of a, a weird card if you're not used to the Fortel mechanic. But what Scorn Effigy does is make it very easy to cast 2 or more cards in the same turn, because the Fortel cost is 0 so we can play it for free out of exile. So if we have any cards that want us to cast two cards in the same turn, Scorn Effigy will make that very easy. So this is going to be a great payoff card for any of the, let's say, black-white decks uh, that care about casting two cards in the same turn. So yeah, I could see Scorn Effigy becoming a pretty important role player for those uh, decks. It's also colorless, so technically fits into any deck. And you're, at the end of the day, spending 2 mana for 2-3, even if you have to wait a turn for it. So, I think Scorn Effigy is going to be one of those unsung heroes of the set, maybe like Pag Beast was in Zendikar Limited, uh, just because of in, in how many decks it can potentially fit, and uh, will potentially enable some neat synergies. So, I could see giving Scorn Effigy a C+, because of that. Um, I guess the main difference with a card like Pack Beast is that it maybe doesn't go into as many decks, 
because not every deck cares about casting two spells in the same turn. But uh, yeah, I think we'll be happily surprised with how effective Scorn Effigy is. So I'll start with uh, an optimistic C plus for Scorn Effigy, although it might fall down to a C. Next up we have Weathered Runestone, 2 mana for an uncommon artifact, saying non-land permanent cards in graveyards and libraries cannot enter the battlefield, and players can cast spells from graveyards or libraries. This doesn't impact Foretell in any way, shape or form, so this is purely a sideboard card for constructed purposes, a slightly more expensive Graph Digger's Cage that has a few additional effects. But uh, for limited, I think this is going to be one of the few F ratings we're going to hand out. So I wouldn't really consider this, even if the opponent has like one or even two reanimation effects. It's going to take a lot more for me to consider bringing this in out of the sideboard. And you're probably better off just playing a basic land if you're short on playables. And then we get to our lanes. So... As I mentioned earlier, each pack in Kaldheim Limited is going to have one snow land. It can either be a snow basic land or, as we see here, a snow dual land. Enters the battlefield tapped and then of course adds either red or white mana. And those mana will also be snow mana. So if you have any card that cares about needing snow mana to activate, this will do it for you. So we've got this entire cycle of snow dual lands. Arctic Tree Line in green white, Glacial Floodplain blue white, Highland Forest red green, Ice Tunnel blue black, Rhinewood Falls blue green, Snowfield Sinkhole black white, Sulphur's Mire in black red, Volatile Fjord in blue red, Woodland Chasm in black green which uh, are all nice dual lands for limited. So the fact that they fix your mana and count as snow lands make them quite valuable. You would easily play them in a deck that doesn't care about snow just to have a dual land that comes into play tapped, which is still in pretty high demand in limited to make your mana base better. And especially if you're the snow deck that cares about snow lands, these are going to be incredibly valuable. So I wouldn't be surprised to uh, take these quite highly, maybe even at a B level, just because of how important they are to the snow decks. And of course, a mana fixing is always a nice bonus too. So I think these will be great for limited and are going to be in pretty high demand. And then we also have the snow basic lands. So we've got snow covered plains, which does have the basic land type, which can be relevant for constructed. Island, swamp, mountain and forest. Now some of these snow covered lands are going to be strangely more in demand than others just because of some colors caring more about snow lands. So green, blue and black are the three colors that care about snow the most. Um, red and white of course will have a few cards that mention snow but they're definitely less interested in them. So that means that a snow forest is going to much be in much higher demand than a snow plains, for instance. Uh, I could potentially give these basics a different grade for each one of them, but I'm just going to give them a, a cumulative grade here, uh, which is probably going to be around a C plus, I would say. So pretty much any deck is going to be happy with these, even if you don't have a ton of snow synergies, because you never know uh, which snow cards you might open in future packs. So especially if these are on color, you're going to be quite happy with them and take them around a C plus, so over some of the more mediocre playables. And then if you're the snow deck that absolutely needs snow lands for its deck to function, you're going to be taking these pretty much over any C level cards. So in that case, I could see these going up to like a, a low B where you only take cards that are exceptional over them and then take pretty much every snow land you can get, even the off color ones. So even if you're like a, a blue-green snow deck, you might pick up a few snow-covered plains or mountains just to meet the minimum number of snow lands for some of your synergies to work out. So the snow decks are definitely going to be interesting to build in Limited. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend building a four or five color snow deck if you're just starting out and you're not used to the set, but those are going to be hopefully a lot of fun uh, for more experienced players and once you get more used to it. 
Next up, we also have an entire cycle of uh, these uncommon lands that come into play tapped and then have an ability in two different colors for you to sacrifice them and get some sort of beneficial effect. Now, lands in general that have beneficial effects are great for limited because, as we all know, sometimes in limited you flood out, draw a few too many lands, so then being able to essentially use a land as a spell is incredibly valuable. So even though you might not think that these are good, just because it requires a bunch of mana and sacrificing a land, they're definitely better than they look and should be taken quite highly. Axgard Armory is uh, 4 mana to tap and sacrifice, so we need 5 mana total before we can get rid of it. And then we can search our library for an aura card and or an equipment card, reveal them, put them into our hand and then shuffle our library. So not every deck is going to have a lot of auras and equipments, even if you're red-white, but you do potentially get a nice 2 for 1 here if you can search up both. And uh, some aura cards might be removal spells too, so that's great. And as we mentioned, this is just pure upside. The cost of including this in your red-white tech is that your land comes into play tapped, otherwise it can provide a ton of additional utility in the late game. So Axgard Armory, red-white, not one of the more exciting uh, lands, but still quite good, so it still give this uh, a C plus at the very least, maybe even a low B. So just take it uh, quite highly if you're the corresponding colors. Then we've got Bretagard Stronghold in green-white, which enters tapped, taps for green, and then for white, or for double white and green, we can tap and sacrifice it to put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures, as they also gain vigilance and lifelink until end of turn. So we can only use this at sorcery speed. So yeah, Stronghold seems great, can easily swing a race in your favor. Those counters are permanent, so this probably goes up to the B range at the very least. A great payoff for being green-white. Gates of Istval. For 5 mana we can tap and sacrifice to gain 2 life and draw 2 cards. So for those that remember the blue tap land from Dominaria that can be sacrificed for 2 cards. If this one also gains 2 life, so just more upside. And uh, yeah, this card's great. Happy to have this in a blue-white deck. Probably take it around a B. So pretty high pick. Then we've got the Slumber Mount in red-green. Now this one is a little pricey. It's 6 mana and tap it. And then we get to destroy target land and make a 4-4 Troll Warrior creature token with Trample. Of course the effect is very powerful, but it is 6 mana and we need to tap the Slumber Mount, so we essentially need 7 lands in play before we can use this, which is a little bit on the slow side. Uh, most of these lands we can only activate at sorcery speed, this one is an exception, and we can actually use that instant speed as well, although of course the opponent's probably gonna expect an ambush if you've got 7 mana untapped, including the Slumber Mount, so it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but maybe in the first couple days people might not know it. And if the opponent has one of these lands themselves, being able to destroy it is great, although they're probably going to be able to sacrifice it before you, your Slumber Mount becomes online. Yeah, Slumber Mount still great, still take it and play it in any red-green deck, obviously, but because it's a little bit more on the expensive side, I'm a little bit lower on this than some of the previous ones, so this is probably more like a C plus, B minus. Great Hall of Sternheim is the black-white one, three mana, tap and sacrifice, as well as sacrifice another creature you control. Some people might miss that line of text. And then you get to make a 4-4 white angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance. This one can only be activated at sorcery speed. So you do need a bit of sacrifice fodder to get the angel, but hopefully in black you've got a few of those. White has a, a few creatures that can leave behind a token when they die, so you're not too upset to sacrifice those. And then a 4-4 flyer seems great. Why can it only be activated at sorcery speed? It's probably to prevent those feel bad situations uh, where you're not paying a ton of attention to the opponent's lands and out of nowhere they make a 4-4 blocker and that could potentially lead to some feel bad situations. But uh, yeah, Great Hall of Sternheim's a great card for limited. Probably falls in the B range. 
Then we've got Immersturm Skullcairn. This is the black red one for mana tap and sacrifice to deal three damage to a player, and that player discards a card. This one I'm a little bit less interested in than some of the previous ones, but it's still great, so still probably a C plus. Lejara Mirror Lake is a blue green one, five mana tap and sacrifice to make a token that's a copy of target creature we control, except it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. This one also seems great. So probably like a B. Port of Carfell is a blue-black one. For six mana, tap and sacrifice, mill four cards, and then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Can't really ambush anything because it comes into play tapped. Um, so this one's also a bit on the pricey side. Essentially needs seven lands total before you can activate this. So that's why I'm also a little bit lower on this uh, than some of the other ones, but still a pretty high pick, so a C+. And Scamfar Elder Hall is a black-green one. Goes well into the elf deck, because you can, for five mana, tap and sacrifice up to one target creature you control, or you don't control, gets minus two, minus two until end of turn, and you get to make two one one green elf warrior creature tokens. So this is probably a B as well. And Surtland Frostpire is a blue-red one. For five mana, tap and sacrifice to scry two, and then deal two damage to each creature can only be activated at sorcery speed. So the opponent will see this coming, so if they have a bunch of small creatures they can kind of plan for the Frostpire potentially killing them, which takes away some of the effectiveness. But it's still a card you'll play in any blue-red deck, so C plus for this as well. And then our final cycle of lands is the Pathways, which are now completed if we combine them with the ones from Zendikar. So Zendikar had six of them, we've got four here, with the blue-green pathway, the black-red pathway, the black-green pathway, and the blue-white pathway. So these will be amazing for Constructed, allowing some new archetypes that maybe didn't have a good mana base before. For Limited they're still great, especially of course if you're playing those two colors and it can act as a nice bit of mana fixing. So I would probably take these around a B as well. And then we've got some additional lands here with Shimmer Drift Veil, which is a snow land that enters the battlefield tapped. And as it enters the battlefield, you choose a color and then taps add one mana of the chosen color. So, yeah, nice bit of mana fixing, great for the snow deck. And pretty much any two color deck is going to be happy with a bit of mana fixing, even if it comes into play tapped. So, this is probably like a C plus B minus type card. Then we have Faceless Haven, which is another snow land. Taps for colorless, so it's a colorless snow mana. And for triple snow, Faceless Haven becomes a 4-3 creature with vigilance and all creature types until end of turn. So once again we have the issue of needing triple snow, which is going to be a little bit difficult to achieve outside of the most dedicated snow decks. So I'm hesitant to give Faceless Haven a very high grade, just because of how difficult it is to get to Triple Snow, even in the snow decks. But it's still probably uh, a card you'll play in most snow decks, I'm assuming, just because it is, at the end of the day, a land that also taps for snow. So it is going to be strictly better than a Snow Plains if you're kind of the Sultai snow deck. So it's probably still like a CC plus for the snow decks but outside of snow decks you probably don't want it. And then Tyrite Sanctum, a rare land that taps for colorless. For two mana can tap it and then target legendary creature becomes a god in addition to its other types. And you can put a plus one plus one counter on it. Now we've seen quite a few legendary creatures at uncommon and there's a bunch more at rare. So there's definitely no shortage of legendary creatures in the set. But if your deck only has like one or two of them, it's still questionable whether or not you want to put a colorless land in your deck and make your mana base worse. But then for four mana we can also tap and sacrifice the Sanctum to put an indestructible counter on target god. Now the interesting part is that changelings have many creature types, including god. So you don't necessarily need to go through the step of turning a legendary creature into a god to make use of the second mode of making a god indestructible if you have a changeling in play. So the deck where I'm excited about Tyrite Sanctum is kind of the blue-green changeling deck or any deck with a lot of changelings because you can just 
use this for mana tap and sacrifice and make one of your creatures indestructible, which can be incredibly difficult for some decks to deal with, especially if the creature is actually a pretty big one. So Sanctum, not a very high pick, but as I mentioned, could be quite nice in a changeling deck, so probably like a CC+. And then I think this is our final land, the World Tree, a land that comes into play tapped, taps to add green, as long as we control six or more lands, lands we control can tap for one mana of any color, so a bit of a chromatic lantern. As soon as we hit six lands and then we can spend a whole rainbow, tap and sacrifice the world tree to search our library for any number of god cards, put them on the battlefield and then shuffle our library. So changelings are gods, so I guess those can potentially be a thing. There's a few gods in the set, but they're usually rares or mythics, so it's not going to be all that uh, easy to search up. Yeah, uh, I don't think this is a great card for limited, and you shouldn't need to rely on the mana fixing from the world tree in the first place if you've got a, a decent mana base, doesn't have any snow synergy, so the cost of coming into play tapped probably doesn't outweigh the the upside that this card potentially has, so I think this is a D. Alright, first white card is Axeguard Braggart, 4 mana for a 3-3 Dwarf Warrior with Boast. This is the first Boast card we've seen. In this case the Boast cost is 1 and white to untap Axeguard Braggart and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So Boast means it's an ability we can only activate if this creature attacked this turn and can only be activated once per turn. So Braggart is a 3-3, it attacks, presumably we've got one and a white available, and if the situation calls for it we can activate the boast ability to put a plus one counter on it and untap it. So it can potentially attack as a 4-4 that also untaps, so kind of has pseudo vigilance, which is potentially quite nice. So the best case scenario is your the deck that's kind of attacking and on offense, and you can sort of treat this as a creature that will keep growing, hit hit for four damage, play defense as well, next turn potentially hit for five, and just keeps on growing. Now the bad scenario is where you're on defense and this is a four mana three three and you just don't get a chance to attack because you're so far behind. Although you can potentially still sneak in and attack and then untap it, make it bigger, and have it back on defense. At the end of the day, Braggart is definitely a playable card, and probably a card I'm gonna end up playing most of the time in a white deck, but uh, if it's maybe a slightly more controlling deck it's not gonna be super interested in it, but this is probably just a, a nice C level card, uh, but will maybe go up in value if you have a bit of synergy with the creature types or if you're more aggressive. Next up we have a Batter Shield Warrior. 2 and a white for a human warrior at uncommon, it's a 2-2, also has boast for 1 and a white, saying creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So this is potentially a payoff for the go white deck, which is typically going to be green white, although some other decks might end up with a bunch of tokens too. Now the problem with boasting the battle shield warrior is that even if you boast it, it's still only going to be a 3-3, so it's pretty easy for the opponent to trade off for the Battle Shield Warrior. Now if you're a go wide deck it kind of demands that the opponent trades for this otherwise giving your creatures plus one plus one turn after turn is going to represent too much damage to overcome. So it is definitely kind of a must answer card in a way, but if you're on the back foot it is once again just a three mana two two which is definitely below the curve. So I would only really consider this in the most synergistic token decks. So even kind of the average aggressive deck um, might not be super into this, but if you get a nice low curve, maybe go one drop, two drop into a Battle Shield Warrior, it can deliver the beat towns. So I think a C is probably more where I end up with Battle Shield Warrior. Don't know if it quite gets to the C+, because not every white deck might be super into this. Then we have Battlefield Raptor or one mana flyer of the set. This is a one mana, one two, flying first strike. So it looks unassuming. Uh, one mana flyers 
for a long time have not been particularly exciting and limited, but as we've seen, sets start including more and more incentives for these. Maybe you're a go white deck and you just want to get on the board quickly. Maybe you're a deck that has some equipments or uh, enchantment auras that you can put on the raptor to enhance it. And then it actually turns into a pretty annoying threat with evasion that's difficult for the opponent to interact with. So if they don't have a removal spell right away, they might be in trouble. So Battlefield Raptor is kind of a build around card. It doesn't go into every white deck, but in the hyper aggressive decks that just want to get on the board quickly and maybe have some ways to make it better, uh, Raptor could be a solid role player. So I think this is probably a C, but could potentially be a nice build around card in some of the white decks. Then we've got Baskir Shieldmate, 2 mana for a 2 1 Human Warrior. That when it dies, creates a 1 1 white human warrior creature token. So, yeah, fine to drop. Um, this can potentially go well in the tokens deck or can be used as sacrifice fodder if you have cards that need you to sacrifice creatures, maybe in black white. There's a few cards like the land we've seen so far. So, this seems like yet another C level card, just a fine role player. Bound in Gold, on the other hand, two and a white for an enchantment aura. This is going to be one of the better removal spells in white at common. Enchants any permanent, and the enchanted permanent cannot attack, block, or crew vehicles, and its activated abilities cannot be activated unless they're mana abilities. So yeah, this card's great. It's also an aura, so can potentially search it up with the armory, the red-white land we've seen. The only downside is if the opponent has maybe a way to bounce their creature to kind of free it, or maybe a way to sacrifice it to still get a bit of value afterwards. But for the most part, Bounding Gold is going to be kind of your premium common removal spell in white. So this is a nice B. Clarion Spirits, 2 mana for a 2-2 spirit at uncommon, saying whenever you cast your second spell each turn, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. So this is a great payoff for casting two spells in the same turn. And being a two drop itself means that it's pretty easy to double spell with Clarion Spirit. White is also a color that has a lot of foretell cards, and some of the foretell costs are quite low. So you can potentially foretell something on turn two, and then maybe that card only costs a single mana to cast afterwards. And then on turn three you can play Clarion Spirit, play your foretell card for one mana and make a spirit token right away. So yeah, Clarion Spirit seems great. Probably going to be at its best in either Black-White, which is a color pair that cares about casting two spells in the same turn, Blue-White, which has probably the highest density of foretell cards, making it easier to trigger the Clarion Spirit, and probably also pretty good in the Green-White tokens deck, just because uh, making spirit tokens could have a nice go white synergy as well. I think those are probably the color pairs where spirit's going to be at its best, but pretty much any white tech can make good use of this. So this seems like a pretty high pick, worth building around, but the fail case is still a 2 mana 2-2 two -two that will maybe occasionally make a 1-1 one -one token. So yeah, I'm pretty high on Clarion Spirit. This is probably a B card I'm happy to first pick and uh, will be quite strong and limited. Next up we have a Code Spell Cleric, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one Human Cleric at common. It has Vigilance, and when a Cleric enters a battlefield, if it was the second spell we cast this turn, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. So once again, one of those enablers slash payoff cards for casting multiple spells in the same turn. Now, the problem with Cleric is... What if you draw this in the late game and you don't have another spell to cast, then this is just a 1-1 Vigilance for one, which is pretty unexciting. But if you have one of those low-curve decks with a ton of 1-drops, this can make it very difficult for the opponent to come back if you get an, off to an explosive start. So this is the type of card with pretty high variance. Uh, not every white deck is going to want this, but some very specific hyper-aggressive decks might be into it. At the end of the day, this is probably a card you can easily pick up late in the pack that I expect to wheel more often than not. So I don't think this gets a particularly high grade. So probably a D, but I could easily see some 
hyper aggressive white decks wanting access to this. Divine Gambit is a controversial one. Two mana for an uncommon sorcery saying exile target artifact, creature or enchantment an opponent controls and then that player may put a permanent card from their hand onto the battlefield. So a removal spell with potentially a pretty high downside if the opponent can put something expensive in play. So the typical use case of Divine Gambit is you're going to use this in a late game once the opponent has emptied most of their hands and already has access to a lot of lands and then the drawback is mostly mitigated. You're not going to want to cast this on turn two unless you're desperate. So that's kind of the lens through which we have to evaluate Divine Gambit. And as a removal spell deals with artifacts and enchantments as well as creatures, so it has a bit of flexibility. So it's not bad. Uh, that being said, it's a, a spell that you can't really safely cast in the first couple turns. So the fact that it only costs two mana is mostly useful for trying to cast two spells in the same turn in the late game. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to cast this early. Probably brings Divine Gambit to around the C, where it's a removal spell, but it has some severe drawbacks and you need to kind of play around it a little bit. Also, if you notice your opponent has multiple Divine Gambits and you're playing sideboarded games, you can maybe put some expensive cards out of the sideboard into your main deck, even if you don't have the colors to cast them, just because of the potential of uh, putting them in play through the opponent's Divine Gambit. We'll see a bit later in blue, there's this very expensive Icebreaker Kraken, which is very difficult to cast since it requires a bunch of snow lands. But uh, who knows, if the opponent has multiple Divine Gambits, it could set up some fun plays and some interesting moments. So be on the lookout for the sideboarding strategy as well. Next up we have a Doomscar, 5 mana for a rare sorcery, saying destroy all creatures. And it also has Fortel for 1 and double white. So we can put this face down for 2 mana on turn 2. And then on turn 3 we could already wipe the board. So Doomscar seems quite good. Uh, sweepers are historically quite good and limited because you're the one that kind of knows about them and the opponent uh, doesn't know whether to play around them or not. And then the Fortel mechanic makes this one even more flexible. So I think Doomscar is just an A. Powerful sweeper. It's not the only sweeper. We'll see that there's a surprising number of uh, sweeper effects in the set and a lot of them are even one-sided so I guess to an extent the fact that there's multiple sweepers means that the sweepers themselves get a little bit worse because people will kind of plan to play around them more often but that being said I think this is still a pretty high pick and uh, gonna be leading to some blowouts where the opponent doesn't play around a sweeper and gets their entire board swept Doomscar Oracle, 2 and a white for a 3-2 human cleric, cleric at common, saying whenever we cast our second spell each turn we gain 2 life and foretells for just a single white mana. So if we go through the foretell mechanic here, it's still 3 mana total, but we can pay 2 mana up front and then only 1 mana later. Makes it pretty easy to double spell since we can potentially exile this on turn 2 and then turn 3 play Oracle plus another 2 drop, gain 2 life right away or maybe get some other double spell synergies going. So yeah, Oracle seems pretty solid. Gonna be pretty happy with it in pretty much every white deck and in some specific decks that care about double spelling it's gonna be even better. Uh, has some foretell synergy too. So this seems like a solid role player. I'm not sure if this goes quite up to a C plus or if it's more of a C. I think I'll start with a C for Doomscore Oracle, but could easily see this going up in value a little bit. Then we have Giant Ox, 2 mana for an 06 Ox at common, and the Ox can crew vehicles using its toughness rather than its power. So we alluded to this earlier when talking about the vehicle, the uh, Colossal Plow. So Giant Ox by itself can crew 
the plow, which has crew six, and this has six toughness and can crew vehicles with its toughness. That being said, the giant ox, not a particularly great card. The fact that it doesn't have any power also has the additional downside in the set of not dissuading any boast creatures from attacking, so the opponent can potentially attack with their boast creatures and get some sort of benefit from them, whether it's making a token or maybe drawing an extra card, who knows. So the giant ox doesn't really stop those creatures. So yeah, this card is just not very good. Uh, I would dissuade people from putting giant ox and plow in the same deck just because those two cards synergize, because even if you combine them, the total effect is still not that exciting, and individually the cards aren't very good. But it is definitely a fun card to have around, can maybe fit into some fun constructed decks with high alert. So Giant Ox gets a D, but nice addition for sure. Glorious Protector is next, 4 mana for a 3-4 Angel Cleric at rare. It also has Flash and Flying, and foretells for 2 and a white. So can essentially spend 5 mana to foretell it, but the upside of course is that we get access to a cheaper flash creature, and if we don't have anything else going on on turn 2, it means we can have a 3-4 flyer in play by turn 3. And when Protector enters the battlefield, we can exile any number of non-angel creatures we control until Protector leaves the battlefield. So what does this mean? If the opponent's points a removal spell at one of our creatures, we can flash in Glorious Protector, exile it, have a 3-4 in play, and if they eventually deal with Protector, we get our author or creature back that was about to die. So that's one potential use case. Of course, a 3-4 Flash Flyer is pretty good at ambushing opposing creatures, so ignoring the exile ability, we can just flash this in if the opponent attacks us with a 3-powered creature and potentially take it out. And Protector can also potentially be an anti-sweeper card if the opponent casts a sweeper. It can exile any number of non-angels, so we can essentially exchange Protector for all the creatures in play, which might be a beneficial exchange. So there's definitely a lot of use cases for Protector, but at the end of the day, it's mostly just a 3-4 Flash Flyer that we can potentially play on turn 3 already, which is great. So this just gets an A from me, just... Uh, ignoring any additional abilities, and potentially has even more upside. Then we've got God's Hall Guardian, 6 mana for a 3-6 cat at common, with Vigilance, and Foretell for 3 and a white. So this is one of those cards where having Foretell is very beneficial, just because it means we can cast a 6-drop even with only 4 lands in play, can pay 2 up front and then 4 afterwards, so by turn 4 we could have a 3-6 Vigilance in play, which is going to be bigger than most creatures on the battlefield, can play defense nicely, maybe get in for 3 damage every now and then. And even though it might seem like the set is going to have a lot of these expensive foretell cards, it's actually not necessarily the case, a lot of foretell cards are usually like 3 and 4 drops that uh, you can potentially split up over the course of two turns, but there's not that many 6 and 7 drops with Fortel. A 3-6 on turn 4 is a big deal, survives a lot of the removal spells in the set, and uh, yeah, it's just very big and difficult to get past. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about the God's Hall Guardian here, and I'm willing to start this out on a C+, just because of how it lines up with other creatures in the set. Then we have a Gold Maw Champion, 2 and a white for a 2-3 Dwarf Warrior with Boast for 1 and a white, saying tap target creature. Now, Hammer Skull, this is not. That was a 2-3 Dinosaur that didn't need to spend any mana to tap a creature when it attacked. That card was incredibly powerful. Now Gold Maw Champion is still very good. And this is gonna allow you to get in some attacks that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So this seems like a pretty annoying card to deal with if you're on the other side of the battlefield staring down champion from an aggressive deck, especially if they get multiple champions going, it's going to be a nightmare to block. So even though it's going to cost you 2 mana each time to tap a creature, I think the champion's still going to be quite good and potentially allow you to boast a bunch of other creatures that you otherwise couldn't 
just by setting up those good attacks. So this falls somewhere between a C and a C plus. I think I'm going to start out with a C plus on Gold Mod Champion, just because I expect this to be an important role player in a lot of aggressive white decks. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll have to wait and see. And our next card is Halvar, a god of battle, 4 mana for a mythic rare legendary creature god. It's a 4-4, saying creatures we control that are enchanted or equipped have double strike. And at the beginning of each combat, we may attach target aura or equipment attached to a creature we control to target creature we control. So Halvar is an interesting one, especially because we can potentially also play it as the back side, which is Sword of the Realms. So this is a dual-faced card. We've seen dual-faced lands in Zendikar. Now we've got dual-faced cards in Kaldheim as well. These aren't lands, so we can choose whether or not we play the equipment half for two mana, or whether we play the creature half for four mana. And Sword of the Realms, potentially even more exciting than the creature half, is a two mana legendary equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two plus so and has vigilance, so it can play offense and defense, and whenever the equipped creature dies, return it to its owner's hand. And the equip cost is one and a white. So we can play Sword, equip for two mana, and then we've got a creature that can play offense and defense, and if the opponent trades, assuming the creatures end up trading, we get it back into our hand, so we can just replay it and eventually re-equip it. So Halvar and Sword of the Realms seems like a pretty powerful duo. Of course, in Constructed, the fact that you can play either side means that the drawback of it being legendary doesn't come up as much, since if you draw two copies, you can just play one as the creature half, the other as the equipment, and they even synergize with each other. So that's pretty neat for Constructed, but for Limited, this still seems great, probably worthy of an A, just because of the flexibility, although I expect to play this as the equipment more often than not. Next up we have a reprint with Invoke the Divine. For 3 mana, we've got an instant at common that destroys target artifact or enchantment and we gain 4 life. I don't think this is a card we're going to main deck very often, but it is a very useful sideboard card. So this is probably a D, where it's a card you're usually unhappy to have in the main deck, but if it's your last edition, you can definitely have some worse cards in there. So yeah, this is probably like a high D, where... It's a card you're sad to have to main deck, but happy to have in the sideboard if you're playing sideboarded games. Then we've got Iron Verdict, 2 and a white for an instant at common, where it deals 5 damage to target a tapped creature, and has Fortel for just a single white mana. So the fact that this card has Fortel makes it way better than if it didn't, because the problem with cards like Iron Verdict, if you're a control deck, is you pass with 3 mana up, the opponent manages to figure it out that you have Iron Verdict in hand and just doesn't attack, just adds more creatures to the board, passes, and now you've wasted three mana. But instead now with Fortel, we can just pay two mana up front, exile it, and then we just need to keep up a single white mana to have Iron Verdict available, which is way easier. And then if the opponent doesn't play into it, you've only wasted one mana instead of three. So this card is not a card you want in very aggressive decks, because it only works on tapped creatures, so if you're the aggressor and the opponent stays back, you're not going to be able to use this. But in any defensive deck, especially control decks, that want to play a long game and just care about surviving until they can leverage their powerful bombs, Iron Verdict is going to be excellent. So I think I'm willing to start out on a C plus for Iron Verdict. Then we've got Kaya's Onslaught, 2 and a white for an instant add uncommon, saying target creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains double strike until end of turn, and also has Fortel for a single white mana. So 2 and a white for this effect is a little bit on the pricey side. Typically don't want to spend this much mana on a combo trick, but of course this has Fortel, meaning we can get rid of it early and then later in the game for just a single white mana, this is an incredibly powerful effect. Plus one plus one double strike means your creature should win the fight without trading more often than not. And this has the potential upside of combining it with author pump spells. 
in green we'll see a pump spell that gives plus four plus four that we can also cast for single mana so just imagine being able to cast both Kaya's Onslaught and a plus four pump spell for two mana total that's uh, a lot of damage out of nowhere so if you just have any unblocked creature you can Kaya's Onslaught your way to victory so that's why Kaya's Onslaught goes up in value plus being a one mana instant means it potentially sets up casting two spells in the same turn, which white cares about. So I think Kai's Onslaught's quite good. Probably doesn't quite go to the B range, but easily a C plus. Then we have Master's Called for an white for a 4-4 Dwarf Warrior. When it enters a battlefield, you can exile a creature card from your graveyard, and if you do, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. So 5 mana for a 4-4 four four is a bit on the expensive side. Not every deck is going to have a ton of artifacts or enchantments to get back, and needing to exile a creature, you know, is usually not too difficult, but it is an extra hoop you need to jump through. So the, the main synergy with Master Skull is with Sagas, where they naturally will end up in the graveyard, and then getting back a powerful Saga could be quite nice. I'm still not very high on the master here, so probably giving this a D, but I could see some decks, especially decks with a lot of sagas, where master skull goes up in value and you'll be happy to have one or two in the main deck. Rally the ranks, two mana enchantment, add rare, saying as rally the ranks enters a battlefield, choose a creature type, and creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one plus one. Now white isn't really the color that has access to a ton of changelings, that's more blue-green's wheelhouse. So not the most synergy there. Uh, we do have a lot of dwarves and warriors in white, but building around Rally the Ranks and Limited is still pretty challenging in white, I feel, so I don't think this card is going to be necessarily worth it very often. It is only two mana, which is cheap, potentially plays well with tokens in kind of a go-white deck, but having those corresponding creature types is what I'm most worried about. So I don't necessarily recommend taking this early and then limiting your picks to only a certain number of creature types. That doesn't seem like a great recipe for success. But I could see every now and then this making the final cut. But yeah, I'm not very high on this. Probably give this a D. But uh, I'll be happy to play this in some sp specific decks where the stars align. Next up we have Raidan, God of the Worthy, 2 and a white for a 2-3 legendary creature god with flying and vigilance saying snow lands your opponent's control enter battlefield tapped and non-creature spells your opponent's cast with converted mana cost 4 or greater cost 2 generic mana more to cast. So yeah, pretty solid card here, 2-3 flyer with a ton of extra abilities. And the fun thing is that we even get the flexibility of the back half which is Valkmira, Protector's Shield, 3 and a white for a legendary artifact, saying if a source an opponent controls would deal damage to you or a permanent you control, prevent one of that damage. So this makes it pretty difficult for the opponent to get any good attacks uh, on the ground, makes it more difficult for them to block profitably, and if you're up against an aggressive deck with a lot of small creatures, most of the damage is mitigated. So... Yeah, I mean, the flexibility of playing this as Protector's Shield makes this card way better. And there's even more here. Whenever you or another permanent you control becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless its controller pays one. So an additional tax to make things even more annoying for the opponents. So, yeah, the combined package of Valkmira and Raidan seems pretty strong, so happy giving this an A. The flexibility makes this even better. Next up we have Resplendent Marshall, one and double white for a 3-3 Mythic Rare Angel Warrior with flying. If we just pause there, three mana, three, three flyer. It's already pretty good, probably like a C plus, B minus. And then when Resplendent Marshall enters a battlefield or dies, we may exile another creature card from our graveyard and when we do 
put a plus one plus one counter on each creature we control other than Resplendent Marshal that shares a creature type with the Exiled card. Once again we've got a similar issue to Rally the ranks where, you know, it's going to be somewhat tricky to have all the correct creature types uh, lining up. But if we just look at this as mostly a 3-3 three, three flyer for 3 with upside, I think I'm still pretty happy with this. I don't know if this quite gets to the A range, this feels more like a, a high B, but uh, yeah, definitely a good card, you'll take it early. Don't know if we'll take this over like the, the best removal spells at Uncommon, maybe not quite, double whites also a little bit more difficult to cast than you might think on turn 3, so I think I'm giving this a B, but uh, definitely has a lot of upside if you can get the uh, ability to trigger. Next up we have Revitalize, another reprint, one and a white for an instant, gains 3 and draws a card. So there's not a lot of life gain synergy in this set, um, and the problem is this is also set with Fortel, so a lot of turn 2 is going to be spent exiling cards instead of revitalizing. So if you're not playing a 2-drop creature or foretelling, it feels like revitalize doesn't really have a home in the set, uh, where you maybe would be happy with revitalize in other sets if you don't have anything going on on turn 2. Just feels like your turn 2 has to be better than gain 3 live draw card. So yeah, don't think revitalize is very good. Of course if your deck doesn't have any 2-drops, feel free to include this, it still draws a card. So it replaces itself, but hopefully you've got something better going on on turn 2, so I think this is a D. Next up we have a Righteous Valkyrie, 2 and a white, for a 2-4 Angel Cleric at rare. It flies, and whenever another Angel or Cleric enters a battlefield under your control, you gain life equal to that creature's toughness. And as long as you have at least 7 life more than your starting life total, meaning 27 or more, Creatures you control get plus 2 plus 2, which is an incredible upside here. So 2 for flyer for 3, already quite good. And then it has a lot of other upside. If you go through the set, there's a decent number of clerics and angels in the set. Um, especially black White has a lot of angels. So that's where this is going to be at its best. If you've got Valkyrie in the deck, th that's an example of a deck where maybe playing Revitalize becomes worth it. But uh, yeah, overall Valkyrie seems great, 2-4, that's difficult to race if you manage to gain a bit of life, and if you ever get to live the dream of 27 or more life, it's gonna end the game very quickly, so I think this is an A. Rune of Sustenance is our first example of an Aura Rune, so this is the Rune subtype, which is important for the equipment we've seen, the Runed Crown, which can search up any rune from our library. So Rune of Sustenance is a 2 mana enchantment that can enchant a permanent, and the reason why it can enchant a permanent is because when Rune of Sustenance enters the battlefield you get to draw a card, so it replaces itself, which is great for any aura, because the major drawback of auras is getting 2 for 1 by a removal spell. And then as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it has lifelink. And as long as the enchanted permanent is an equipment, it gives that equipment the ability to give the equipped creature lifelink. So that's why it can enchant both creatures and equipment alike. And of course has great synergy with the helm that we've seen earlier. So yeah, if you get the, the white rare that can search up a rune or the helm, the runes go up in value. But even by itself, I would pretty much play Rune of Sustenance in any white deck. And uh, yeah, has quite a bit of potential upside. If you put this on a flying creature, flying a lifelink is incredibly hard to race. And uh, it replaces itself, so the floor is not too low. So I think this might even go into the B range, C plus, B minus, somewhere along those lines. And there it is, Runeforge Champion, the card I was just talking about. Two and a white for a 2-3 Dwarf Warrior. And when a Runeforge champion enters the battlefield, you can search your library and or graveyard for a rune card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle it, and then you can pay one rather than pay the mana cost of rune spells you cast. So yeah, 2-3 three, for 3, if you can search up a rune, 
it essentially drew your card which seems great if you have multiple runes you even get a bit of selection over which rune to get so would i first pick rune forge champion and then try and take every rune yeah i wouldn't be opposed to that especially early on in the format to see if it's a worthwhile strategy um, but of course if you get a, a champion you gotta prioritize those runes pretty highly and hopefully end up with at least two or more so a champion probably falls somewhere in the B range. You're not going to play it if you don't have any runes, obviously, but it's definitely worth speculating on the potential synergy here. Next up we have Search for Glory, two and a white for a snow sorcery at rare, letting you search your library for a snow permanent card, a legendary card, or a saga card. Reveal it, put it into your hand, and you can gain one life for each snow mana spent to cast a spell. So white isn't really the snow color, although you might have some incidental snow lands in your mana base. So we're not going to be gaining a ton of life off of this. And typically speaking, the search effects in limited are not very good because you just don't have that many silver bullets to search up for different situations. So the only scenario where I can imagine playing search for glory if, is if you have some unbeatable bomb that happens to be a legendary saga or snow card in which case this might be worth it but on average i don't think search for glory is going to make your deck very often so this is probably a d next up we have shepherd of the cosmos six mana for an uncommon angel warrior that's a three three flyer and when Shepard enters a battlefield to return target permanent card with converted mana cost 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. And it also has Fortel for 3 and a white. So we can pay 2 mana up front and then 4 mana afterwards instead of the full 6 mana. Making this way more flexible than it would be otherwise. And yeah, it shouldn't be too difficult to get a bit of value and return a permanent to the battlefield. So the card seems quite good. Easy 2 for 1 and a 3-3 three, three flyer can end the game pretty quickly too, so happy giving this a B. Next up we have Sigrid, God favored 1 and double white for a legendary human warrior. It's a 2-2 two, two with flash, first strike and protection from god creatures. And once again, as a reminder, changelings are also gods. So this has protection from changelings, so protection entails it cannot be damaged, enchanted, which I guess is not super relevant for gods, blocked or targeted by sources, in this case gods. Um, so I'm guessing the not be able to be blocked or damaged by god creatures is going to be the most relevant. And then when Sigrid enters the battlefield, exile up to one target attacking or blocking creature until Sigrid leaves the battlefield. So can keep up three mana, potent attacks, and we can potentially exile their best creature and hopefully Sigrid can stick around and a 2-2 first strike can also potentially set up a nice ambush. So I guess the best case scenario, you both exile the opponent's largest creature and get to ambush a two toughness creature. So the upside is potentially quite high. Yeah, I think Sigrid might get an A as well here. Yeah, even if you eventually give the opponent's creature back, you maybe prevented a lot of damage in the meantime and maybe got to ambush a second creature as well. Next up we have Spectral Steel, one on a white for an enchantment aura at uncommon, enchants a creature, giving it plus two plus two. Typically these enchantment auras aren't very good, Again, because of the potential downside of getting two for one. But in this case, we get an extra line of text. For one and a white, we can exile Spectral Steel from our graveyard to return another target aura or equipment card from our graveyard to our hand. So Spectral Steel plays quite nicely in multiples. Because if one of them ends up in the graveyard, we can get it back with the second one. Of course, it does get exiled, so you don't get to loop them infinitely plays well with other cheap auras. So this is a type of card that could potentially combine nicely with the one mana Battlefield Raptor, the flyer, as you can suit it up and then potentially put all your eggs into one basket. And even if the opponent has removal, 
you can maybe still get some enchantments back. So I think that does make Spectral Steel playable. Whereas if it didn't have that second line of text, they would just give it a D. But overall, not the easiest card to evaluate, but assuming you've got a deck with a lot of cheap creatures, enchantments, and equipment, this should be a pretty nice inclusion. So I think a C is probably where I'll end up on Spectral Steel. Next up we have Stalwart Valkyrie, 3 and a white for a 3-2 Angel Warrior. And we can pay 1 and a white and exile a creature card from our graveyard rather than pay the spell's mana cost. And it's a 3-2 Flyer. It's also an Angel and a Warrior. Angel does have a few synergies in the set, although they're not super relevant. So a 3-2 Flyer for 4 mana is a little bit below the curve in Limited these days, but it's still definitely playable. And the fact that we can often play it for just 2 mana, and it can potentially enable those double spell synergies, makes this card quite valuable. Now we're not often going to be able to play this on turn 3 or even turn 4, since creatures might not have traded yet. But it is a card you can easily double spell with, like let's say turn 5 or turn 6, and uh, essentially play a 2 mana 3-2 flyer, and maybe something else in the same turn. So Valkyrie seems great, uh, easily a C+. Next up we have Starnheim Corsair 2 and a white for a Pegasus. It's a 2-2 flyer, saying artifacts and enchantment spells you cast cost 1 generic mana less to cast. So yeah, a 3 mana 2-2 flyer. It's not as exciting as it used to be probably would be a C, C- minus under most circumstances, and this has a nice bonus of making some artifacts and enchantments cheaper. It's still not a card I'm super thrilled about, but it's at, at the very least a playable C, and even without a ton of artifacts and enchantments, could make the cut in some of your white limited decks. And then we get to Starnheim Unleashed. And they definitely unleashed it with this one. 4 mana for a mythic rare sorcery, saying create a 4-4 white angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance. And if the spell was foretold, create X of those tokens instead. So for a second, let's just evaluate 4 mana to make a 4-4 token with flying and vigilance. That's already great. Potentially has downsides against bound spells, but there's not that many in the set to begin with. But then if we take a look at Fortel, so first we need to pay 2 mana, exile it, and then afterwards cast this for Fortel, and if we Fortel this for x equals 1, meaning 2 mana up front and then 3 mana potentially on turn 3, we can already make 1 for 4 Angel, but it only costs us 5 mana, so x equals 2, to make 2 of those Angel tokens on turn 5, which should be probably the typical use case for this, unless we just desperately want to make a 4-4 Angel on turn 3. So I expect this to be cast for x equals 2 most of the time, making 2 Angel tokens, which is going to be very hard to beat. And then if we ever get to the late game, where we can cast this for x equals 3, it should just completely take over the game. But yeah, Starnheim Unleashed seems pretty ridiculous and very difficult to beat, especially if you can make at least 2 Angel tokens. So I think this is an easy S. Next up we have Story Seeker, 2 mana for a 2-2 Dwarf Cleric with lifelink. Relevant creature types, 2-2 lifelink. Quite good in white, especially where you've got cards that can enhance it, whether it's equipment or enchantment auras. So this is the, the card that will typically overperform. It might look unassuming, but it's very difficult to race, give it flying, give it any relevant equipment, and it gets even better. So I think Story Seeker gets a C+. Going back to Dominaria, Mesa Unicorn, also definitely an overperformer. And in a set where people will be foretelling cards on turn 2, getting a 2-drop creature in play can be great for any aggressive strategies. Next up we have Usher of the Fallen, 1 mana for a 2-1 Spirit Warrior at Uncommon. And it has a Boast for 1 and a White, making another 1-1 a White Human Warrior Creature token. So, 
play this on turn one if you don't have anything going on turn two can often boast to make another token so great for the go white creature decks and uh yeah the fail case of a one mana two one still not too bad so i think usher of the fallen gets a c plus from me then valkyrie sword this is part of a cycle of equipment that you can pay an extra cost when the equipment enters a battlefield and then attach it to a creature token and the equipment are all slightly different and the creature tokens are different so in this case a valkyrie sword one and a white for an artifact equipment equipped creature gets plus two plus one equip cost is three if we were just evaluating that part the equip cost is a little bit prohibitive at three better even though plus two plus one is a relevant stat but the exciting part here is if we can pay the four and a white additional mana when sword enters a battlefield in which case we get to make a 4-4 white angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance and attach a valkyrie sword to it so for seven mana total we get to make a 6-5 flying vigilance angel and if they deal with it we still have an equipment afterwards that we can move around now seven mana is expensive so it's not a trivial cost but upside's definitely there if you're playing an aggressive deck you flood out a bit drawing this in the late game is going to be great and uh, even if they deal with angel you still have an equipment so the cost is expensive i'm not super high on valkyrie sword some of these other equipments are a little bit more uh manageable but i think this is still playable and you're probably going to play this more often than not in your white decks is my guess so i'll give this a c next up we have valor of the worthy one mana for an enchantment aura enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and when the enchanted creature leaves the battlefield create a one one white spirit creature token with flying not a very high upside here giving plus one plus one is not very relevant but it is a cheap spell so in the aggressive low curve white deck that wants to be double spelling and that wants to play a card like battlefield raptor i could see including this and then leaving behind a 1-1 spirit token is definitely relevant so keeps you on the board even if they answer your creature just not the most impactful card so probably don't want this outside of those hyper aggressive low curve double spell decks so i think this is still a d warhorn blast is our inspired charge of the set five mana for an instant giving our creatures plus two plus one but it also has foretell for two and a white so it makes it easier to play it for cheap later in the game maybe combine it with other pump spells or cast two spells in the same turn so in the go white deck whether it's red white or green white this could be a nice finisher but it's not going to be a card in very high demand is my guess so this is a playable card but not every deck's going to want it and your deck needs to be going wide to take full advantage of this so this is probably like a c c minus a low c then we have wings of the cosmos one white mana for an instant giving target creature plus one plus three and flying until end of turn and we get to untap it so that's a lot of text but everything combined is still not that impactful it is a one mana spell so nice for double spelling purposes but generally speaking these types of combo tricks aren't all that impressive so i'm still leaning d for wings of the cosmos but yeah some of the hyper aggressive decks might be interested in this just to have another cheap spell and those are probably decks playing a low land count so they will draw more spells on average which can sort of make up for it even if a spell isn't necessarily worth an entire card first blue card is probably the best blue card in the set elrond a god of the cosmos five mana for a 1-1 legendary creature god this is one of those dual faced cards elrond gets plus one plus one for each card in our hand and each foretold card we own in exile and at the beginning of our end step choose a card type and then reveal the top two cards of your library put all cards of the chosen type into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order 
So your average limited deck might have 17 lands. So if you need more lands, get a pretty good chance of hitting one. And otherwise, if you just need action, just name creature or maybe your deck has a lot of instants and sorceries, can name those instead. But on average, we can expect Alrund to draw us a card each turn, basically, which is quite nice. And of course, the more cards we draw, the bigger Alrund gets. But that's not everything. We also have the option of playing Haka Whispering Raven, which is a 2-mana two 2-3 two, flyer. And whenever Haka deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hand and then scry 2. So Haka is a nice creature we can run out early. And it can also just kind of play defense. If the opponent has some 2-mana two 2-2s, two we can just hold them off with Haka. And at some point, if we're ready, we can attack with Haka, hit the opponent, scry 2, and then we'll know what's on top of our deck, so we know what to name with Alrund to draw additional cards. And since this happens at the beginning of our end step, we can get value right away, so even if the opponent has removal for Alrund, then uh, it's going to be too late and we'll already have drawn at least one extra card, assuming we keep something on top. So being able to play Haka early, even if we're up against an aggressive deck, and having the flexibility of this very powerful late game card draw engine, I think makes Alrund worthy of an S, just because of the flexibility. If we only had Alrund and not access to the two mana side, I would probably be more hesitant to give us such high of a rating. But the fact that it happens at the beginning of your end step, and you get to potentially recoup an entire card right away, makes this a lot more powerful than if it's triggered on your upkeep, for instance. Next up we have Elrun's Epiphany, 7 mana for a mythic rare sorcery. Creates two 1-1 one, one blue bird creature tokens with flying. Can take an extra turn after this one, and then you have to exile Epiphany, and also has foretell for 4 and double blue. So Epiphany kind of solves one of the issues that some time walk effects have in Limited, and we've seen a lot of them in the past. Sometimes you cast your time warp, you get to take an extra turn. Maybe if you're ahead on board, you get an extra attack step in that you otherwise wouldn't. And maybe you get to activate an ability, although it's not like you've got a ton of planeswalkers in Limited. So at the end of the day, you're just spending most of your turn to get an extra draw step and maybe get an extra attack step in but that's not even a guarantee. Now with Epiphany, we're making two bird tokens, so we're guaranteed to add something to the board, and those to two tokens can attack during the extra turn. So that makes Epiphany a lot better than your typical time walk effect, and with Fortel, it's not too expensive to play. If we just have six lands, we can still cast it. So I think Epiphany probably gets an A. Two bird tokens might seem unassuming, but if the opponent doesn't have any flyers, they can end the game pretty quickly, and even if they have removal, you're still going to be left with one token afterwards. So I like Epiphany a lot, and happy giving it an A. Next up is a Null. One mana for an instant at common counters an artifact or enchantment spell. Yeah, this is pretty bad. Even as a sideboard card, it's very conditional. If you don't draw this before the opponent plays their artifact or enchantment, if you don't draw this before the opponent draws their artifact or enchantment, it doesn't even do anything, um, so the stars need to align. And I can't imagine sideboarding this in very often. So, do we give this a D or an F is the question here, but I don't think it matters too much. Just don't recommend playing this. Next up is a very interesting card to evaluate. Ascendant Spirit, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one, Snow Creature Spirit at rare. And it only has abilities we can activate using Snow Mana. So if we don't build our deck during the drafting portion to, ha to include enough Snow Basics and other Snow Sources, Ascendant Spirit just doesn't have any additional text and it's just a 1 mana 1-1. One, one. But assuming we have a lot of Snow Lands, so let's say you're very dedicated for the Snow deck, and your deck ends up with like 9 or 10 snow sources that can make snow mana, then a card like Ascendant Spirit becomes a lot more appealing. So in this case, for 2 snow mana, Ascendant Spirit becomes a spirit warrior with base power and toughness 2-3. 
So that's step one. Step two, for three snow mana, if Ascendant Spirit is a warrior, so needs to have gone through the first phase, then we can put a flying counter on it and it becomes a spirit warrior angel with base power and toughness 4-4. Four, four. And then once we make it an angel for 4 snow mana, we can put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it and it gives the ability whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So how happy are we if Ascendant Spirit can only turn into a 4-4 and doesn't get to the 4 snow mana? It's still pretty good. But again, getting to triple snow is not trivial. If you don't prioritize snow lands during the draft, you're just not going to get to it. But in a very de dedicated snow deck, where you can reliably get up to the 3 snow, Ascendant Spirit's pretty good. And potentially an incentive to take snow lands highly and the cool thing about the four snow ability is that you can keep activating it over and over so first you've got a four four flyer put two counters on it make a six six that draws a card turn after you can just keep activating this and then put two more counters on it so you can keep making it bigger and bigger if the game isn't over somehow now you do have to spend a lot of mana, especially a lot of snow mana, which means you probably won't be able to use any other snow abilities at the same time. So Ascendant Spirit requires you to really dedicate a lot of picks to snow lands, and other people might be doing the same. So if you don't take them highly, you might not get any snow lands at all. If your deck only has five or six snow lands, then you're by no means guaranteed to be able to activate spirits. So that's kind of the major issue with Ascendant Spirit, but the payoff is potentially there. So I'm hesitant to give this too high of a grade just because it requires so many picks to be dedicated to Snowlands. And uh, yeah, if you don't get there and only end up with a handful of Snowlands, this just doesn't do anything. So I'm going to start with a conservative C plus for Ascendant Spirit. And this is definitely one of those cards I'll have to play with a few times to get a better feel for it and uh, to get a sense of how many snow lands you can consistently end up with. Next up we have Augury Raven. 4 mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer and foretells for 1 and a blue. So can spend turn 2 exiling this and on turn 3 we can potentially play a 2 mana 3-3 three, three flyer, which is pretty good. So Augury Raven definitely looks like one of the better blue commons in the set. Could maybe go up to a B, but it would be a pretty low B, like a B minus. So I'm going to start out with a more conservative C plus for Augury Raven. I think this is in contention for the best blue common, but might not be on the same level as some of the premium removal spells that we see in other colors. Next up we have Avalanche Collar, one and a blue for an uncommon human wizard that's also a snow creature, so it counts as a snow permanence, which is relevant for some synergies in the set. It's a 1-3, and for two generic mana, target snow land we control becomes a 4-4 elemental with hexproof and haste, and it's still a land. So Avalanche Collar, unlike the Ascendant Spirit, doesn't require a ton of snow lands to work. If our deck has, let's say, four snow lands, we're pretty likely to have one in play by the time we play our Avalanche Caller, or, or at least by the time we want to activate it. So that's kind of the number of snow lands I would aim for with Avalanche Caller. With four or more snow lands, I'm pretty happy with it. If I don't get there on the snow lands, then I probably don't play Avalanche Caller. But, uh, yeah, turning lands into 4-4s four with Hexproof that can be messed with easily is a pretty big deal. And if we have multiple snow lands and a lot of mana, can potentially turn multiple creatures into 4-4s, four uh, which seems quite strong. So I think this is probably like a B. Uh, requires a little bit of work, but not as much as the Ascendant Spirit we've just seen. Then we have Behold, the Multiverse. 3 and a blue for an instant, that lets us cry 2 and then draw 2, and can also be foretold for 1 and a blue. So already by itself a 4 mana instant cry to draw 2 
is a very playable limited card, gives us a lot of card selection and a bit of card draw. And then the Fortal just makes it more flexible. Now, you can't spend too much time just dirtling, drawing cards on limited. Uh, creatures have gotten a lot better over the years, so where this used to be one of the better cards in the set, uh, especially at common nowadays, it's definitely a good card, but I wouldn't necessarily overrate it. You can't play a deck with uh, only card draw spells and hope to survive long enough to cast them. But I'm still easily giving this a C+. Seems like a card you're going to play in pretty much any blue deck if you can get it. And uh, if you've got some other instance, then Behold the Multiverse gets even better, because then you've got the flexibility of keeping up your mana for Behold the Multiverse. Maybe you're like a blue-white control deck, you've got the Iron Verdict removal spell, for instance, and then you can kind of choose which of those instances you want to play. Although it is true that Fortel kind of mitigates the drawback of needing to keep up mana for instance. Then we have a Berg Strider, four in a blue for a four force no creature giant wizard. And when Strider enters the battlefield, tap target artifact or creature an opponent controls. And if snow mana was spent to cast it, that permanent doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So without snow mana, Strider is still potentially playable. It also has the giant and the wizard creature types, which can be relevant in your blue-red giant deck, for example. And if you're very aggressive, getting rid of a blocker for a turn could be nice. But it's definitely not exciting without snow mana. So it's probably like uh, a low C, maybe a high D without snow mana. With snow mana, this becomes a much more interesting card. And uh, at the very least, worthy of a full C rating. And might go even higher in a deck that's both interested in the giant creature type as well as having access to a bit of snow mana. Then we've got Bind as a monster, single blue for an enchantment aura, enchants a creature, and when it enters the battlefield we can tap the enchanted creature, but it also deals damage equal to its power, and then the enchanted creature doesn't untap during its untap step. So one mana blue removal spell, essentially a vendetta, which is typically a black effect. So a bit unusual to see this in blue, but it is a nice removal spell. It's not very good in multiples, since there's only so much life you can pay before you run out. But typically speaking, the first copy of Bind the Monster is going to be a very nice inclusion in most decks. Even if you take a bit of damage, it is a very efficient removal spell, makes it easy to double spell, so that can be relevant for a few synergies in the set. So... The first copy of Bind the Monster, I think, is at the very least a C+. But the second copy falls off quite a lot, I would say. So I think overall C+, for Bind the Monster, is probably accurate. The, the problem is just, if you're in a late game scenario, and you're already pretty low in life, it could be totally within... Uh, the realm of possibility that you can't even cast Bind the Monster, because you would just die which is pretty bad for a removal spell. So there's definitely a lot of drawback with buying a monster, but the efficiency probably makes up for it a little bit. So yeah, C+, probably for buying a monster. Great removal spell, but I'm hesitant to give it a B. Next up we have a Brine Barrow Intruder, a 1-mana one 1-2 one human rogue with flash. When it enters the battlefield, target creature an opponent controls gets minus 2, minus 0 until end of turn. Now, we're just coming from Zendikar, which had a very similar one-mana rogue. Now, there's not a ton of synergy in the set for Intruder. Uh, there's no real cards that care about humans or rogues. And it doesn't even mill the opponent, so there's no mill synergy here. So I'm not that interested in Brian Barrow Intruder. Can be nice for a deck trying to cast multiple spells in the same turn, because it's a one-drop. But it's just not super impactful and doesn't have a ton of synergy, so I think D for Intruder here. Next up we have Kusima, God of the Voyage. Now, this is essentially a reading comprehension test, so hopefully I'll pass here. This is a legendary creature god at rare. It's a dual-faced card, so also as a backside here. It's a 2-4 saying, 
at the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile Cosima. So we play Cosima for three mana, wait a turn, it's our next upkeep, we can exile Cosima. Great. If we do, it gains the ability whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control. If Cosima is exiled, you may put a Voyage counter on it. So we exile Cosima, we play lands, we have the option of putting Voyage counters on Cosima. Great. What if we don't put a Voyage counter on Cosima? Then we return Cosima to the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, and we get to draw X cards where X is the number of Voyage counters on it. So we play Cosima. We decide to flip Cosima into exile. We play land. Now, the first land we play doesn't actually do all that much. It just gives us the option of returning Cosima from exile, or we can put a voyage counter on it. But we still need to play an additional land to bring Cosima back from exile to the battlefield. So we essentially need to make sure we still have lands to play if we want to bring Cosima back. But assuming we have a lot of lands, we can just keep putting Voyage Counters on Cosima, and then with our last land, we play it. Instead of putting a Voyage Counter on it, we decline, and we bring Cosima back with X plus one plus one counters on it, and we get to draw X cards. So we'll draw a bunch of cards all at once, and be a very large creature at the same time. So Cosima is a very interesting card, and yeah, if the game stalls out, this can easily take over the late game for us by drawing a lot of extra cards. A 2-4 can block reasonably well for a turn before we exile it. So this is definitely a card you want to be able to play early, ideally if you have a couple extra lands in hand, but there's the flexibility of potentially playing it as the Omen Keel, which is a 2-mana legendary artifact vehicle. It's a 3-3 with crew 1, so very cheap to crew. And whenever a vehicle you control deals combat damage to a player, so it can be any vehicle outside the Omen Keel as well, that player exiles that many cards from the top of their library, and you may play lands from among those cards for as long as they remain exiled. Basically, if your opening hand has some cheap creatures and not a lot of lands, you have the option of playing the Omen Keel, which can help you find more lands. And instead, if you have a lot of lands, I think the Typical scenario is that you're going to play Cosima and hopefully leverage the extra cards while Cosima's on our voyage. So, very interesting card. Takes a second and a few times reading it to fully wrap your head around it. But I think the end result is a pretty powerful package that you're happy to play. The flexibility in Constructed, especially if you draw multiples, is quite nice since Omen Keel finds the lands to then enable your voyage. In Limited, I'm expecting to play Cosima as a creature more often than not, but every now and then you might want a vehicle just as an early blocker or to find more lands. Overall, what do I rate Cosima? Probably gets an A, but it's also a card I'll have to play with a few times to get a better feel for it. Next up we have Cosmos Charger, which is one of the payoff cards for the Fortal deck. It's a 4 mana 3 3 horse spirit with flash and flying. Already, 4 mana 3-3 three, three Flash Flyer is one cheaper than what we uh, had to pay for this in Zendikar. But it also has a flexibility of Fortel, so we can exile it on turn 2 and on turn 3 potentially already play it for 3 mana. So can get this out very quickly. And then foretelling cards from your hand costs 1 generic mana less and can be done on any player's turn. So this is great for the Fortel deck since you get to shave off 1 mana of exiling any of your cards, and you also have the flexibility of just keeping up all your mana and doing it in the opponent's turn. So Cosmos Charger seems great, can potentially even ambush a small creature from the opponent first, and then it's both a win condition and an enabler for your other cards. So I think I'm willing to give Cosmos Charger an A, assuming you've got some other Fortel cards to synergize with it. Next up is Cyclone Summoner, 7 mana for a 7-7 seven, seven Giant Wizard at rare, and when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, return all permanents to their owner's hands, except for giants, wizards, and lands. So keep in mind, again, changelings will also count as giants or wizards, so those don't get bounced. 
So a summoner is going to be at its best in kind of the giant changeling tribal deck, where you don't end up bouncing uh, most of your creatures, but can potentially be a one-sided bounce effect for the opponent's board, and that's going to be the best case scenario. But even a scenario where summoner ends up bouncing most of the creatures in play, including your own, it still kind of resets the board, makes the opponent have to redeploy everything, gets rid of any tokens potentially, and adds a 7-7 to the board. So that scenario is still pretty good. And uh, yeah, the best case scenario where it's a one-sided bounce effect and lets you set up a great attack, of course, is going to be great. So it is still a 7 mana card. Getting to 7 mana is not trivial in limited since games tend to be over pretty quickly nowadays. But it's still a, a powerful card, and I think I'm still willing to give this at the very least a B, but I could see this overperforming and ending up in the A category. Next up we have Depart, the Realm, one on a blue for an instant, at common that returns target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, and also has Foretell for just a single blue mana. So if we Foretell this, we will end up paying one extra mana total, but the flexibility of potentially having it for one mana could be worth it. So just your common bounce effects um, in blue. We've seen a few angel tokens floating around in white, which can potentially be punished by the part of realm. It's always nice to have a flexible bounce spell like this. Question here is whether this ends up being closer to a C plus or a C. I think you're, you're going to be pretty happy with at least the first copy of the part of realm in most blue decks. I'm not sure if you're going to be happy having the second copy. So I'm going to start out with a C for the part of realm, but this could easily end up closer to a C plus if the format ends up being very aggressive and needing to have cheap answers. But uh, yeah, always a nice card to have access to. Next up is Disdainful Stroke. One on a blue for an instant that counters target spell with converted mana cost four or greater. So another reprint, and yeah, this is always a very powerful sideboard card at the very least if the opponent has a lot of expensive cards. Don't be afraid to sideboard this in. It's also a set with Fortel, so people are paying mana to potentially get access to more expensive cards that they otherwise wouldn't be able to cast, which makes this Stainful Stroke a little bit better. Uh, question is, how often are you going to be able to keep up mana? How many other instants do you have? So you don't waste the mana that you're keeping up for Disdainful Stroke. So of course, the more instant speed cards in the deck, the better Disdainful Stroke gets. Seems like a great combo with Behold the Multiverse. So once again, the question here is, do we land closer to a C plus or more to a C? Probably start out with a C for Disdainful Stroke. It's going to be a great sideboard card, um, but I think I'm probably going to be main decking at least one copy in most blue decks. Next up is Draugr, Thought Thief, 2 and a blue for a 3-2 Zombie Rogue. And when Thought Thief enters the battlefield, look at the top card of any player's library, and you may put that card into their graveyard. So we can target ourselves early on to potentially sculpt our draws. If we need an extra land, we can potentially keep it on top. If not, put it in the graveyard. Self-milling has a bit of a sub-theme in the set as well. You want to be putting creatures in your graveyard to potentially fuel some synergies. And you can also target the opponents, although I don't recommend doing that in the early game since you don't know whether or not the opponent needs to keep lands on top or not since you don't get to see their hand. But in the late game, you can easily keep lands on top and put important spells in the graveyard. So 3 mana, 3-2 three, with a little bit of upside, but it's not a ton of upside, so probably falls in the C category. Zombie has a little bit of synergy in the set, but not too much. And I guess Wizard does as well. Next up is Frost Augur, 1 mana for a 1-2 snow creature, human wizard at uncommon. And for a snow mana we can tap it and look at the top card of our library. If it's a snow card we can reveal it and put it into our hand. So snow cards include snow lands as well as snow permanents like creatures, Frost Augur being an example. So in a very dedicated snow deck, let's say we end up with 9 or 10 snow lands and a bunch more snow permanents. Hopefully about half of our deck is snow permanents uh, between lands and other non-land cards. So assuming we've got a dedicated snow deck where about half of our deck is snow, 
Frost Augur will draw essentially a card about half the time we activate it, which isn't a bad deal. We're having to spend a bit of snow mana doing it, which we might need for other cards, but assuming we've got a dedicated snow deck, we should have more than one snow land in play. So it's a bit of a slow one, and I would only play this in the most dedicated snow decks. If your deck only has, let's say, between 5 or 10 snow permanents, it drops off in value dramatically. But assuming at least half of your deck is snow, uh, Frost Augur seems quite good. So I'm hesitant to give it a B, just because it requires quite a bit of work before it becomes a worthwhile inclusion, unlike some of the other snow payoffs we've seen, like the uh, two mana Avalanche Caller we've seen earlier. So I'm probably leaning C plus for Frost Augur. I'm hopeful that this will be a nice card draw engine, but uh, I'm still somewhat skeptical here. Next up is Frost Peak, a Yeti. Three and a blue for a 3-3 snow creature Yeti. And for one and a snow, the Yeti cannot be blocked this turn. So if you don't have any snow mana in your deck, Yeti is pretty bad for mana 3-3. If you have, let's say, at least four snow lands and can somewhat reliably activate this to make it unblockable, it becomes a reasonable finisher on the stalled board. Although in these days, it's not like stalled boards ha are happening all that often. It's usually one player that's kind of snowballing an advantage and kind of overrunning the other player, but we'll see. Maybe Kaldheim ends up being a bit more grindy. Uh, in a very dedicated snow deck where you just want to have as many snow creatures and permanents as possible, of course you're going to be pretty happy with the Frost Peak Yeti. So overall probably gets a C, but if you're not interested in snow, then uh, it's definitely not a card you want. Next up is Frostpire Arcanist, 4 and a blue for a 2-5 Giant Wizard at Uncommon. Costs 1 less to cast if you control a Giant or Wizard. So Changelings of course count as well. In which case we're just paying 4 mana for Arcanist. And when it enters the battlefield, search your library for an instant or sorcery card with the same name as a card in your graveyard, reveal it, put it into your hand and shuffle. Let's say we don't have a Giant or Wizard and are paying 5 mana for this, we get a 2-5. We still need to have 2 instants and sorceries in our deck with the same name, and we also need to have a drawn one, which is in our graveyard. So that's a few hoops we need to jump through. The Arcanist is probably going to be at its best if we have multiple card draw spells with the same name, because the card draw spells are more likely to find us Arcanists to kind of set it up. Um, so this seems potentially quite good if we have two or three copies of Behold the, the Multiverse, for instance. Of course, if you get lucky enough to get multiple removal spells with the same name, this goes up in value. So this is definitely the type of card that will fluctuate in how good it is based on how the draft went and how many duplicates you end up with. If you end up with, let's say, two or three uh, pairs of instants and sorceries, this is going to be great and probably gets to the B range. So on average, I'll be a bit more skeptical here and just give it a C plus, but it definitely seems like a pretty sweet card and I'm hoping that we can uh, draft a lot of cool decks with plenty of instants and sorceries and hopefully some giants to make it cheaper. Next up is a Giant's Amulet. This is part of the equipment cycle. We've seen the white one, the Valkyrie Sword. Now we've got Giant's Amulet, one mana for an uncommon equipment. And when it enters the battlefield, we can pay three and a blue. And if we do, we can create a 4-4 blue Giant Wizard creature token and attach the amulet to it. And then the equipped creature gets plus one plus zero oh and has the ability of Hexproof as long as it's untapped and equips for two mana. So Giant's Amulet is probably not a card you want to play without making the token with it. So you can kind of see this as a 5 mana, 4-5 giant wizard that has hexproof as long as it's untapped. So it plays defense quite well. So this seems like a perfect blocker to have in your dirtly uh, blue deck that has a ton of card draw. That just wants to get to the late game and have a reliable blocker. And then if they somehow do manage to deal with your creature, you still get the equipment that you can move around. If you can combine this with Vigilance, maybe put this on a Vigilant Angel token, then you've got a creature that can attack and block and still have Hexproof. 
since it won't be tapped, so that's potentially a combo to look out for. So yeah, Giant's Amulet I like a lot more than a sword, because 5 mana is a m much more manageable than getting to 7 to get the Angel token with the uh, Valkyrie sword. So I like a B for Giant's Amulet, seems like just a very powerful card if you can get to 5 mana with a ton of additional utility. Then a glimpse of the cosmos is one and a blue for a sorcery add on common. Let's just take a look at the top three cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. This is an effect we've seen before and uh, typically not that exciting, but there's more. As long as we control a giant, we can cast glimpse from our graveyard by paying blue rather than paying its mana cost and then we have to exile it afterwards. So we glimpse for two mana, we get a bit of card selection, that's fine, although in a set with Fortel, spending two mana, spinning our wheels is going to be a little bit sketchy in the face of people foretelling and playing out some uh, more expensive cards ahead of schedule. But the ability to then cast it for one mana out of the graveyard means we essentially get an extra card, and just casting it for a single blue is incredibly cheap. So in a deck with enough giants and or changelings, a uh, glimpse of the cosmos seems great. A glimpse also helps you find the giant to cast it a second time, so it kind of has some built-in uh, redundancy as well. So yeah, glimpse seems quite good actually. Uh, might even push up to B minus territory at the very least a C plus, just because of how cheap and flexible it is and. Blue has access to quite a few giants and changelings, so it shouldn't be too difficult to get it back from the graveyard, assuming you built your deck around it a little bit. So yeah, anticipate with a pretty big upside if we get to cast it out of the graveyard. Plus we could also randomly mill it, since there's some mill uh, synergies throughout the set, so if we happen to mill it and then cast it for one mana, that's even better. So yeah, pretty high on Glimpse. I'll go with a, a B, and we'll see how that pans out. Next up is Graven Lore, 3 and double blue for a snow instant at rare. Let's just scry X where X is the amount of snow mana to spend to cast this, and then we get to draw 3. So it's an instant, so it allows us to keep up other instants and potentially cast it end of turn. We don't need a ton of snow mana for Graven Lore to be good, 5 mana, draw 3 then instant speed, Jace's Ingenuity, still playable, maybe not as good as it once was again. Creatures have gotten better over the years, so pure card draw spells need to be able to pull their weight. But if you have a few snow lands and get to scry, it does get better. In a deck that's in need for some card draw, uh, Graven Lore will do the job. Don't know if this is better than uh, Behold the multi Multiverse that uh, we've seen at Common. I think they're pretty much on the same level in terms of efficiency versus amount of cards drawn. But in a very dedicated snow deck, maybe you prefer the Graven Lore if you get to scry a bunch. So, yeah, maybe Graven Lore does push up into the B range, uh, at the very least a C plus, and of course gets much better the more snow lands you have in play. But definitely a playable card outside of a snow deck, even if you don't have or very few snow lands. Next up is Ice Binds Pillar, two and a blue for a snow artifact at uncommon, and for a snow mana we can tap. The pillar and then tap target artifact or creature. So it's kind of your IC manipulator of the set. Now it does require snow mana to activate, so if we don't have any snow lands it doesn't really do anything. But once again, assuming you've got four or more snow lands in your deck, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be able to activate this and as we all know IC manipulators are incredibly annoying to play against can keep tapping the opponent's largest creature at some point, maybe tap their biggest creature end of turn, untap, tap their second biggest creature, set up a big attack. So it's a nightmare to play against. And uh, yeah, assuming you've got enough snow lands, this seems great. And uh, at the very least a B in the very dedicated snow decks, might even push up to an A-. minus. And next up is Icebreaker Kraken. A whopping 12 mana for an 8-8 snow creature kraken that costs one less to cast for each snow land we control. So it doesn't say snow permanent, specifically snow land. 
So if we're doing the math here, if we have six snow lands in play by turn six, we could technically cast Kraken for six mana. But that is assuming that pretty much every land in our deck is a snow land, which is never going to happen in limited. I say never, very unlikely to happen in limited. So we're looking at a potential play we can make in a very dedicated snow deck by maybe turn eight or nine, if we're being uh, optimistic. And then when the Kraken enters the battlefield, artifacts and creatures target opponent controls don't untap during that player's next untap step. Okay, we don't even get to tap them in the first place, so they just don't untap. And then we can return three snow lands we control to our hands and return Kraken to its owner's hand. So if they're about to kill Kraken, we can save it. But having three fewer snow lands means it's going to take a while before we can replay Kraken. So, yeah, I'm not really into the Kraken, just seems prohibitively expensive to cast, even in a dedicated snow deck. Getting to the amount of snow lands you need seems incredibly difficult, um, so I'm pretty pessimistic on uh, the chances of casting the Kraken in the first place. Although, like we mentioned, it could be a fun card to cheat into play with the opponent's Divine Gambit, so keep that interaction in mind. So I'll give Icebreaker Kraken a D, but hopefully we'll be able to cast it in a very dedicated snow deck one day. Next up is Inga, Rune Eyes, 4 mana for a 3-3 legendary human wizard add on common. When it enters the battlefield we get to scry 3. So an improved Octoprophet, which was a playable card in its respective limited format. And then when Inga, Rune Eyes dies, draw 3 cards if 3 or more creatures died this turn. So this card is interesting. I mean, the fail case of a 4-mana 3-3 Scry 3 is already pretty decent, and a card that would be playing in most blue decks, I think. And then it has this potentially quite powerful payoff. And even if we're not actually drawing the three cards, it might make it awkward for the opponent to do certain things that they otherwise would like to. Um, so three other creatures need to die in the same turn. So let's say the opponent attacks with a creature that would trade with Rune Eyes and we have an instant speed removal spell. If that can destroy a creature, we could destroy a creature, let the trade happen, and then we get to draw three. That seems pretty strong. So this is probably going to be at its best in like a blue-black uh, deck with a few instant speed removal spells, maybe like blue-whites where you've got cards like Iron Verdict or maybe Blue Red with a few burn spells. Uh, that's probably where it's going to shine. But yeah, just a 3-3 three, three, Scry 3 is already decent and then potentially has even more upside that can make things awkward for the opponent. So I think I like a B for Inga here. Next up is Carfell Harbinger, one on a blue for a 1-3 Zombie Wizard and it taps to add blue mana that we can only spend to foretell a card from our hand or cast an instant or sorcery spell. So I'm gonna be at its best in kind of the blue-white uh, foretell deck where we've got lots of instants and sorceries as well. Yeah, a 1-3 is uh, potentially a blocker against some two-powered creatures as well. And this reminds me of the Arcanist from Dominaria which was actually quite good. Zombie and Wizard are creature types that have some relevance in the set as well. So yeah, I kind of like the Harbinger. Um, it's not a card you're going to want in every blue deck. If you're like a blue snow deck without any foretell synergies and without too many instances of sorceries, this is probably not a card you're going to want. But uh, yeah, assuming you've got some expensive instances of sorceries and some foretell cards, Harbinger seems quite nice. So happy giving this a C. Um, Maybe not quite on the same level as Arcanist and Dominaria, since the creature type's not as impactful. Next up is Lityara, Kinseekers, 3 and a blue for a 2-4 Shapeshifter Changeling. And when a Kinseekers enter the battlefield, if you control 3 or more creatures that share a creature type, put a plus and plus 1 counter on the Kinseekers and then scry 1. So given that the Kinseekers itself is a Changeling and has all creature types, in order to put a plus one counter on it and scry one, you just need two creatures in play that share a creature type, and then the Kinseekers will be the third. 
So if you're playing, let's say, the blue-red giants deck, if you have two giants or a giant and a changeling and then play kin seekers, you'll get there. If you're playing, uh, let's say, the blue-green shapeshifter deck, of course, you're going to have even more changelings, making it even easier for the kin seekers. So those are probably two decks where the kin seekers is going to be at its best. Maybe blue black, you've got a few zombies. So uh, those are probably the archetypes where kin seekers will shine. Don't expect it to be amazing in blue white, although who knows, maybe you get a few uh, humans in play, making it able to uh, get the counter as well. So definitely a bit of a build around. You'll have to kind of take a look at your entire deck to figure out how good it's going to be. But if you get to trigger it, a 4-mana 3-5 scry one is definitely above the curve, very difficult to attack into. So question here is, do we give it a C or C plus? The fact that itself it's a changeling is also quite good for some of those synergies that I mentioned, like the giants. So maybe sometimes you'll just be happy to having a 4-mana 2-4 changeling in blue. So I think I'm going with a C plus on the Kin Seekers. I'm pretty hopeful that this will be a role player in a lot of different decks. Next up is Mists of Legera. One of the blue for an enchantment aura at common. It has flash, so we can play it at instant speed. Enchants a creature or vehicle, and the enchanted creature gets minus three, minus oh. So once the vehicle turns into a creature, the effect will take place. So similar to slime bind that we've seen in the past, although a little bit weaker. Uh, Ether Meltdown comes to mind when comparing this to the Mists. So it's a reasonable limited card, can often shrink something down and then block it or double block it to take it out, so the opponent doesn't have any blocker left afterwards. So playable card, I wouldn't get too excited about it since it doesn't get rid of uh, any utility creatures that aren't necessarily attacking, but uh, usually a card you're happy to have. So this will get a C. Then next up is Mistwalker, two and a blue for a 1-4 Shapeshifter Changeling with flying. And for one and a blue, Mistwalker gets plus one, pl minus one until end of turn. So if we activate this three times, it can potentially attack as a 4-1, uh, which will require six mana, but could be a great finisher on a stalled board. And especially having a three mana Changeling in blue, is great in the blue-green uh, shapeshifter changeling deck and is also amazing in the blue-red giants deck because it essentially gives us a three mana giant at common and a 1-4 also blocks a lot of the three powered flyers that we've seen so far so I think Mistwalker might be one of those initially uh, underrated cards just because of how many boxes it ticks and how many things it helps you accomplish uh, so this is at the very least a C+, but this might end up being the best blue common, um, even over the Augury Raven. I wouldn't be too surprised. We'll start out with a C plus on Mistwalker, but I could easily see this ending up as a, a, a low B and taking over Augury Raven, which a lot of people see as the best blue common at the moment. Next up is Mystic Reflection, one on a blue for an instant. At rare, says choose target a non-legendary creature. And the next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers enter the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creature. And it also says foretell for single blue. This card is strange. Um, so the best use case of Mystic Reflection is if you have some sort of creature or a token maker that makes multiple tokens at once. So you get to turn all of them into a specific creature. Yeah, I'm not really sold on this. Um, the Fortal definitely helps, only needing to have one additional blue mana next to casting a creature makes it a bit more manageable. We can choose a creature from the opponent potentially to copy as well. But you're still often spending two cards to get one card that's the best thing on the battlefield. So it's still kind of a, a two for one in the opponent's favor. Yeah, I mean, th this card's cute, and I'm sure there's going to be some situations where it's going to be good. But on average, I don't think Reflection should be in your deck very often. So probably means that it's a, a D. 
but I'm looking forward to getting surprised by this. The fact that it's an instant could maybe work with other instant speed token makers, but I don't think there's many of those in the set. Next up is Orvar, the all form. 4 mana for a 3 3 legendary creature shapeshifter at Mythic Rare. It's also a changeling. So, just a 4 mana 3 3 changeling, if that's all creature types, is potentially reasonable just because it helps you have an extra giant in play for your blue red giant deck, etc. And then, whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, if it targets one or more author permanents you control, Create a token that's a copy of one of those permanents. So this is a bit of a weird one. Uh, you need to target your own permanents. And ideally you don't want to kill it, so maybe you target it with a bounce spell. Or like a pump spell. And then you get to make some copies. So that's kind of neat. Um, just seems a little bit difficult to set up and get a great uh, effect from it. But again, just a fail case of a 4 mana 3 3 changeling isn't too bad, and the opponents might have to respect the ability to make some copies at some point, and then has some additional text whenever a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard this card, get to make a token that's a copy of target permanent. So nice against discard, although there's not too many of those in the set. So yeah, at the end of the day, Orvar Still a playable card, I think most blue decks will want it just because a 4 mana 3-3 three, three changeling uh, is relevant and it has a bit of upside. But uh, yeah, I'm not too high on Orvar, seems a bit difficult to make it great. So I'll start out with a conservative C, maybe C plus even, just because uh, a changeling is already decent. But uh, yeah, this is also the type of card we'll have to kind of discover and hopefully find some cool synergies with. Next up is Pilfering Hawk, one on a blue for a 1 2 snow creature bird. At common, it flies, and for snow mana, can tap it to draw a card and discard a card, so helps us loot. Now, a 1 2 flyer is not all that big, it does potentially stop some 1 1 spirit tokens from packing in, but it's not the best win condition. So, you're mostly interested in looting, uh, which does cost 1 mana each turn. Do need to have a dedicated snow deck to have enough snow mana to reliably activate Pilfering Hawk. So you're probably not going to want this outside of the most dedicated snow decks. And even in the snow deck, it's good, but not, like, amazing. Um, it's not like a, a merfolk looter you get to use each turn without any additional cost. So, probably give this a C. Um, I might have given this a, a C plus in a different environment, but it's also set with Fortel, which is going to take up a lot of the early mana in the game which also makes this a little bit weaker than it would be otherwise, I think. Next up is Raven Form, another controversial card. Two and a blue for a sorcery at common, saying exile target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a 1-1 blue bird creature token with flying and foretells for a single blue mana. The main problem with Raven Form, of course, is giving the opponent a 1-1 flyer, which is a very significant drawback. Now, this can deal with some bombs, unlike some other cards. Uh, we've seen the uh, blue-green Mythic Rare Coma Cosmo Serpent, for instance, which can dodge a lot of removal, but uh, doesn't necessarily dodge Raven Form, because it can get around indestructible. Yeah, on average, if you're getting rid of a 4 or 5 drop from the opponent, and they get a 1-1 flyer in return, I'm still not thrilled about that exchange. It's more like a, a panic button you can potentially hit to get out of a sticky situation, but you're still kind of left with a bit of a mess that you have to clean up. So I'm not too stoked on Raven Form. I think the first copy is probably still going to make the cut in most of your blue decks, just as this kind of get out of jail free card, although you'll have to pay some fines afterwards. Yeah, so I think the first copy of Raven Form is probably fine, but uh, I probably don't want more than one. So it probably means this is a C. Next up is Reflections of Lejara. Four and a blue for a rare enchantment. Saying as Reflections enters a battlefield, choose a creature type. And whenever you cast a spell of the chosen type, copy that spell. So it's a slow card, but 
the payoff is potentially quite huge. And this is amazing in a changeling deck where you can name pretty much any creature type and still uh, make a bunch of copies. So if you're if you're playing, let's say, a blue-red giants deck, you can name giants and then both your giants and your changelings will make copies of themselves. So it's a slow card with potentially a lot of payoff. Uh, assuming you've got reflections and another creature in hand, you get at least one copy of the next creature you cast if you name its type. So a bit of a build around card, going to be at its best in blue-red and blue-green, where you've got the changeling synergy. Uh, maybe blue-black with a bit of zombies can get there too. So definitely a build around card, but the payoff is potentially quite high. So it seems like a fun build around card. Don't want to give it too high of a grade since it is slow and you're not always going to get to cast it before you get run over. But we'll give it a C plus. Definitely a fun card uh, worth building around. But don't necessarily first pick it and go all the way if there's other good cards in the pack. Next up is Run Ashore. Six mana for an instant at common. Choose one or both between bouncing a non-land permanent to its owner's hands and putting a non-land permanent on top of the owner's library. So we get to bounce two things essentially and the opponent's next draw step gets uh, essentially removed by drawing the same card again. So it's uh, essentially card neutral since the opponent loses a draw step in the process. But we are spending six mana for a bounce spell which is quite pricey. We've seen a lot of these more expensive bounce effects in the past and they look okay on the surface, like there's nothing wrong with Run Ashore. It's just kind of expensive and doesn't often make the cut. So, yeah, this is probably a D. Like, there's nothing wrong with it, but I just don't see playing this in most decks unless you're some sort of aggressive tempo deck that needs a double bounce spell to end the game and you don't have a lot of other evasion built in, although blue typically has a few flyers. So yeah, fine card, just a bit pricey. Don't see including this in most decks. Next up is Rune of Flight, two mana for an enchantment aura, Rune. So this is another of the Rune cycle, add on common. Enchants a permanent when it enters battlefield, draw a card. And the enchanted permanent gets flying or the equipment gets that uh, effect. So yeah, this seems like one of the better runes uh, lifelink also great, flying great, so these are all very irrelevant abilities to put on a creature and especially on an equipment, so if we can put this on a cheap equipment and then give a bunch of creatures flying even if they have removal seems great. And we get to draw a card in the process, so there's no card disadvantage unless the opponent can remove our thing in response, which usually shouldn't happen. So yeah, I like Rune of Fly quite a bit. Mostly because there's other synergies in the set with the runes. Um, if there weren't any rune synergies, this would probably be like a C+. With the rune synergies, this might even bump up to a B, just because of the potential upside of searching it up with your runed crown. Next up we've got our Fortel Counterspell. Saw it coming. 3 mana, instant, add uncommon, counters a spell. Fortel for 1 on a blue. So if we're foretelling it, we're essentially paying four mana, but can potentially split it up over the course of multiple turns. The mere existence of a foretell counter spell is going to have to change the way we play. Cancel in limited is sometimes playable, sometimes not. This seems like a set where eh, this card seems okay, um, especially in kind of the foretell synergy deck, but I'm still not too stoked about this. Um, so probably just a C for saw it coming, playable but not necessarily a staple. Next up is strategic planning, one on a blue for a sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. So putting cards in graveyard is potentially synergistic in kind of the blue-black decks where you wanna maybe uh, get some value out of the graveyard. Problem with strategic planning is we're also playing in a set with foretell, where if you're not doing anything for two mana, you would usually rather be foretelling and putting stuff in exile. Uh, the main difference with the other two mana, Glimpse of the Cosmos, which I gave a pretty high grade 
of course, is that Glimpse will eventually, if you've got enough uh, giants, draw you an extra card in the process, where strategic planning doesn't really do that. So, yeah, I think planning gets a D. Uh, might see playing it in a deck that has a lot of graveyard synergy, but seems like a, a card that's not going to make the final cut very often. And then Undersea Invader, 6 mana for a 5-6 giant rogue with flash at common, but don't get too excited because when the invader enters the battlefield, it enters the battlefield tapped. So no ambushing of opposing creatures pretty much is what that means, which is kind of the main reason why you would want flash on a card. It does have the upside of letting you keep up mana for other instance, but it's not like there's a ton of counter spells worth keeping up. So, yeah, not too thrilled about Invader. It is a giant if you need some random giants to top off your curve in your blue-red giants deck. But uh, Torrential Gearhulk, this is not. So give this a D. And that's our final blue card. Blood on the Snow, 6 mana for a rare Snow Sorcery. Let's us choose one between Destroy All Creatures or All Planeswalkers. And then we get to return a creature or planeswalker card with convert mana cost X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield where X is the amount of snow mana spent to cast this. So even without snow mana, we get a 6 mana board wipe, which is a little pricey, but still potentially powerful. And in a snow deck, if we actually get to return something worth, let's say, 3 mana, then uh, blood on the snow becomes quite appealing. So overall... What do we give blood? This is probably a B, just because 6 mana can be a little too slow for a sweeper if you're very far behind. Um, but it also gets that snow synergy, giving it a little bit of a boost. So it could get a little bit better in a dedicated snow deck, which, as we've mentioned, is typically going to be in the Sultai colors. So I'll give blood a B. Next up we've got Blood Sky Berserker. One on a black for a 1-1 one, one Human Berserker at Uncommon, and whenever we cast our second spell each turn, put two plus one plus one counters on Berserker, and it gains menace until end of turn. So this is quite a payoff for the cast two spells in the same turn deck, which, as we mentioned, is probably going to be black-white more often than not. And yeah, in that deck, Berserker seems like an amazing payoff card, gonna keep on growing, menace makes it difficult to block, and being a 2-mana card itself means we can potentially play Berserker and a 1-mana Fortel card in the same turn to get two counters on it right away. So I like a B for Berserker, it's going to be one of the better payoff cards. Burning Rune Demon is a 6-mana six 6-6 six, six Mythic Rare Demon Berserker with flying. And when it enters the battlefield, it can search our library for exactly two cards not named Burning Rune Demon that have different names Get to reveal those, opponent gets to choose one of them to put into our graveyard, the other one goes into our hand. So if we search up our two remaining best cards in the deck, we get to have one of them, the other one goes to the graveyard, and we have a 6-6 flyer in play. Yeah, this card seems great, definitely a bomb, not quite worthy of an S, but uh, still gonna probably win us the game if we get to cast it, so A for Burning Rune Demon. Crippling Fear is a 4-mana rare sorcery. We choose a creature type, and creatures that aren't of the chosen type get minus 3, minus 3 until end of turn. So this is kind of the reverse of Witch's Vengeance from uh, Eldraine. And yeah, this could be potentially a one-sided sweeper. Now do keep in mind, again, changelings don't die to Crippling Fear, since they have all creature types, including the one we choose. But... That being said, Crippling Fear could still easily be a one-sided sweeper with only a 4-mana investment, which seems quite strong. So I think I'm still willing to give this an A, just because of how crippling this can be for the opponent. Then we've got Death Knell Berserker, one on a black for a 2-2 Elf Berserker, and when it dies, if its powers 3 or greater, create a 2-2 black zombie berserker creature token. Alright, seems like your average 2-mana creature with a bit of upside. Uh, this is just going to be a C. It has two relevant creature types, both Elf and Berserker are nice types to have. So, yeah, fine card. Gets a C, 
and also has good synergy with our next card here, Demonic Gifts. One on a black for an instant at common, until end of turn, target creature gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn, as well as gaining the ability when this creature dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So this is an effect we've seen before, and yeah, it's quite synergistic with our Elf Berserker from before, since we get to potentially trade it off and get a 2-2 zombie, as well as getting the Berserker back in play. So just a nice combo trick, definitely above average in terms of combo tricks, and quite synergistic with any enter battlefield abilities. So I like C for demonic gifts. Next up is a very interesting and potentially controversial card. Dogged Pursuit, 3 and a black for an enchantment at common. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So this will remind people of Ill-Gotten Inheritance, which ended up being one of the better cards in Ravnica Allegiance. Now, do keep in mind Ravnica Allegiance had Spectacle as one of its main mechanics, which the Inheritance enabled. And we also had two potentially aggressive decks with Rakdos and Orzov. Dog Pursuit still wants to go in an aggressive deck, as a difficult to interact with permanent that slowly drains the opponent, but it most importantly lacks the ability to sacrifice itself to deal those four extra points of damage to end the game sooner. And there's no spectacle or author real synergy with Dog Pursuit in the set, like we did in Ravnica Legions. So this card just seems kind of out of place in the set, where it doesn't really go into any deck, it doesn't go in a snow deck, it doesn't go really anywhere, other than maybe a hyper-aggressive deck that just needs a finisher um, that's difficult to interact with, maybe like the black-white double spell deck once this is a curve topper, I'm not sure, but I'm not very interested in Docked Pursuit, so I'm gonna give it a D. Next up is Draugr, Necromancer, 3 and a black for a 4-4 snow creature, a zombie cleric at rare, saying if a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, exile that card with an ice counter on it instead, and we can cast spells from among cards in exile that our opponent owns that have an ice counter on them, and then, important here, we can spend mana from snow sources only, as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So if you don't have any snow lands, and you're playing against an opponent that isn't sharing any colors with you, it's going to be difficult to leverage those exiled cards, because you might not have the mana to cast them. Now, if you do have some snow lands, or the opponent happens to have some overlap in the colors they're playing, it's going to become much easier to cast those cards. So even though Necromancer isn't necessarily a card that you have to play in a snow deck, it does get better in a snow deck, as you'll have more snow lands to cast those spells. But the fail case here is still 4 mana 4-4, four, four. Um, and you might have some incidental snow lands even if you're not a dedicated snow deck. So yeah, Necromancer seems great. The fail case is still a perfectly playable card, and the upside is potentially quite high, especially in black where you've got a lot of removal. So I like A for Necromancer. Next up we've got a Draugr, Recruiter, 3 and a black for a 3-3 Zombie Cleric at common. And it has Boast for 3 and a black, returning a creature from our graveyard to our hand. Although the Boast ability is prohibitively expensive here. 4 mana to return a creature. 4 mana 3-3 three, three is just kind of overcosted already. Now this does have potential upside, you know, especially if you can somehow give it evasion, maybe give it flying somehow. But it's still a very big investment, 4 mana to get something back, and then you have to play it. Just seems a little bit too slow. Um, I like the effect, but it just seems like it's gonna end up uh, falling short most of the time. So I think this will probably be closer to a D, although uh, it is the type of effect I like in general. Next up is Draugr's Helm, part of the equipment cycle. One on a black for an uncommon artifact equipment. When it enters a battlefield, we can pay two and a black. And if we do, we get to make a 2-2 two -two zombie berserker creature token and attach the helm to it, giving it plus two plus two and menace. So five mana total to get a 4-4 four -four with menace. And then afterwards, we can move the helm for four mana. Don't think this is something you're often going to cast for two mana unless you need to maybe cast two spells in the same turn for some effect. 
But yeah, five mana for four menace isn't too bad. And then this is one of the more impactful equipment. Plus two, plus two in menace is very relevant. Going to make it so most of your creatures are going to trade with at least two creatures from the opponent if you can be on the offensive. So I like C plus for helm. Maybe uh, not the best of these equipment, but it's definitely not the worst one either. Next up is Dead Rider, 6 mana for a 3-7 Spirit Knight at common. And for 1 on a black we can tap it, exile a creature card from our graveyard to make the opponent lose 3 life. So it's a decent blocker and gives us a win condition, assuming there's enough food in the graveyard. Although at 6 mana it's just very expensive, doesn't have Fortel to make it cheaper. And just doesn't have any relevant creature types. So this card also feels a bit out of place can maybe be a win condition for a very slow controlling deck that doesn't have any other way of closing out the game. Although that deck might be short on creatures to use the ability in the first place. So yeah, it's a cool looking card, but it's not very good sadly, so I'll give it a D. Next up is Dream Devourer, one on a black for an O3, Demon Cleric at rare, saying each non-land card in your hand without foretell has foretell. And the Fortel cost is equal to its mana cost, reduced by 2, which is often the case for the Fortel cards anyway. And then whenever you Fortel a card, the Devourer gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So, interesting card. Um, potentially helps you double spell by letting you Fortel cards. So has a bit of synergy in the black-white uh, Fortel double spell type deck. And you can potentially be Fortelling cards that already had Fortel, just to pump the demon can potentially pump it multiple times in the same turn. So, yeah, it's a, a neat little card with a, a lot going on. It's still not a bomb, but yeah, it's somewhere between C plus and a B minus. Uh, I'll go with the C plus for Dream Devourer. Seems like a card you're going to be happy to have in almost any black deck, and in some very synergistic decks it might be even better. Then we've got Dusk Wielder, 1 mana for a 1-2 Elf Berserker at common. And it has boasts. For 1 mana, target opponent loses 1 life and you gain 1 life. Now sadly we can only activate boasts once per turn. Otherwise this could be an interesting finisher. But uh, yeah, Dusk Wielder just doesn't really brawl all that well. 1-2 easily gets blocked and eaten. So... Elf and Berserker are both relevant creature types. Don't know if that really saves this card. So outside of the hyper-aggressive black-white double spell deck, I don't really see a home for this card, even in the, the black-green elf deck. Probably doesn't want this. So it just seems a bit underpowered, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them play either. So I think a D for Dusk Wielder. Next up, we've got another dual-faced card here with... Egon, God of Death, which is 2 and a black for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature god with Death Touch, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, exile 2 cards from your graveyard, and if you can't, sacrifice Egon and draw a card. So even if Egon goes away on the next upkeep, we essentially got a 6-6 six, six Death Touch blocker for a turn, and we still got to draw a card, which isn't amazing, but also isn't bad. And assuming we play Egon a little bit later in the game, or have some self-mill synergy, then we get a 6-6 Death Touch for multiple turns, which seems quite good. But we also have the flexibility of playing it as a legendary artifact named Throne of Death, which is just one mana, and at the beginning of our upkeep mills a card, and for two and a black we can tap and exile a creature from our graveyard to draw a card. So, assuming a an average deck with 15-16 creatures. A little bit less than half of our cards are going to be creatures that we mill, so maybe once every two, two and a half turns we get to turn uh, one of the cards we milled into an extra card if we pay the three mana. Which is slow, but it is steady card advantage. So this one I'm not quite sure if you're going to play it as a artifact or as a creature in limited more often than not. But it's definitely an interesting card. Uh, it can also enable some other mill synergies, so has that going for it too. Um, overall, 
I'm hesitant to give this too high of a grade just because keeping a full graveyard is going to be challenging, even in the most dedicated uh, mill decks. So it's going to go away pretty quickly, but it does replace itself. So this falls somewhere between a C plus and a B minus in my mind. I'll start out with a more conservative C plus, but I could see it overperforming. Next up we have Elderfang, Disciple, one on the black for a 1-1 one -one Elf Cleric. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. Now an Elf is a relevant creature type, and it also gives us a 1-1 one -one creature that can be used as sacrifice fodder in any number of decks like black-white or black-red. So Disciple fills a lot of roles, and at the very least it trades for an opposing card, which is never bad. So I'm quite fond of the Disciple, similar, similar to Burglar Rats in uh, Ravnica, which was a very good role player, and this one might even have more synergy than Burglar Rat had. So I think this might end up as one of the better black commons, so willing to give this a C plus just because it fits into so many different archetypes. And then Eradicator Valkyrie is 4 mana for a 4-3 Mythic Rare Angel Berserker with Flying, Lifelink and Hexproof from Planeswalkers, which is already quite good by itself, almost impossible to race. And for 1 on a black all says Boast, sacrifice a creature, each opponent sacrifices a creature or Planeswalker, so another card that rewards us for having some random creatures to sacrifice. And yeah, I mean, by itself, just a 4-3 Flying Life Link is incredibly good for 4 mana. So not quite in the S tier, because it does get answered by most removal spells uh, without too much drawback. But if it goes unanswered, it will win the game. So I think that's the definition of an A bomb. Then Feed the Serpent, 4 mana for an instant at common, which exiles target creature or planeswalker. So this is Vraska's Contempt without a life gain, but at common, so seems incredibly strong. Probably going to be the best black common, easily a B. Grim Draugr, 2 and a black for a 3-2 Snow Creature Zombie Berserker. At common for 1 and a Snow, Draugr gets plus 1 plus 2 and gains Menace until end of turn. So nothing amazing, just going to be kind of a filler card in some decks if you have Let's say you're four snow lands. You can maybe hope to activate this once or twice. And in the dedicated snow deck, this is where Grim Draugr becomes a bit more exciting if you can activate this multiple times. Menace means it's going to probably force a trade for multiple creatures from the opponent. And can be a nice win condition. So not an exciting card since it doesn't go into every deck. But both Zombie and Berserker are relevant creature types too. So at the very least a C, might even inch closer to a C plus depending on how the format shakes out. Next up is another very interesting card to evaluate, Hailstorm a Valkyrie, 3 and a black for a 2-2 Snow Creature Angel Wizard with Flying and Trample, and for double snow Valkyrie gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So just looking at this card, it seems like it has to be powerful. It is 4 mana for a 2-2 Flying Trample, with a very difficult to activate ability, which only the most dedicated snow decks will be able to use. And even if we activate this, we're still spending two snow mana, which is probably all the snow mana we have, or at least most of it, just to give it plus two plus two until end of turn, which is a pretty expensive mana sink. I mean, it is efficient, but it's still not that amazing. So obviously outside of a snow deck, if your deck only has four snow basics or snow lands, you're just not going to want this, but even in the snow deck, this card isn't amazing, or at least not as amazing as it looks at first glance. So I'm kind of down on Valkyrie, and it might fall in the D category. A very dedicated snow deck, which has like over half of its lands being snow lands. I could see Valkyrie being maybe okay if you can like pump it twice per turn. It can finish the game pretty quickly. But we've seen other win conditions in the snow deck, the zombie we've just seen with Menace, the Yeti, which can become unblockable. So I'm just doubtful of how much you would want a Valkyrie, which is a worse creature um, on defense. Although I guess it can also potentially block some bigger flyers. So it's not a card without merit, it just seems a bit inefficient and requires a lot of setup to be good. So I'm going to start with a bit of a 
disappointing D, but might end up uh, overperforming and inching its way towards the C category. Next up is another Mythic Rare with Haunting Voyage, 6 mana. For a sorcery, let lets us choose a creature type and then we return up to two creature cards of that type from our graveyard to the battlefield. And we can also foretell it, and this is one of the weird situations where foretell is more expensive than the normal mana cost. But if we cast this with foretell, which is going to be a two mana upfront investment plus seven mana, so nine total over the course of two turns, then we can return all creature cards of that type from our graveyard to the battlefield instead. So very expensive for the most part in limited. I'm guessing just casting it for six mana is going to be the average scenario, but every now and then I, I guess we can foretell it to get most of our graveyard back. Black, not necessarily the deck that's going to have most of the changelings, but maybe if you're blue-black, you have some changelings and some zombies you can name zombie. Maybe you're black-green, you can name elf and get multiple elves back, although those are typically on the cheaper side but it's usually not going to be too difficult to get two creatures back. So this technically a two for one, even if it requires a bit of setup and potentially has more upside. So I'm not super high on Haunting Voyage, but it's definitely a powerful effect. So this falls somewhere between C plus and B. Yeah, let's go with C plus on Haunting Voyage. Powerful, but requires a little bit of setup, so it's not the most practical card. Next up, we have one of the payoffs for the double spell deck, which is typically going to be black-white, but could easily go into other decks as well. Infernal Path, a 3 mana 2-2, two, two. and whenever we cast our second spell each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on Infernal Path, and it gains flying until end of turn. So casting two spells in the same turn is the name of the game in your Infernal Path deck. Now, how easy is it going to be to cast two spells reliably? Triggering it the first time shouldn't be too much of a challenge, but the question is, like, how often can we keep double spelling? If it turns into a 3-3 for one turn, it's, like, still not that exciting. Um, so we really need to be triggering this multiple times. And if you don't get to turn it into a 3-3 right away, then it's kind of a disaster. So, this seems like the type of card that should be great and a nice payoff, but I'm hesitant of how good the payoff actually is here. So, it feels like this should be a C+, plus, but I, I'm, I think I'm still going to give this a C just because of how awkward it can be if you're behind and if you don't get to enable it right away. So, we'll, we'll go with a C, but... I'll be happy if I'm uh, proven wrong and this ends up being closer to a C+. Next up is Jarl of the Forsaken, 3 and a black for a zombie cleric at common. With flash it's a 3-2. You can also foretell it for 1 and a black. And when it enters a battlefield, destroy target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. So this is very similar to a 4 mana creature we've seen in Ikoria. That could finish off a creature that was dealt damage, that had flash. The foretell makes this a little bit more flexible, potentially casting it for just two mana, easier to keep up. So this seems like the type of card that in the first couple uh, weeks of the format people might not play around as much. Going back to the two mana 1-1 one -one that makes the opponent discard a card, that seems like a great enabler to potentially take out some larger creatures, can block with it and then flash in the uh, Forsaken to finish off a creature dealt one damage. But as the format will go on, people will probably learn to play around this a little bit better, and it's gonna decrease in value. So at the end of the day, probably give this a C+, still a fine card, but uh, might drop off over time, so we'll see. Then we've got Carfell Kennel Master, 4 in the black, for a 4-4 Zombie Berserker. And when it enters a battlefield, up to two target creature, two target creatures each get plus one plus one and gain indestructible until end of turn. So this card represents a ton of extra damage that the two opponents won't easily be able to block. Um, so yeah, if, if you're a curve out deck, especially if you're on the play, 
this represents a ton of damage, also puts a 4-4 in play. Typically, these 5 mana cards wouldn't be getting very high ratings, because they're generally pretty replaceable. But I feel like the the Kennel Master is actually a little bit better than most of the replaceable 5 drops. It's still probably not a card I'm going to take super highly, but it does seem very impactful, as long as your deck is trying to turn its creatures sideways. So not a card you want in a more controlling deck, but uh, I'm assuming in like a black-white creature deck or black-red that wants to be a bit more aggressive, this is going to be great. So yeah, maybe this even gets up to a C+, which is pretty rare for 5 drops at common. Next up is Komas Faithful, 2 and a black for a 3-1 elf cleric with lifelink, and when it dies each player mills 3 cards, which does potentially enable some graveyard synergies, which is usually going to be an upside. 3-1 lifelink, nothing amazing, ends up trading off for smaller creatures most of the time, but lifelink does mean that it kind of forces a trade, and if you can give it evasion somehow, it's a nice creature to combine it with. So, still not super stoked about the Faithful, but I could see the mill 3 being more relevant than it uh, appears. I'll start out with a C for Faithful, but it's also a card that could end up uh, overperforming. Next up we have Poison the Cup, 1 and double black for an instant and a common. Destroys a creature, and if it was foretold, which we can do for 1 and black, we also get to scry 2. So this is just murder with upside. So this is one of the better B level cards we're going to see today. Just incredibly efficient and has a lot of potential upside with uh, Fortel as well. So this seems great. Priest of the Haunted Edge is one on a black for an 0-4 snow creature zombie cleric. Can tap and sacrifice it to give target creature minus X minus X until end of turn where X is the number of snow lands we control. Can only be used at sorcery speed. And it's an 0-4 otherwise, so it's a creature that can block early on, and once we build up enough snow lands, can maybe take out some evasive creatures that we can't otherwise deal with. So this is the type of card that you're only going to want to play in the more dedicated snow decks, where around half of your lands are snow lands, so you can actually kill something a bit more sizable. Uh, the 0-4 body does potentially have the drawback of not stopping both creatures from attacking and potentially using their abilities, which can be a downside. So overall, Priest seems like a C-level card. It's going to be a playable role player in the snow decks, and Zombie is also a relevant creature type. It's also snow permanence, so that can potentially matter. Then Race the Draugr, one on the black for an instant. Choose one between returning a creature from our graveyard to our hand, or returning two creature cards that share a creature type from our graveyard to our hand instead. So we're only really happy if we get to return two creatures with this, but we're playing a set with a few tribal synergies, black-green has elves, in uh, black-red we might have multiple berserkers, in black-white we might have some humans that overlap, and in uh, blue black, we have both zombies, maybe some changelings in there too. So it shouldn't be too difficult to build your deck around this to bring back multiple creatures at once, and these raise dead type effects are usually quite good. So yeah, I think raise the Draugr is probably gonna end up as a C+. You're very happy with the first copy, uh, the second copy falls off a little bit, but having the first to provide a, a two for one in the late game is quite nice. Then return upon the tide, 4 and a black for an uncommon sorcery with foretell for 3 and a black. Returns a creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. And if it's an elf card, we also get to make 2 1 1 green elf warrior creature tokens. Now, the problem with return upon the tide is that most of the elves tend to be on the smaller side. So getting an elf back for 4 mana or even 5 mana isn't necessarily all that amazing, even if we do get those 2 extra tokens. So. If the scenario where we get the tokens means getting back a worse creature, it, it gets a little bit less exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm not super high on Return Upon the Tide. Generally speaking, these 5 mana uh, reanimation effects aren't as exciting as they maybe used to be. So I think this is probably closer to a D than anything else. Might maybe wiggle its way upon 
up to a, a C rating if uh, making those two elf tokens ends up being more relevant than it seems at first glance. Then Rise of the Dread Marn. Two and a black for an instant at rare can be foretold for just a single black mana. So that makes this effect way more impactful since we get to create X 2 2 black zombie berserker creature tokens where X is the number of non token creatures that died this turn. Now, setting up Rise of the Dread Marn is probably going to be a little trickier than it seems. It's not often that three or four creatures trade in the middle of combat, it's usually like two creatures and you're pretty happy. So you're still putting in a bit of work just to get like two, if you're very lucky, maybe three zombies for uh, the cost. And by the time you can cast this and get those zombie tokens, the two two zombies probably aren't super relevant anymore. So not amazing, uh, can potentially uh, get you back on the board after a sweeper. And we've seen a decent number of sweepers uh, for limited sets so far. So I guess there's that upside too. Still wouldn't necessarily rate this too highly, but it's probably at least a C. Then we've got Rune of Mortality, which is a black rune. So it draws a card when it enters, gives the enchanted permanent Death Touch, and uh, can do the same for an equipment. So Death Touch can be nice if we put it on like a small sacrifice fodder type creature, like the 1-1 one -one elf that makes this card. And could potentially combo if we put it on a creature that can deal damage to opposing creatures. There's not that many in the set, but there's at least one in red at common that can boast to deal one damage. So that's potentially a combo with a rune. So overall, still like the rune quite a bit. Replaces itself, has upside with those rune synergy cards. And uh, the fail case is never too bad. So probably give this a C+. Plus. Also very good with first strike. Next up is Scamfar Avenger, one on the black for a 3-1 Elf Berserker at rare. Whenever another non-token Elf or Berserker we control dies, get to draw a card and lose one life. So it's kind of a Midnight Reaper, although it doesn't count itself and only counts for Elves or Berserkers, but we do get a 3-1 that can beat down pretty hard. And black is definitely the color with a lot of Elves and Berserkers. So yeah, I like Avenger, probably gets a B just because it's a powerful 2-drop with a relevant ability in the late game, which is all you can really ask for from your 2-drops. Then Scamfar Shadow Sage is 3 and a black for a 2-5. Elf Cleric at Uncommon. 2-5 is pretty big for 4 mana. When it enters a battlefield, you can choose between making the opponent lose X life or gaining X life, where X is the greatest number of creatures we control that have a creature type in common. So in black, that's probably going to be Elf uh, more often than not, maybe Cleric. Of course, a Shadow Sage counts itself, so at the very least we're uh, draining or gaining one life, but hopefully a little bit more. So this seems like the type of card that's quite good in the black-green Elf deck if you can make a bunch of tokens to drain the opponent uh, for a bit more. So this could potentially be a nice target for the Return Upon the Tide to reanimate Shadow Sage. So yeah, this card seems okay. Uh, at the very least a C plus, just because of four mana two five, that gains a life or drains for once, not too bad. Then we've got Skull Raid, the Mind Rot of the set. Four mana for a sorcery that makes you put on discard two cards, but this is kind of a novelty. If they had fewer than two cards, to discard, we get to draw cards equal to the difference, so if the opponent's empty-handed, instead of drawing a blank in the late game, we can still for 4 mana draw 2, also as foretell for 1 on a black. So I'm still not super high on Skull Raid. The opponent can still be holding lands, uh, so they can deny the card draw and just discard some lands they don't need in the late game. Probably still like a C at the very least, even if it's on the lower end of the spectrum. And then we've got another very interesting rare, Turgrid, God of Fright, which is 5 mana for a 4-5 legendary creature god. And it's one of those dual-faced cards, and also has Menace. And whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, we can put that card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. So there's not that many discard effects, we've just seen Skull Raid, that's one of the few ones we'll see. 
and uh, sacrificing permanents also doesn't come up a whole lot. There's maybe like one or two. So for the most part, we're looking at five mana for a four five with menace, which, you know, is fine, but not incredibly exciting. Although we do also have the flexibility of playing Turgrid's Lantern, which is three and a black for a legendary artifact can tap to make target player lose 3 life unless they sacrifice a non-land permanent or discard a card. And we can even for 3 and a black untap lantern so we can use it again. So this is very reminiscent of the uh, Scarab curse that we saw in Amonkhet back in the day, which essentially made the opponents make the choice of losing life, sacrificing a permanent, or uh, discarding a card. So this kind of does the same, but this also has the upside of potentially using it multiple times in the same turn if we untap it. And you would be surprised of how quickly this effect adds up. Typically speaking, these Punisher mechanics where you're giving the opponent a choice aren't very good. But in this case, all the choices are pretty bad and add up pretty quickly. So it's not like they can take three damage turn after turn, especially once you start activating it twice in the same turn. So... I think uh, this is probably a card you're going to play as the artifact side more often than not, unless you've got a lot of synergy with uh, Turgrid to make the opponent sacrifice or discard cards. But yeah, overall seems quite good. Um, what do we give this as an overall grade? It's probably a low A, high B, somewhere in that range. Yeah, I guess we can go A for Turgrid's Lantern. It's also just a very fun card to play with and leads to some interesting decisions when playing against. So I'll start out with a more optimistic A, but I could see it falling down to a B. It's still a card that gives the opponent a lot of agency. Next up, Targrid's Shadow. Three and a black for an instant at Uncommon, making each player sacrifice two creatures. And then it also foretells for two and double black. Now foretell actually makes this card a lot better than it might seem because typically speaking the downside of foretelling is you're not adding to the board but if you're setting up your double edict you don't really want to add more creatures to the board so this kind of baits the opponent into having two creatures for you to sacrifice so it's kind of like having another board wipe if you set this up properly and uh, yeah it's even an instance which is also unusual for this type of effect so Turgut Shadow seems great and gets at, le at least a B from me and seems like a card you'll need to learn to play around if the opponent is foretelling and seems to be acting suspiciously and not adding anything to the board. Next up we've got a very interesting card to evaluate with Valky, God of Lies. So this is another dual-faced card, although unlike some of the other ones we've seen, the backside is a multicolor card. So while we can play Valky in just a black deck without red mana, it does get significantly better if we can also cast the other half, which gives us access to a Tybalt Planeswalker. So Valky, God of Lies, 2 mana for a 2-1 legendary creature god, that when it enters the battlefield, each opponent reveals their hand, and then we can exile a creature card they reveal this way until Valky leaves the battlefield. So it's kind of like a Kite Sail Freebooter for opposing creatures. And then for X mana, we can choose a creature card exiled with Valky, with converted mana cost X, and then Valky becomes a copy of that card. So if we can get rid of the opponent's bomb, we can even turn Valky into that bomb if we spend the mana. So just two mana for a 2-1 kind of freebooter for creatures that can eventually turn into something bigger seems quite good. And then we have the flexibility of potentially casting Tybalt, Cosmic Imposter, seven mana for a five loyalty Planeswalker. Now, very important to read the passive ability here, saying as Tybalt enters a battlefield, you get an emblem saying we can play cards exiled with Tybalt, and we may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So even if they remove Tybalt, we'll still keep that emblem and keep that effect. Then the plus two exiles the top card of each player's library, so potentially exiles two cards that we can cast with Tybalt. The minus three exiles target artifact or creature, so if we exile the opponent's creature we can potentially even cast it with Tybalt afterwards and then a minus eight exile exiles all cards from all graveyards and we add triple red to our mana pool so 
If we were just evaluating Tybalt at 7 mana, it would be a good card, but of course would be a little bit weaker because we sometimes just don't get to 7 mana and get run over. But here we even have the flexibility of casting it as a 2-drop, which has a very significant impact on the game. I think this is probably like an S in a deck that's capable of casting both halves, otherwise of course it's uh, not going to be as exciting. But yeah, I think I think I'm good with S on Valky slash Tybalt here. Then we have Varagoth, Bloodsky, Sire, two and a black for a two three legendary demon rogue with Death Touch, and it also has Boast for one and a black, letting target player search their library for a card, shuffle their library and put it back on top. So it's a vampiric tutor, so it doesn't put it into our hands, but on top of our deck. 3 mana for a 2-3 death touch, already quite good, and uh, it's going to end up trading for one of the opponent's creatures, and if you can boast, you can uh, search up your next best card. So, yeah, Varagoth seems quite strong. It's also got uh, the rogue type, which might have some constructed applications, who knows. But uh, for now, for limiteds, probably worthy of at least a B. Next up we've got Vengeful, a Reaper, 3 and a black for a 2-3, Angel, Cleric with Flying and Death Touch and Haste, and also has Fortel for 1 and a black. So yeah, this card seems great on both offense and defense. Can get in there right away, can trade off for the opponent's best card, even if it's a flyer, and Fortel means we can potentially double spell with this as well, which is especially great in like a black-white deck. So I like B for Vengeful Reaper, seems quite strong. Next up we have Village Rites, a reprint, single black for an instant, as an additional cost we have to sacrifice a creature, and then we get to draw two cards. Now there's not as big of a sacrifice theme in the set as there was in some other limited environments. Uh, there is an act of treason at common, but it's not particularly exciting, so that's potentially a combo with Village Rites. And uh, otherwise, there's not that many things that you can combo with it, but it's still okay. Like if the opponent tries to kill your creature, sacrifice it in response, draw two is a pretty nice exchange. Plus, again, there's like the sacrifice fodder creatures like we talked about, the one one that makes the opponent discard a card. Yet another reason to like it. So Village Rites is never a bad card, but uh, how good exactly it is will kind of depend on how your deck looks like, how many creatures you're happy to sacrifice. But we'll start out with a conservative C for village rights, just because there's not as much synergy as you might like. It's also a way to put creatures in the graveyard, which can be relevant for our next card, way down, single black for a sorcery at common. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to exile a creature card from our graveyard, and then target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. It's a very powerful removal spell, although the fact that we need to exile a creature means we won't necessarily get to cast it right away. So this is where having some self-mill or cheap creatures that trade off and go to the graveyard becomes better. So I'm thinking that the first copy of Way Down is probably going to be quite good because by the time you need to cast it, hopefully there's going to be at least one creature in the graveyard. But the additional copies of Way Down might be a little bit more prohibitive to cast. So I'm going to start with a C plus on way down, but uh, multiple copies do get worse, similar to how we rated the blue removal spell. Next up we have Wither Crown, one on a black for an enchantment aura, enchants a creature and turns its base power to zero and says at the beginning of your upkeep you lose one life unless you sacrifice this creature. So Wither Crown is good at dealing with power and toughness, it's not good at dealing with utility. And what I what I mean by that is, let's say the opponent's playing a blue-white foretell deck and they have the legendary owl in play and our only removal spell is Wither Crown, then the opponent's probably pretty happy losing one life if they get to keep Vega in play and draw a bunch of extra cards. So that's the type of situation where Wither Crown's not going to be your favorite removal spell. If the opponent has like a vanilla 4-4 four, four, or 5-5 five, five in play, then this is probably not the worst removal spell. It still means that the opponent can keep that creature on defense, which can potentially prevent more damage than they're taking by taking one damage each turn. So there's definitely a lot of situations where 
with her crown is not going to be an ideal removal spell um, and you're giving the opponents a lot of control over how they want to play with it but at the end of the day it does potentially remove or at least prevent a lot of damage so this is going to be at its best in a more controlling deck uh, that doesn't have a lot of creatures itself that need to attack on the ground so I'm thinking like maybe a snow control deck where eventually you can win the game with some menacing or unblockable creatures then Wither Crown is going to be quite good at just mitigating damage early on but it's not going to be very good in a more aggressive deck where the opponent can maybe just chum block or keep blocking your creatures with the creature that's enchanted that's kind of how uh, I view this card so at the end of the day probably give Wither Crown somewhere between a C minus D plus I'll, I'll give Wither Crown a C for starters but just uh, be aware of its drawbacks. Arnie, Broken Brow, 2 and a red for a 3 3 legendary human berserker at rare. It has haste and has boast for 1 mana, in which case we can exchange Arnie's base power to 1 plus the greatest power among other creatures we control until end of turn. So even ignoring the boast ability, 3 mana, 3 3 haste for 3, quite strong and has some additional upside if we happen to have a high-powered creature in play. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Arnie. Seems like a solid B level card. Next up is Axe Guard Cavalry, one and a red for a 2-2 Dwarf Berserker. So both relevant creature types can tap and then target creature gains haste until end of turn. Now this is an effect we've seen a lot in the past, although it usually appears on 1 mana 1-1s. One -ones which are not that exciting because a 1-1 one -one just doesn't attack and block all that well. But on a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two, I like this quite a bit. It attacks and blocks reasonably well and then once the board gets stalled this can just give your biggest creature that you play haste which uh, is quite an improvement. So yeah I think this might be a C plus just because of the great utility it offers in the late game while still being a relevant creature early on. Next up is Basalt Ravager, 3 in a red for a 4-2 giant wizard and uncommon. When the Ravager enters the battlefield it deals X damage to any target where X is the greatest number of creatures we control that have a creature type in common. So by itself it's going to deal 1 damage but presumably you can at least deal 2 damage to something if you have a changeling or another giant or wizard in play. And yeah 4 mana 4-2 that can deal 2 damage maybe take something out seems quite good and then uh, also as a relevant creature type. So I like a B for Basalt Ravager. Moving on we have Burgi, God of Storytelling, 2 and a red for a 3-3 legendary creature god, so another one of those dual faced cards. Whenever we cast a spell we add a red mana and until end of turn we don't lose that mana as steps and phases end. Creatures we control have a boast or rather can boast twice during each of our turns rather than only once. So yeah, 3-3 three, three with relevant upside. And then we can also potentially cast Hornfell, Horn of Bounty for 4 in a red legendary artifact, saying discard a card and then exile the top two cards of our library and we can play those cards this turn. So this can easily turn into card advantage, can discard lands we don't need, and uh, yeah, it seems like a great car to take over kind of a board stall situation. So both halves are interesting. Burgi leans itself more to a more aggressive style of deck, whereas the Harnfell is a bit better as kind of a grindy late game card. But having the flexibility means that if you draw Burgi in the late game in your aggressive deck and you've got a bunch of lands in play and a 3-3 isn't going to make a huge difference, you just play Harnfell instead, which can help you take over the late game so this card seems quite good uh, the flexibility is great and there's basically nothing not to like about it so i'll give burgi an a just incredible flexible and uh yeah a lot of fun too next up is a breakneck berserker two and a red for a three two dwarf berserker with haste pretty simple um this seems like the type of card that can definitely punish some of the slower foretell decks in the format where if you're on the play the opponent spends their turn to foretelling and not adding anything to the board you just play your berserker smash for three especially if you played a two drop earlier that damage is going to add up very quickly 
outside of uh, the scenario where you get to punish those slow starts, it's not super exciting. 3-2, probably gonna just trade for the opponent's creature. But uh, yeah, I mean, this seems like a, a great card to punish slow decks, and the fail case of a 3-mana 3-2, even if it doesn't attack right away, is still not too bad. So probably start with a C for Berserker, although this might secretly end up as a, a C plus if a lot of decks end up doing nothing on turn 2, essentially. Next up is Calamity Bearer, 2 and double red for a 3-4 Giant Berserker at rare. And if a giant source we control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. So for most intents and purposes, you can kind of consider this as a six powered creature since it doubles its damage. There's definitely a lot of scenarios where that doesn't quite uh, line up if the opponent's double blocking stuff, for instance. But it also doubles the damage of other giants we control, changelings we control. So there's a lot of upside here. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to like about Calamity Bearer. Um, do we give this an A? Yeah, I could see giving this an A, at the very least a high B, but uh, in the right deck with a lot of giants, this seems incredibly powerful. Next up is Cinderheart Giant, 7 mana for a 7-6 Giant Berserker at common. It tramples. And when a giant dies, it deals 7 damage to a creature an opponent controls chosen at random. Now 7 mana is pricey, so it's not the easiest to cast. Some games of limited you never get to 7 mana, and this will just be sitting in your hand. Now it is big, and it does have built-in trample, which is something you definitely want for a large creature like this. And if the opponent finally does manage to deal with it, you'll usually be able to take out an opposing creature as well. It's a giant for potential giant synergies, so it can benefit from those cards that give our giants a discount, the blue-red saga. So that's a great combo with the Cinderheart. So if you don't have any giant synergy, this is probably closer to a D. If your deck has any giant synergy or uh, other reasons to want this, this probably goes up to a C. So a playable card, don't overrate it because it's big, because it does cost 7 mana at the end of the day but it does seem playable. Next up is Craven Hulk, 4 mana for a 4-4 four, four giant coward, and Craven Hulk cannot block alone. So relevant creature type, 4-4 four, four beats down pretty hard, so great for any aggressive deck, great for kind of the giant tribal deck. Uh, this might even bump up to a C+, just because of how many potential synergies and decks it enables. Then Crush the Weak, 2 and a red for a sorcery at uncommon, deals 2 damage to each creature, and if a creature dealt damage would die, it also gets exiled and can foretell for just a single red. So this is a great way to punish any of those aggressive decks that try to go wide especially, and is also the type of card that plays well with foretell, because you're spending mana not adding anything to the board, so you're not gonna end up killing your own stuff with it, and if the opponent tries to punish you by curving out, then you get to crush the weak and uh, crush the opponent's hopes and dreams at the same time. Then the foretell for single red also means it's easier to potentially set up attacks, make some trades, and then you crush the weak to finish off some larger creatures that didn't die in combat. So yeah, crush the weak seems quite good. Um, typically speaking, the spiroclasm effects aren't amazing. They're always on the verge of good, but never really amazing. Uh, this one has a a few nice upsides, although we're also playing a set, once again, that has a lot of sweepers, as we've seen so far. So I'm kind of wondering how many decks are just going to be uh, putting themselves dead to the first sweeper they encounter. But uh, yeah, still quite good, probably at least a C+, uh, if not more. And next up is Demon Bolt, which is probably going to be the best red common in the set. 2 and a red for an instant, dealing 4 damage to target creature or planeswalker. That's already quite good, but it also has foretell for just a single red mana, so we can potentially pay 2 up front and on a later turn cast it for 1 mana. So yeah, nothing bad to say about Demon Bolt, excellent removal spell, easy B, probably the best red common. Doomscar Titan, 6 mana for a 4-4 giant berserker at uncommon. 
And when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one plus zero and gain haste until end of turn, and can also foretell for four in the red. So by itself essentially it acts as a 5-4 with haste, but if you've got any other board presence, this can potentially represent even more damage. And foretell also means it becomes easier to potentially double spell, play multiple creatures in the same turn, that we can then also give haste, so they can attack alongside the Doomscar Titan. So seems like a good card, probably at least a C+. And kind of reminiscent of the black 5-drop that we've covered. Next up we have Dragonkin Berserker, one and a red for a 2-2 human berserker with first strike, which is already quite good, relevant creature type, saying boast abilities you activate cost one less to cast, or to activate for each dragon you control, and then boasts for four and a red, creating a 5-5 red dragon creature token with flying. So berserker is incredible if you can somehow give it evasion or if it can attack unopposed and just keep making dragon after dragon. The reality of the situation is probably more like Berserker is a nice 2-drop, can maybe attack once or twice early on, hold off two toughness creatures, and at some point in the late game you can essentially trade in your Berserker, spend 5 mana and make a 5-5 dragon, which is still quite strong. I guess you could also maybe make the dragon first and then the opponent kills the dragon, so you have to spend the 5 mana first, so I guess that's kind of the medium case scenario. But the best case scenario where Maybe you put a flying equipment on it, or the blue rune to give it flying, then the berserker can completely go to town. So, yeah, also synergizes with itself. If you make a dragon, the next dragon's going to be cheaper. What do we give berserker at the end of the day? Probably a B. It's still a 2-2 creature that can be potentially killed easily before it makes any dragons. But uh, if it goes uncontested, we'll easily end the game. So, definitely a high B might even inch its way towards an A if you've got synergies that give it evasion. But we'll start out with a B for Berserker. Great card. Next up is Dual Strike. Double red for an instant at Uncommon. When we cast our next instant or source spell with convert mana cost 4 or less, we copy that spell and choose new targets for the copy. Fortel for 1 red mana. Fortel does make it easier to double spell and cast 2 instants and sorceries in the same turn. Now the problem with dual strike is not always the mana cost, it's often did I draw another instant or sorcery to go with it. Also has a restriction of costing four or less, which does potentially matter. So that's usually why these types of cards aren't very good and limited, because your limited deck never really has that many instants and sorceries in it to begin with. So there's a chance that dual strike will just sit in your hands and do nothing. So I'm not very high on dual strike, probably a D but in some very dedicated maybe blue-red decks where you've got a lot of instants and sorceries or maybe black-red with a lot of good removal you can copy, I could see including it. Then we've got Dwarven Hammer, part of the equipment cycle. Three mana for an uncommon equipment. When it enters the battlefield, you can pay two mana, and if you do, create a 2-1 red Dwarf Berserker creature token and attach the hammer to it. And the equipped creature gets a whopping plus 3 plus 0 and trample, equips for 3 mana. So essentially 5 mana to make a 5-1 trample, which is good, not great. Typically it's just gonna trade for an opposing creature and get in a bit of trample damage. Worst case scenario, I suppose the opponent has a first striker on defense, but it's not like there's that many first strike creatures in the set. And then once a the creature trades, you now have an equipment that for 3 mana gives plus 3 plus 0 and trample. That's an incredibly efficient rate, turns any creature into an actual threat. So I'm really liking a Dwarven Hammer here. Uh, at the very least a B seems like one of the better of the cycle of equipments. Then Dwarven Reinforcements, 4 mana for a sorcery at common, creating 2-1 two, two red Dwarf Berserker creature tokens, also has foretell for 1 and a red. So it can potentially split up the cost a little bit, plays well with Anthem effects and uh, other cards that can reward you for going wide, maybe has some token synergy. So yeah, Reinforcement seems playable. Um, not going to be amazing in every red deck, but it is also a way to potentially leverage your equipment, giving you multiple bodies to equip so you don't run out of creatures. So it seems like a C, just a playable card, nothing wrong with it. Then Fearless Liberator, one and a red for a 2-1 Dwarf Berserker at Uncommon. 
boasts for 200 red, making another 2-1 red Dwarf Berserker creature token. So, yeah, if you can play this on turn 2, the opponent doesn't add anything to the board, maybe foretells, then you can attack, make another 2-1. Pretty efficient use of your mana. Um, so yeah, this seems okay. Nothing too exciting, but probably gets a C plus here. Seems like an above average creature. Then Fearless Pup, 1 mana for a 1-1. One, one. First striking Wolf at common, and boasts for 2 and a red, giving it plus 2 plus 0, and... I guess it already has first strike, so turns into a 3-1 first strike if we boast. It's also 1-1 first strike on defense, holding off any small attackers. And uh, yeah, just plays well with the boast ability in general. 1-1 uh, first strike, that turns into a 3-1. It's going to be very difficult to block early on. Essentially means that this is often going to be attacking for one damage early in the game until you actually start pumping it, in which case it actually gets in for more damage. Still not a card that's going to be in too high of a demand, but actually seems like one of the better one drops. So let's uh, get a C from me. Fearless Pup also synergizes great with uh, Frenzied Raider, which is next. Two mana for a 2-2 Demon Berserker at Uncommon, saying... Whenever you activate a boast ability, put a plus one plus one counter on the frenzied raider. So turn one pup, turn two raider, turn three, we can potentially boast, put a counter on the raider, and hit for additional damage. So raider, definitely nice incentive for the boast mechanic. Typically going to be black red, maybe like a, a red green beatdown deck has a few boast cards as well. So I like B for frenzied raider, nice payoff for the aggressive decks. Then we have Frostbite, one mana for a snow instant at common, dealing two damage to target creature or planeswalker. So that's already pretty good. A shock that doesn't go face, but it does go to creatures and planeswalkers is probably already like a C, C plus. And if we control three or more snow permanents, this says permanents, not lands. So snow creatures also count. It deals 3 damage instead, so yeah, 3 damage for 1 mana seems great if you can get to it. But even without any snow synergy, if you just put Frostbite in your random, let's say, blue-red giants deck that doesn't have any snow, it still seems totally playable. And then if you happen to have some other snow permanents, this just goes up in value. So I like C plus for Frostbite, seems quite good. Ooh, next up we've got Goldspan Dragon, 5 mana for a 4-4 Mythic Rare Dragon with Flying and Haste. And when the dragon attacks or becomes the target of a spell, we get to make a treasure token. And treasures we control can tap and sacrifice to add 2 mana of any one color instead. So the turn we play dragon, we attack, make a treasure, and we still potentially have 2 mana afterwards to cast something else. And if they kill it, we get another treasure, so... Even if the opponent answers it right away, we're still left with a bit of an advantage, even if it's not the most sizable one. And uh, of course, if it doesn't go unanswered, you can very quickly dump your entire hand, as well as a 4-4 flyer that can end the game quickly. So I think this might uh, be worthy of an S. It's maybe not quite as convincing as some other cards we've given an S to, because if the opponent kills it, sure you get a treasure, but how much is that treasure token worth? but it's still a 4-4 haste uh, with flying that will close out the game very quickly. So, yeah, um, maybe not the most convincing S, but I'll still give it an S. Next up we have Haggy Mob, 4 and a red for a 5-4 Troll Berserker, with boast for 1 and a red, dealing 1 damage to any target. So this is the creature I mentioned when talking about the Death Touch rune, if you can put it on Haggy Mob. Turns into a pretty exciting creature, as it can essentially kill anything for one and a red the turn it attacks. Sadly, the fact that both can only be activated once per turn limits how effective this is, since you can't take out multiple creatures or a creature that's two toughness by activating twice. But it's still a 5-4 with a relevant upside. So, yeah, it seems pretty decent for one of these 5 mana cards. Probably still just a C, and not quite a C+, plus, but... Giving these 5 mana creatures a C is already kind of a compliment. Next up is Immersturm, a raider, 1 and a red for a 2-1 demon berserker 
at common that when it enters the battlefield makes us discard a card or we can choose to discard a card and if we do draw a card so i've seen this before the fisher wizard in zendikar this also has a relevant creature type being a berserker so it's a fine card uh, maybe a two drop in the set goes up in value a little bit given that some people will be foretelling so this gets a chance to attack and uh, in the late game make sure to hold a land so you can get value from your raider so you've got something to discard and hopefully draw some action so fine card probably just a c next up is magda brazen outlaw one on red for a 2-1 legendary dwarf berserker giving other dwarves we control plus one plus so so here's a small payoff for playing a bunch of dwarves and whenever a dwarf we control becomes tapped create a treasure token and we can sacrifice five treasures to search your library for an artifact or dragon card, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle. So just a 2-1, that's kind of an anthem for other dwarves, and makes a few treasure tokens seems decent. Um, also counts itself when it becomes tapped to make a treasure, so it's a 2-1 that can maybe make a treasure or two and trade off. Of course, you're not often going to have a dragon or some amazing artifact to search up, but in reds you'll probably encounter a few other dwarves, so it's a 2-1 with a lot of small upside. So probably means that uh, Magda gets at least a B. Then open the Omen Paths, turn a red for an instant, add common. Choose one between adding two mana of any one color and two mana of any other color that we can spend only to cast creatures or enchantments. Or we can give our creatures plus one plus so until end of turn. Yeah, neither one of these effects is particularly exciting. Uh, ramping for one in limited is not something that's usually worth a card. And giving our creatures one additional power is pretty weak as far as these uh, trumpet blast effects go. So even in a go white token deck, I'm not so sure you would want this. Uh, yeah, this is probably just an F. I don't envision many decks wanting this. Next up is Provoke the Trolls which is three in a red for an uncommon instant that either deals three damage to any targets, I guess just deals three damage to any target, but it's kind of a dual mode card because if a creature is dealt damage this way, it gets plus five plus zero until end of turn. This is essentially four mana to deal three damage to an opposing creature, or if our creature has more than three toughness, we can use it as a four mana pump spell, giving it five additional power. So interesting card i mean you would already be happy with a four mana removal spell that deals three damage so the additional text is just pure upside going to be at its best in like a, a blue red giants deck or a green red deck that has a lot of high toughness creatures so it just gives you a little bit more flexibility which is always nice so we're not really paying for that all that much c plus for provoke the trolls just a fine removal spell with a small upside then we have Quake Bringer, 5 mana for a 5-4 giant berserker at Mythic, saying your opponents cannot gain life. And at the beginning of your upkeep, Quake Bringer deals 2 damage to each opponent. This ability triggers only if Quake Bringer is on the battlefield or if Quake Bringer is in the graveyard and you control a giant. And also foretells for 4 mana, because why not? So Quake Bringer seems like a beating. Just having Quakebringer in play, not attacking with it, passively dealing 2 to the opponent each turn means the opponent will eventually have to deal with it. And even if they do, if you have a random giant or changeling, this will keep dealing damage out of the graveyard, so it seems almost impossible to deal with. Uh, yeah, I'm giving this an S. Seems like a very difficult card to interact with. Reckless Crew is 4 mana for a rare sorcery. Creating X, 2-1 Red Dwarf Berserker creature tokens, where X is the number of vehicles we control, plus the number of equipment we control. And for each of those tokens, we can attach an equipment we control to it. Interesting card. I don't think many limited decks are going to have such a multitude of vehicles and equipment that this is going to make uh, more than one or two tokens. So it's probably just a, a more high variance version of the Dwarven Reinforcements, which already wasn't super exciting. So this gets a D. Run Amok is back, first seen in Dominaria, I believe. One on red for an instant at common, giving target attacking creature plus three plus three and trample until end of turn. 
So important when playing against Runamok, make sure if you have a damage based removal spell to use it before the opponent is attacking, otherwise they can potentially run amok in response. And yeah, run amok is just a nice trick, uh, can potentially combo nicely with boast creatures that want to maybe attack, use their boast ability and then you can use run amok to get in a bit of extra damage and the opponent's also kind of incentivized to trade off to prevent you from boasting again. And uh, yeah, can be a nice way to punish those slower decks that are busy foretelling while you're just curving out and beating face. So yeah, totally fine pump spell, give it a C. Then we've got another one of our runes as part of our cycle when it enters the battlefield to draw a card. Enchanted permanent gets plus one plus so and has haste. Now haste, not the most incredible ability since you're probably not going to be able to play rune and a relevant second creature in the same turn all that often. At the very least we get one additional power. Now on the other hand, putting this on an equipment makes it a lot more exciting since now every creature is going to have haste all of a sudden. So I like that. So this is definitely one you want to try and combine with equipment if you get the chance. So as far as runes go, this is one of the weaker ones, but it's still a rune so it replaces itself. So the floor isn't too bad. So this probably gets a C. And red is also the color that cares more about equipment, so that also factors into it. Seize the spoils to an red for a sorcery at common, as an additional cost to discard a card to draw two and create a treasure token. So we're paying one more mana on our tormenting voice and we get a treasure token in return. Not particularly exciting. We do have the cycle of uh, dual colored lands to sacrifice in the late game to mitigate flood a little bit, which also reduces the need for cards like Seize the Spoils. That being said, if you are playing a lot of Fortel cards, you're maybe uh, less thirsty for lands in a late game. So in that case, you can use Seize the Spoils to discard lands and make sure you keep drawing action. And then you can use Fortel to cast spells for cheaper, so you don't need as many lands in play. So yeah. There's definitely something to like about Seize the Spoils, maybe play this in a deck that cares about having a lot of instants and sorceries, maybe with that blue-red giant that needs to have a certain instant or sorcery in the graveyard to search up a second copy. But I'm still not super high on Seize the Spoils, probably still a D that I don't expect to play in most decks. Then Shackles of Treachery is our act of treason of the set, turn a red for a sorcery, gain control of target creature, Untap, gains haste, and then the added text here is whenever the creature deals damage, so it doesn't even have to deal damage to a player, just any damage, destroy target equipment attached to it. So yeah, a small upside on an act of treason, although most decks don't want an act of treason unless they've got a bunch of sacrifice effects like village rights that might be worth exploring, but there doesn't seem to be a ton of payoff for that. So not super high on shackles, can potentially be a sideboard card against decks trying to ramp into big creatures, but probably still a D. Smashing success, three in a red for an instant at common, destroys an artifact or land, and if an artifact is destroyed we also get a treasure token. So this is a mediocre sideboard card at best, never wanna main deck this, so this is another D. Squash, on the other hand, is pretty exciting. 5 mana for an instant at common, costs 3 generic mana less to cast if we control a giant. And blue-red has a lot of giants, plus we might be in like red-green where we've got a few changelings, so it also works nicely with changelings. And then Squash deals 6 damage to target creature or planeswalker. So if we're paying 5 mana for 6 damage, it's still playable, but of course a bit less exciting. If we're paying 2 mana for 6 damage, it feels like we're cheating. So Squash seems great, maybe on par with uh, the other uh, common removal spell, Demon Bolt, in how good it is. Maybe a bit weaker since it has a bit more variance built in. But uh, yeah, Squash seems great. Great card to have for the blue-red giant's archetype. So I'm giving it a B as well. Tibalt's Trickery, 1 and a red for an instant at rare. And... Uh, we will just read the three the three first words on the card. Counter target spell. So this card's clearly broken and we should all complain on social media. Although there's a little bit more to it here. Choose one, two or three at random. 
Its controller mills that many cards and exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a non-land card with a different name from that spell. They may cast that card without paying its mana cost, then they put the exiled cards on the bottom in a random order. So Tybalt's Trickery is a very weird card. It's kind of like a transmogrify counterspell built into one. Yeah, weird card to evaluate. Uh, I don't think this is a card you're going to want very often. I guess if you're like a very low curve deck that wants to curve out and then counter the opponent's 5 drop hoping they hit a 2 drop, I don't know, it just seems kind of bad to me. So I'll just give it a D. Then we have Toralf, a god of fury, 4 mana for a 5-4 legendary creature god. It's another one of those dual faced cards. It tramples and whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt excess non-combat damage. Tarolf deals damage equal to the excess to any target other than that permanent. So, pretty interesting ability. Um, says non-combat damage, so trampling over uh, doesn't necessarily do it. But plays nicely with burn spells. Imagine this with squash, that seems pretty nice. Um, yeah, Tarolf's a nice card, 4 mana, 5 for tramples already, not too bad. And then has some additional upside as well. But the card that's potentially more interesting is Thoralf's Hammer, which we can play for 2 mana. Equips for 2 mana, giving the equipped creature plus 3 plus 0 as long as it's legendary, which is probably not going to happen very often. But the part we're re really interested in is the equipped creature also has the ability for 1 and red, tap and unattach Hammer, deals 3 damage to any target, and then we return Hammer to its owner's hand. So what that essentially means is, for 6 mana total, 2 to play the hammer, 2 to equip, and 2 to unattach, we get to deal 3 damage to any target repeatedly. So it's a pretty big mana investment, but if we get to the late game, and the opponent's creatures aren't huge, this can essentially first mow down all the opponent's creatures one by one, and then just start going face, and that will essentially win the game. So it's slow, uh, but it does give you a bit of inevitability, and, of course, it's just one of the many options when it comes to this card. You can also just play Toralf and uh, go to town instead. So, yeah, it's just one of the many flexible options when it comes to these dual-faced cards. And that gives you a nice mana sink. So, overall, Toralf's Hammer, Toralf, probably worthy of an A, just because of the flexibility. Then we have Tormentor's Helm, one mana for an equipment at common. Equips for only 1 mana, giving it plus 1 plus 1, and whenever the equipped creature becomes blocked, it deals 1 damage to defending player. So a nice little equipment for an aggressive deck. Even if the opponent blocks and eats our creature, we get 1 damage in, so a nice way to help us close out the game. Goes nicely in any deck trying to double spell and play a nice efficient game with a low curve. It's an equipment that rewards us for all those potential synergies. So, yeah, Torment's Realm seems fine. Still not the most impactful card in every game, but probably gets at least a C. And then Tundra, Fumarole, 1 and double red for a rare sorcery. That's also a snow sorcery, dealing 4 damage to target creature or planeswalker. We get to add colorless mana to our mana pool for each snow mana spent to cast it. And until end of turn, we don't lose that mana as steps and phases end. So just a 3 mana, pretty efficient removal spell. It's a sorcery, so it's kind of like a, a worse version of Demon Bolt. And uh, if we're a snow deck, we can potentially gain a bit of mana back. But overall, it's still probably at least a B, just because it's 4 damage for 3 mana, which is pretty efficient. Although, strangely enough, probably worse than the common variant. And then to scary Firewalker is 2 and a red for a 3-2 Human Berserker at common with Boast for 1 mana, exiling the top card of our library, and we can play that card this turn. Play means we can also play lands, so usually want to try and use the Boast ability before playing any lands, and also gets better the later in the game we are, since we're more likely to cast the more expensive spells we reveal with it. So it's a 3-2 that will eventually force the opponent to trade for it, otherwise it will keep providing card advantage. And uh, yeah, 3 mana 3 2 as a fail case isn't too bad. So this might be a C plus in red just because of the potential it has if it gets out of hand. 
And then Vault Robber is one red for a Dwarf Rogue at common. It's a 1-3. For one mana we can tap it and exile a creature card from our graveyard to create a treasure token. Not a huge fan of the Robber here, because if creatures need to be in the graveyard to make treasure tokens, probably means we're in the mid to late game. By the time we can activate a Robber, we probably don't need those treasure tokens anymore to ramp. If this could be activated right away and help us ramp early on, it would be much better. So probably give this a D. Start out with Arachnoform. One and a green for an enchantment aura, giving the enchanted creature plus two plus two and reach, and it also has every creature type. Yeah, I'm not very interested in this type of aura. Green is also not the type of color that needs to necessarily do this, since its creatures are already pretty big. I guess if you're a green-white enchantment matters deck, you can put this on your 1-1 one, one, or your 1-2 flyer to make it a bit better. But uh, yeah, I think this is a D. Battle Mammoth, 5 mana for a 6-5 Mythic Rare Elephant with Trample. Saying whenever a permanent you control becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. And also as Foretell for 2 and double green. So you can potentially get this out on turn 4, which is pretty nice for a 6-5 Trample. And the ability means that if the opponent tries to kill it, we at least get a card out of it. And who knows, maybe they need to kill something else or their removal isn't good enough to deal with Mammoth and they need to uh, target something else. Maybe the removal is just like an enchantment removal spell. Mammoth stays, stays in play and will provide more cards over time. So yeah, Mammoth seems like quite a beating, a win condition that even if it's dealt with still provides us with an advantage. I think that's probably worthy of an S. Next is Blessing of Frost, 3 and a green for a snow sorcery at rare, letting us distribute X plus 1 plus 1 counters among any number of creatures we control, where X is the amount of snow mana spent to cast a spell, then draw a card for each creature we control with power 4 or greater. So ideally you're casting this in the mid to late game, where you've already built up a board, hopefully you've got some naturally 4 powered creatures already, and of course best case scenario you're, you're playing the snow deck and can cast this using at least two or three snow mana to add some more counters everywhere. And then this can be a nice way to refuel. It's still definitely a build around card. The average deck that doesn't have any snow mana is probably not going to be interested in this. But in a snow deck, this could potentially be quite nice. So I'll go with a more conservative C plus for Blessing of Frost. Next up is Blizzard Brawl, one mana for a Snow Sorcery at Uncommon, letting us choose target creature we control and target creature we don't control. And then if we control three or more snow permanents, so this includes both lands and non-land snow permanents, the creatures we control get plus one plus oh and indestructible until end of turn, and then those two creatures fight. So by itself, without the three snow permanents, it's Prey Upon, which is a playable removal spell, usually not super exciting, but at least a C, just because of how mana efficient it is. And then depending on the formats and the size of our creatures, gets maybe a little bit better or worse. But then the fact that we can potentially give that one additional power and indestructible means we're going to be able to even fight with a small creature to take out a larger creature without having it die. And three snow permanents shouldn't be too difficult, even if we only have a handful of snow lands. A uh, few snow lands and a few snow creatures, and we're already there. So Blizzard Brawl seems pretty decent, and gets a C plus from me, and uh, in a dedicated snow deck might even go in the B range. Then we've got Boreal Outrider, two and a green for a 3-2 snow creature elf warrior. Those are all potentially relevant creature types as well, saying whenever we cast a creature spell, if snow mana of any of that spell's colors was spent to cast it, that creature enters with a plus one plus one counter on it. So this is worded a little strangely, and the reason is that we can only spend snow mana on the colored part of the creature's mana cost. So let's say we're a blue-green snow deck, this prevents us from using a snow planes to get a plus one counter when we cast our blue or green creature, so we actually need to only use mana of the appropriate colors, and um, that kind of prevents that scenario I just mentioned. But that being said, if we're a dedicated snow deck, it should be pretty easy to get some snow lands of the appropriate colors and 
start playing our creatures with additional plus one counters on them. We don't have to pay any additional costs, just need to make sure the land we tap is making snow mana, and then we just get a free plus one counter. And the fail case is a three mana three two, that's also an elf, and counts as a snow permanence, so there's a ton of potential upside here. So I like B for Boreal Outrider, and this is definitely one of the incentives to go into the snow archetype, as the payoff is potentially quite big. Then we've got a reprint of Broken Wings, two and a green for an instant, destroys an artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. Great sideboard card, probably not going to main deck this, although if you do have to main deck this, you could definitely do worse. Just has the risk of not doing anything, but usually if it kills a flyer, an enchantment, or an artifact, you're not too sad about that exchange. So I like D for Broken Wings, but definitely a good sideboard card to have access to. Then we've got Elder Leaf Mentor, 3 and a green for a 3-2 Elf Warrior at common. When it enters the battlefield we get to make a 1-1 one, one green Elf Warrior creature token. So nice for the Go White Elf deck that just wants to have a bunch of Elves in play. And even outside of the Elf deck it's still playable. This is pretty similar to the 4-mana uh, White creature from Ikoria that made a 1-1 one, one token. So yeah, playable card, probably just a C, and gets better in the Elf deck. Elven Bow is a 1 mana equipment, part of that cycle. When it enters the battlefield we can pay 2 generic mana to make a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token and attach the bow to it, giving it plus 1 plus 2 and to reach, and then moves for 3 mana. So we're essentially paying 3 mana for a 2-3 reach and then still get the bow afterwards. Don't think we're playing this without the token part very often. So yeah, Elven Bow is decent, probably C+, happy to have the 2-3 reach and then getting to keep the bow afterwards. Elvish Warmaster is a 2 mana rare elf warrior, 2-2, two -two, saying whenever one or more other elves enter the battlefield under your control, get to make a 1-1 one -one green elf warrior creature token, can only trigger this once per turn, and then for 7 mana total, elves we control get plus 2 plus 2 and gain death touch until end of turn. So this seems like a great incentive for, for the elf deck, especially if you can make a bunch of tokens and go wide, and then the 7 man ability is definitely going to help you end the game. So yeah, Warmaster seems great, also has a bit of synergy with changelings, so don't forget that. So I like a probably a B for Elvish Warmaster. Next up is a Sika, God of the Tree, 1 and double green for a 1-4. Mythic Rare, Legendary God with Vigilance, can tap to add one mana of any color, and other legendary creatures have Vigilance and can also tap for one mana of any color, and uh, if we somehow get to five mana, one of each color, we can decide to cast the Prismatic Bridge instead, which is a legendary enchantment saying at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card, put it on the battlefield, the rest on the bottom in a random order. So Prismatic Bridge seems great, but getting to that mana is going to be quite a challenge in Limited. So more often than not we're probably going to cast a Sika, one for Vigilance that makes one mana of any color, which isn't bad, because it can potentially attack, block, and still tap for mana. So overall a Sika probably gets a C+, and if you get to live the dream of casting the backside with a Prismatic Bridge, you're definitely getting there, so we'll give a Sika C+. Isika's Chariot, on the other hand, is a lot more exciting. A 4-mana legendary artifact equipment, or vehicle I should say. It's a 4-4, and when the Chariot enters the battlefield, creates two 2-2 two -two green cat creature tokens. And when the Chariot attacks, we get to make a token that's a copy of target token we control. Crew cost is only 4, so we can crew the Chariot with the two tokens we generate. And if the Chariot gets to attack, we get to make another 2-2 two -two token. Opponents kind of forced to trade for the Chariot, otherwise it gets out of hand. And you're still left with three 2-2 two -two tokens. So yeah, this card seems amazing. And gets an A from me. Also has a bit of synergy in the green-white token deck. Then Finn, the Fang Bearer. One and a green for a 1-3 legendary creature, human warrior with death touch. And whenever a creature we control with death touch deals combat damage to a player, that player gets two poison counters. So if the, the opponent has 10 poison counters at any point, they lose the game. 
Now getting 10 poison counters in limited is going to be pretty challenging, there's not that many death touch creatures. So we're mostly looking at a 2 mana 1-3 with death touch, which is decent, it can block early creatures and trade off for larger stuff in a late game. Can maybe chip in for a bit of damage, and uh, if you get enough poison counters, it might force the opponent to eventually trade off for Finn. So, fine card, um, probably at least a C+, plus just for the 1-3 death touch here. Glittering Frost is also an interesting card. Two and a green for a snow enchantment aura. Enchant a land, and the enchanted land is now snow, so it will tap for snow mana. And whenever the enchanted land is tapped for mana, we can add one additional mana of any color. So it ramps and it essentially makes two snow mana, because the mana we generate in addition will also be snow mana, because it's coming from a snow permanent. So by itself, Glittering Frost essentially adds two snow permanents to the battlefield, because it turns a land into snow, presuming you are enchanting a non-snow land to begin with, and then also generates two snow mana, which we, which we can potentially use for certain abilities. So this definitely helps kind of close the gap of some of those activated abilities we've seen that require two or three snow mana. Um, so in the dedicated snow deck, this seems pretty nice, can fix our mana, make it possible to maybe splash some of the snow cards, and both ramp and uh, help us get to the required snow mana we need. Uh, outside of the snow deck, this is probably not all that interesting, so I think a C for Glittering Frost is appropriate. Next up is Knotfold Recluse, 2 and a green for a 4-2 spider with a reach. So typically we're used to seeing two 4 spiders with reach, this one is a 4-2. Downside here is that it often ends up trading for smaller creatures like 2-drops. Although if the opponent doesn't have a 2-drop, this can beat down pretty hard. Uh, maybe we can enhance this to give it some evasive ability and it gets a bit better. With that being said, I'm not super excited by the Recluse, but it is playable. Uh, it's good against other 4-4 creatures, since it can potentially trade up with those if you're on defense. So I like C for Recluse. Next up is Grizzled Outrider, 4 and a green for a 5-5 Elf Warrior, and that's it. Now, if this wasn't an Elf, I probably wouldn't be very excited about this and give this a D and move on. Given that it's an elf, which is a relevant creature type in the set, it might nudge it up to a C, just because it gives the elf deck a beefy creature that it can maybe recur out of the graveyard with the 5 mana or 4 mana return upon the tide for tell card. So that gives you something bigger to get back. And uh, that also gives you an elf that then generates those two elf tokens. So yeah, it's not too bad, um, considering it's an elf. But otherwise, 5 mana 5-5 five five is just nothing too exciting. So we'll give it a C, just because it's an elf. Then Guardian Gladewalker, 1 on a green for a 1-1 one, one Shapeshifter Changeling. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So Changeling is what makes this card so exciting, enables a lot of your synergies. And by itself, a 2 mana 1-1 one, one that places a counter somewhere is a card that's always been quite good and limited. We've seen a few variations uh, so far, and this seems like the best one, because it has all relevant creature types. So I like C+, for Gladewalker. Horizon Seeker is 2 and a green for a 3-2 Human Warrior at common, with Boast for 1 and a green, letting us search our library for a basic land and put it into our hand. So yeah, if we're missing land drops, this can help. And a 3-2 is not the worst fail case. So. Yeah, I don't mind the Horizon Seeker here, probably gets a C+, plus just because it can help you if you're missing land drops and potentially fix your mana as well, especially if you're splashing. Icehide Troll, 2 and a green for a 2-3 Troll Warrior, it's also a snow creature, and for double snow, Troll gets plus 2 plus 0 and gains indestructible until end of turn, and we also have to tap it. So this seems great, especially in a dedicated snow deck where we can maybe activate this more than once. Outside of a snow deck, 3 mana 2-3, not super exciting, so probably falls somewhere along a C overall, and the snow decks should be able to pick it up pretty late. 
In Search of Greatness, double green for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a permanent spell from your hand with converted mana cost equal to 1 plus the highest converted mana cost among other permanents you control without paying its mana cost. So a bit of a weird one. Um, doesn't count itself as a permanent. So can maybe cheat on mana, but at the same time you're using a card to do it, so you're less likely to have a lot of spells in hand. But we do get a, a bit of a an extra on top here. If we don't cast anything for free, we do get to scry one. Now, double green just for the scry one is not necessarily worth it. We're gonna run out of spells to cast pretty quickly. But it is true that once we run out of spells, at least the scry one helps us find more of them. But by the time we get to that stage in the game, we probably don't need to cast stuff for free anymore. So, yeah, we're mostly looking at a two mana enchantment that lets us scry one each turn. And every now and then has a little bit of upside. And a two mana enchantment that lets us scry one each turn isn't really worth the card. So this is probably just a D, maybe a C. We'll have to wait and see, but definitely don't overrate this. Next up is Jaspera Sentinel, 1 mana for a 1-2 elf rogue with reach, and it can tap alongside an untapped creature we control to add 1 mana of any color. So it's an elf, and it can potentially ramp if we've got a lot of cheap creatures. That being said, requiring a different creature to tap alongside it means that it's pretty awkward as a ramp creature. So. Yeah, this is probably just a D. I can maybe see playing this in a very dedicated elf deck where you just want to get on the board as quickly as possible and go wide and you've got a ton of payoff cards. But in general, I don't expect to play this. Next up is Yorn, God of Winter. Two and a green for a 3-3 legendary snow creature god. And whenever Yorn attacks, untap each snow permanent you control. So that also includes lands, so we can potentially cast something pre-combat and then attack, untap our lands, and second main, play something else, which is nice. Um, and essentially also gives it vigilance, because it will untap itself. And then we also have the flexibility of playing Caldering, the Rhyme Staff, which is, weirdly enough, a blue-black legendary snow artifact at rare, and we can tap it, and then play target's snow permanent card from our graveyard this turn, and then it enters the battlefield tapped, so it can replay lands that we've maybe milled, snow permanents like creatures. This one's interesting. Of course, the Sultai snow deck can potentially cast both halves, so that's where it's going to be at its best, if you can both play Yorn or the Rhyme Staff. But I could even see playing this in a deck that only gets to play one half of the card, so if you're like a blue-black self-mill deck that has a bit of snow synergy, this could still be totally fine as only the Cauldring, and in a green deck, a 3-3 with a bit of upside is still totally serviceable. So that probably means that this card is going to be in pretty high demand, and might not necessarily go to the player that's playing all three colors. But if you are playing all three colors, this gets even better. So yeah, there's a lot to like about this. Um, the staff gives you inevitability, whereas the creature half gives you kind of pseudo ramp and a bit of a board presence if you need it. But uh, the staff definitely seems like the more powerful card if you can play a slightly longer game. So overall, probably give this a B, but could see this going up to an A in a very synergistic snow deck that can use both halves of the card. Then King Harald's Revenge is to an green for a sorcery at common. Until end of turn, target creature gets plus one plus one for each creature we control and gains trample, and it must be blocked this turn if able. So sorcery speed, might of the masses, that also gives trample and forces the opponent to block. But they don't have to block with each creature, they can just throw away a random creature they don't care about. And this being a sorcery means it can potentially be blown out, and the opponent of course has good information on how to block. So this is kind of your payoff card for the go white deck which can be maybe the green-white deck or maybe black-green elf deck. Doesn't seem amazing to me, um, probably just a D. If this were an instance, it would be a different story, but of course then the must-be-blocked part would be a little bit different. Next up is Kolvori, God of Kinship. 
2 and double green for a 2-4 legendary creature god at rare, saying as long as we control 3 or more legendary creatures, including Colvori itself, so we need 2 authors, Colvori gets plus 4, plus 2, and has Vigilance. Now, there are a few legendary creatures at uncommon, but getting 3 of them in play at the same time is still going to be very challenging, so I doubt we'll ever see a 6-6 six, six Colvori. And then for one and a green we can tap it and look at the top six cards of our library. We can reveal a legendary creature card from among them, put it into our hand, rest on the bottom. So this ability helps us find the additional legendary creatures. So in a deck that has both Golvori and some powerful legendary creatures to search up, we start getting a pretty interesting package here, especially if we can eventually get three legendaries in play. But in Limited, you can't really count on that. Getting all those legendaries is going to be difficult, especially because most of the legendaries are pretty high picks, so they're not going to stay in the packs for very long. And at the end of the day, if we just have a 2-4 that doesn't have any other abilities, it's kind of disappointing for 4 mana. But we also have the other half here, the Ring Heart Crest, one in a green for a legendary artifact at rare. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, Taps for green that we can spend only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type or a legendary creature spell. Yeah, this doesn't seem very interesting outside of the most dedicated blue-green changeling decks where all your creatures have the same creature type. So both halves are kind of mediocre. And Colvor is only really exciting if your deck has at least three legendary creatures total. But the fail case, I guess, is still a 4-mana 2-4, which, you know, it's not exciting, but it's better than nothing. So, I'm not thrilled about this. Probably give this, like, a C. And in a very dedicated legendary deck, of course, it will go up in value. Then we've got Lidyara Glade Warden, 4-mana for a 3-3 Shapeshifter Changeling at Uncommon. For two and a green, we can tap it and exile a creature card from our graveyard, and then put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. Can only be used at sorcery speed. So this card seems great. Already four mana, three three changeling. Has a lot of synergy in the set. And this gives us kind of that late game inevitability if the board stalls out. So a lot to like about the Glade Warden. So I'll give it a B. Then Mammoth Growth. 2 and a green for an instant at common, giving target creature plus 4 plus 4 until end of turn, and also foretells for a single green mana. So this is a card I was talking about earlier when we were talking about the white comma trick Chaos Onslaught that can give a creature plus 1 plus 1 and double strike. If you can combine that with Mammoth Growth, you could steal a game out of nowhere. So yeah, this seems like a pretty decent combo trick at common, and uh, happy to give this a C. Masked Vandal is next, 2 mana for a 1-3, Shapeshifter, Changeling at common. And when the Vandal enters the battlefield, you can exile a creature card from your graveyard, and if you do, exile, target artifact or enchantment an opponent controls. So, I'm typically kind of down on main decking enchantment and artifact removal in your limited decks, but Vandal's different. It's a 2 mana 1-3, so it can block aggressive creatures. It's a Changeling, so it enables a lot of synergies that care about creature types, and if you draw this in a late game, instead of being a disappointing 2-drop, it could easily take out a relevant artifact or enchantment. So this card seems great, and you're probably going to be very happy with at least the first copy in your deck. So C+, for Masked Vandal, I think this card's going to overperform, probably see a bit of constructed play too. Next up is Old Growth Troll, triple green for a 4-4 Troll Warrior at rare. It tramples, and when the troll dies, if it was a creature, return it to the battlefield as an aura enchantment that enchants a forest we control, and the enchanted forest can tap for double green, and for one mana can be tapped and sacrificed to make another 4-4 green troll warrior creature token with trample. Now, this card seems awesome for constructed. In limited, getting triple green on turn 3 is pretty difficult, so we can maybe expect to play this if we have 5 or 6 lands in play which is a bit more realistic. But even then, this still seems quite good. Playing a 4-4 Trample on turn 5 
And then if it ends up uh, trading, getting that land that makes another troll is quite nice. So what do we give troll overall? Probably like a high B hesitant to give it an A just because of how restrictive the mana cost is and you're not really incentivized to take this early and make a mono green deck. That's not really how limited works. Path to the world tree, one on a green for an enchantment at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, search your library for a basic land card that you can put into your hand. So it doesn't ramp, just kind of searches up a land that can maybe help you fix your mana. And if you somehow assemble the rainbow, you can sacrifice path and then you gain two life, draw two cards, target opponent loses two, discards two, uh, or no, there's no discard, deals two damage to up to one target creature. We get a 2-2 two, two bear creature token, so a bunch of cool effects. But uh, yeah, getting to that mana is going to be very difficult. The basic side of it is not particularly exciting. So this is probably a D, but I applaud anyone trying to sacrifice this. Next up we have a Ravenous Lindworm, 6 mana for a 6-6 six, six Worm at common. When it enters the battlefield you gain 4 life, so I'm kind of upset. And that's because Honey Mammoth was neglected here. There's even another Mammoth related card in the set, so there's no excuse for why Honey Mammoth should be excluded here. But yeah, this card's good, 6 mana for a 6-6 six, six at gains 4 mitigates the drawback of the opponent answering this right away. And uh, yeah, it's just a big creature. If you can somehow give it evasion, then it gets even better. So plays nicely with one of the cards we'll see in just a second here. So I'll give that uh, worm a C. Next up is a Realm Walker, two and a green for a 2-3 Shapeshifter Changeling. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. And then you can look at the top card of your library at any time and cast creature spells of the chosen type of the top. So this seems like a nice little payoff, especially at its best in the blue-green changeling deck where you're gonna have an easier time casting creatures of the top for free. But even in like a black-green elf deck, you can name elf and get a lot of value. Yeah, the fail case is still a 3-mana 2-3 that's also changeling, which works well with other cards that care about creature types. So a lot to like about Realm Walker. Now it is kind of a slow card advantage card. You're not necessarily going to get value right away if there's a bunch of non-creature cards on top. So I like B for Realm Walker, but has a ton of upside in a longer game. And definitely has some constructed applications. Rootless U is 5 mana for a 5-4 Tree Folk add uncommon. When it dies, search your library for a creature card with power or toughness 6 or greater. Reveal it, put it into your hand. So this plays nicely with the uh, Ravenous Lindworm we've just seen, or some other bombs that you might have in the deck. 5 mana 5-4 five, that essentially draws a card when it dies isn't a bad deal, and you're even drawing a pretty powerful card. So assuming your deck has at least one or two targets to search up, I'm a pretty big fan of the Tree Folk here, so I'll give it a B. Bit of a build around, but the power is definitely there. Then Roots of Wisdom, one and a green for a common sorcery, mills three cards, then return a land or elf from your graveyard to your hand, and if you can't, you get to draw a card instead. So that mitigates the feel bad scenario where you don't hit anything. So Roots of Wisdom is an interesting one. I'm not quite sure why the elf deck is interested in milling, but I guess it maybe sets up some of those reanimation effects. Overall, I'm not thrilled about this, but can maybe enable some graveyard shenanigans. So I'll give this a D. Next up we have Rune of Might. This is a card I was alluding to earlier when talking about the Lindworm. Two mana enchantment aura. It's also Rune for all those Rune synergies. Draws a card when it enters the battlefield, giving the enchanted creature plus one plus one and trample. And goes same with uh, the equipment as well. So yeah, nice little enchantment aura. Reminds me of uh, Satassin, I think, Tactics it was from... Theros, which was already quite good, and I think this one's even better because it gives one additional toughness too, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, great enchantments at its best in green, obviously, and gets even better if we have some uh, rune synergies in our deck. So I like B for Rune of Might. Don't overlook this one. And then we get to one of the more exciting commons in green, Sarulf's Packmate, 
4 mana for a 3-3 wolf that when it enters the battlefield draws a card and also has foretell for 1 and a green. So this seems great. Uh, foretelling this on 2, playing it on 3 is fine. Just casting it for 4 mana is great. So pretty happy giving this a B. Seems like one of the more exciting commons in green, even if the creature type doesn't have a ton of synergy. Sculptor of Winter, 1 and a green for a 2-2 two, two elf, rogue and common can tap to untap target snow land and it's also a snow creature so untapping snow land essentially means we get to ramp for one as long as we have enough snow lands in the deck don't need a ton of snow lands for sculptor of winter to be good if we have like four or five that's probably good enough and fail case is still a two mana two two which is okay and we can maybe even combine it with that uh, aura that makes a land produce two mana that way sculptor essentially makes even more mana than if it was just untapping a regular land. So I like C plus for Sculptor. The fail case isn't too bad and the upside is a two mana ramp creature which is great. And also counts as a snow permanence for potential snow synergy. Snakeskin Veil, one mana instant at common, puts a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control, also gains hexproof until end of turn. So this is a variation on blossoming defense and similar effects we've seen but instead of Plus two plus two, we get a plus one plus one counter. So it can both be used to let combat go in our favor and can also be used to save a creature from a removal spell. And we even get a small permanent plus one counter as a bonus. So yeah, I like a C for Snakeskin Veil. Nice little trick. Then Spirit of the Elder Guard. Three and a green for an O4 snow creature bear spirit at uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, search your library for a snow land card, reveal it, put it into your hand. And then the spirit gets plus one plus so for each other snow permanent we control. So that includes lands as well as other snow permanents like creatures and artifacts. So yeah, Spirit of the Elder Guard seems great. Can potentially even fix our mana if we're splashing additional snow lands. And by itself, it's essentially a 1-4 that searches up a land, so it provides a bit of advantage. And it shouldn't be too difficult to have other snow permanents in the deck to make it bigger. So I like B for Spirit of the Elder Guard and even playable in a deck that doesn't have a ton of snow synergy if you just have a handful of snow lands. Then Struggle for Scamfar, 3 and a green for a common sorcery, letting us put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control and then it fights up to one target creature we don't control. So hunt a weak, but it also has foretell for just a single green. Now keep in mind foretell means we have to wait a turn before we can cast it out of exile. So it's not like we can exile it for two mana and then foretell for one mana in the same turn. Do have to make sure we spread it out across multiple turns if we want to get the discount. But yeah, we're just paying three mana for the struggle instead of four if we use the foretell mechanic. And then a single green means that it's much easier to play a creature and foretell struggle in the same turn to avoid the scenario where the opponent kills our creature and we never get to set up that fight. And a plus one counter, of course, helps win the fight as well as give us a nice permanent bonus afterwards. So yeah, this might be in contention for the best green common alongside Seraph's Packmate and just a nice removal spell in general. Great for the double spell deck if you're like green-white and care about double spelling or maybe green-black. So happy giving this a B. Toski, Bearer of Secrets, is next. Four mana for a 1-1 legendary squirrel at rare. Cannot be countered and is indestructible. And uh, Toski attacks each combat if able. So one turn we have it back as an indestructible blocker. And then it will start attacking. And whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. So not only does it count Toski, but it counts any other creature. So for playing, let's say, a blue-green deck, we've got some evasive flyers. Then we can potentially draw a ton of cards that way as well, maybe even in the same turn where we play Toski. And the opponent's essentially forced to keep back, at the very least, a two-toughness blocker that can block Toski turn after turn. If we can give Toski evasion in any way, be it with the trample rune or the menace equipment or the flying rune, you name it, then it becomes even more threatening, and there's not a ton of removal spells that can easily deal with it. So yeah, Toski seems great, and quite a nightmare to deal with on the other side. So this might even sneak up to an A. It looks unassuming, but I think it's going to be pretty difficult to interact with. 
and even if the opponent has an enchantment removal spell which can lock it down the effect will still persist and then we get to our final planeswalker Tyvar Kel, four mana for a three loyalty Tyvar, saying elves we control can tap to add black mana to our mana pool and the plus one puts a plus one plus one counter on up to one target elf get to untap it it also gains death touch until end of turn then the second zero ability or the second ability is for zero so don't have to change any loyalty makes a one one a green elf warrior creature token probably one of the abilities we're going to be most interested in just making a token turn after turn and then those tokens of course can also tap to add mana and then the minus six gives us an emblem saying whenever we cast an elf spell against haste until end of turn and we get to draw two cards so pretty interesting payoff the plus one can also essentially generate an extra mana since it untaps our elf so there's a lot going on here there's no real built-in protection since the death touch only lasts until end of turn so it doesn't work on defense if the opponent's attacking so this is mostly a planeswalker we want to play on a stable board and just start making elf token after elf token and then hopefully leverage the extra mana and then uh, take over the game from there but yeah this card seems great um no built-in removal does make it a little bit less exciting than some of the other planeswalkers we've seen but it's still quite powerful so probably still worthy of an a at the very least and then i believe this is our last card of our set review here Vorinclex monstrous raider six mana for a six six legendary phyrexian praetor and it's both trample and haste and if we would put one or more counters on a permanent or player put twice that many of each of those counters on a permanent or player instead so i guess it works nicely with the poison counters and if an opponent would put one or more counters on a permanent or player they put half that many rounded down instead so for the most part this is six mana six six trample haste so quite the upgrade over colossal dreadmaw so already this is pretty decent and then has even more upside double encounters and half encounters yeah i like an a for vorinclex not quite in the s tier can be answered pretty easily and uh it's still just kind of a vanilla creature with a few keywords at the end of the day but still quite powerful and uh represents a ton of damage out of nowhere so a for vorinclex this wednesday 27th i'll be participating in the early access event for kaldheim we'll be exploring mostly the new standard building a whole bunch of decks with all the new cards might do a draft in there too so make sure to check it out i'll try to do all 22 hours of the early access event starting on the 27th all the way through the 28th so make sure to join me here on twitch for that as well and uh yeah i think that's pretty much it wanna thank you for watching hope you enjoyed and as always have a nice day i also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd